And we're live in five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, and uh, I'd like to start off by welcoming everyone uh, to our eighth annual MIS Spine Symposium. Um, talking on behalf of uh, Christoph Hofstetter and Radha Skurian, who are my co-directors here, and we're very happy to see people here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, our course sponsors, uh, which obviously um, uh, this course could not be pr uh, performed without. And uh, these would be Atex Spine, Depew Synthes, Globus Medical, Joymax, C Spine, Spine Art, Spinology, Striker, Vision. I'd also like to thank our 12 faculty members who are here, uh, both virtually and live, uh, to uh, do the course. Uh, I, I think, I, on behalf of all the faculty, I know uh, we're very um, honored and, uh, and uh, uh, happy to be here. And, uh, this is a great venue. Uh, I've been here multiple times, and I, I want to say it's one of the, I think, nicest facilities uh, to uh, have a course of this nature. So um, this uh, couple of instructions uh, uh, for claiming CME credit, uh, this will appear at the end of the conference in both the chat box and on the fi final slide. Please stay tuned until the end for this information. This course is being recorded and will be available at SSF youtube.org, all right? And I'd like to start off by uh, uh, introducing Dr. Hines, who's an absolute expert when it comes to lateral surgery, as well as L5S1 um, lateral ALIF. And he's gonna be talking about cutting edge of LL, I'm sorry, cutting edge of lateral technology. Thank you, everybody. I uh, appreciate being invited back uh, this year. It's a great lateral course uh, for cutting edge of lateral uh, lumbar inner body cleaning of technology. I'm with your honor from Northern Florida, the USA. And uh, I'm privileged to be here at this conference and hope everyone's doing well. These are my disclosures. And there is some reference here to uh, OLIF 51 anatomy and OLIF technique. Uh, both important as you start to look at the L5S1 level and bring it into your surgical armamentarium. I think single position of the surgeon is the future of lateral surgery, as opposed to single lateral position, or even possibly the newly viable single arm position. The patient in this example is a 68 year old female with 60% back pain and 40% right leg radiculopathy. He has 8 out of 10 visual analog scale pain with a history of a prior attempted T lift, well forward to S1. She has failed conservative treatment, including radio frequency, ESI, physical therapy. These are the EOS pictures and her preoperative values, including a mismatch of 20 degrees and an SVA of nine centimeters. This demonstrates some of the issues. The patient has a flat back, healthy operated lumbar spine with an obvious pseudoarthrosis at L5S1, obvious neuropyramidal encroachment, likely causing the radiculopathy debilitating pain from this implant, which has migrated posteriorly. So our diagnosis is pseudoarthrosis L5S1, adjacent segment disease L1 to L4, a flat back syndrome with sacral plane imbalance, chronal imbalance, right neuropyramidal stenosis secondary to the cave malposition, osteoporosis, the patient has a high BMI and a high fragility index. What's the evolution of anterior surgery as it relates to lateral surgery we're here to discuss today? But we started with supine alif. We then have transformed ourselves into lateral surgeons, going to lateral tense psoas, and then anterior to psoas from the transmuscular approach. How does this affect positioning? 
And the Sakai position, the Sakai Aleph is very good at the L5S1 level. And localization of the great vessels by taking the iliolumbar vein is required for L45 and above and more difficult. The lateral transoas positioning then gives us higher levels, and we position sideways with somewhat of a bent table to get around the iliac crest at the more difficult level of L45 and avoid the crack plexus and the femoral nerve. No five one level, and then the anterior psoas, more of a straightforward approach around obliquely the iliac crest, and the anterior psoas gives us access to these levels. And now a new possible patient positioning for lateral surgery prone positioning. Again, uh, in this position, a certain advantage is the loss of the five one level. So if you look at the, the levels based upon positioning. Supine so A-lift gives us one really good level, L5-S1. The lateral transcellus picks up the upper levels, but both have some difficulty at L4-5. Only anterior to psoas gives all levels predictably in one position. And the prone lateral, which has many advantages, uh, potentially, gives up the 5-1 level. Does five, L5-S1 from an anterior code matter? Well, it, I think it does, and it's accessible through the supine lift or anterior to psoas, but not readily accessible to a transmuscular approach or likely in a prone lateral approach. Is it important? It is. 40% of pathology occurs at the L5-S1 level. 40% of the lordosis occurs at the L5-S1 level. And in this article, 35% of lower doses at the singular L5S1 level. So when we look at this, this is an important level for anterior surgery or anterior lateral surgery. Where is the lateral market going? It's going up and it's going up significantly in one of the rapidly growing areas of spinal surgery around the world. Why are surgeons going to single position surgery? They want to eliminate the flip. What's the flip? It's lateral surgery done through the transcellus or anterior cells approach. And then after that's done, the patient's placed prone, the patient is re prepped and raped, and then the posterior approach is done. So, what is uh, our problem with the flip? Well, the flip takes a lot of time. And you see in the room a lot of energy and people who see contamination. There's a great deal of cost at $85 a minute of a 45 minute transition from one position to another is an additional $250,000 of cost for the, the actual products that are thrown away. So somewhere between two and $3,000 is a very expensive proposition while no surgery gets done just in the procedure. So there's got to be a better way. What do we gain by eliminating the flip? We decrease our surgical costs considerably. Our operative time goes down considerably. And we gain simultaneous access, procedural and workflow innovation. What are the benefits of single position lateral? The number one benefit is that it eliminates the flip. But we also place lateral interbody implants in a orthogonal lateral position is ideal. But what are the compromises? Well, then we have to place the pedicle screws in a lateral position. This can be somewhat mitigated by the use of robotics and navigation. Loss of decompressions and osteotomies is important. And only percutaneous screw cases, so a limited population of patients. The new potentially prone position has many potential benefits that works around us. But most importantly, it also eliminates the flip. And then screws now, again, are placed in an orthogonal prone position. Direct decompression osteotomies has returned, which we do a great deal of, allowing us access to most of its lumbar pathology in patients. But what are the compromises? We have to place the lateral inner body in a prone position patient. 
which ergonomically is difficult or more difficult with a deeper wound. We probably are going to lose access anteriorly for an anterior implant to L5S1, which we just gained with OLF51 in the last many years. And if there's a vascular injury, it's going to be potentially very difficult to repair in a prone position such as this. It makes it precarious. Surgeons want to eliminate the flip so badly that they're willing to literally place screw sideways or place cages sideways. How do we solve this? Well, we place the patient prone when we want to do prone work, and we place the patient lateral when we want to do lateral work. So this is just a, a quick video of a, a modification of an OR table that allows the patient to go lateral. We do lateral work, and then the patient comes back prone, and we want to do prone work. So instead of eliminating the flip, we want to innovate the flip. There's nothing wrong with the flip. The motion is good and the patient's physiology appreciates that. And we're going to do this by doing single position, yes, but single position of the surgeon, not single lateral or prone position of the patient. It requires an innovative drape that maintains sterility as the patient turns back and forth from prone to lateral position. Thus far, 250 or so patients have been done in this manner by using the flip to our advantage and eliminating all the negative aspects of the flip. And there's been no injuries, no abrasions, no issues in any patient in this series. Back to our patient we're studying today with a nice centimeter SVA and a 20 degree mismatch. What are our goals of this surgery? To relieve pain, radiculopathy, and back pain, to repair the pseudoarthrosis, decompress, restore pyramidal height, restore balance, segmental regional global, prevent adjacent segments by carefully balancing the spine. What's our surgical plan? We plan a posterior to anterior to posterior to anterior surgery. This is our surgical plan. So I'm going to give some pictures to show this rather than read all of the actual steps. We start posteriorly, and this is using a basal robotic arm to place cut up the screws. But first, we need to know do we have pseudoarthrosis? And what's the condition? of the rods and screws that are actually there. And we make this determination by starting posteriorly and remove the instrumentation before the fusion. We determine there is a pseudoarthrosis and we take appropriate steps to prepare a graft area and perform an osteotomy for the sagittal plane of balance through a PCO at L3-4 with a temporary rod. The temporary rod is absolutely mandatory because this becomes a very unstable spine once you've done an osteotomy in the back and you've released the ALL through an ACR in the anterior spine, which is anticipated in our plan. We rotate lateral for the OLIF. Now we're prepared for our second step. This takes about one or two minutes. And then in this step, we now approach the pseudoarthrosis. And I showed you the inner body implants that were basically floating. So they were not that difficult to remove, but they're very nicely removed through an 051 or if your approach with a lateral A lift position. And the implants come out, and we can restore a lordotic L5S1 level. At the other levels, we can perform osteotomies through these autofused areas and restore more doses by adding these inner body implants with pivots and uh, pivots cages in place. But you notice in the bottom, the lower 
screw hole is left open so that when we perform the posterior next step, we can rotate the segment and increase the dose just before locking the plate. In. We do an ALL release after placement so that this plate now acts as a buttress to keep the implant in place due to the potential for instability with the ALL release. We don't want to put the final screw in as we can get more lower doses with posterior rod placement. And here we see the dramatic increase in lower dose secondary to over. We now rotate part three back to the prone position, another minute or so. And once the position is back in the prone position, we then replace the temporary rod with our final rotation. Reduce the osteotomy to get the most lower doses, which allows us to rotate around the ACR anteriorly now, 3 4. We place our bone graft and we finish this part of the operation. However, our final rotation goes back anteriorly. And now we can place the final screw in the pivot plate after we've got the maximal lower doses after the ACR. And what's our result? Our result is an SVA of two centimeters, now a match under 20 degrees and a, and a very nicely corrected, difficult spine. What single position do you want to be in as you think this through? When you place pedicle screws, do you want to be in the lateral position? I don't think so. But you do in either prone, single position, or a single position of a surgeon. What position do you want to be in for implants, lateral or body implants? Questionable in the prone position and no 5-1, but yes, in the lateral single position or the single position surgeon, the ideal scenario. Decompressions and osteotomies, clearly not lateral, difficult, no one can do that very well, but definitely prone and prone position with position of the surgeon. What about the L5S1 level? If it's important to you, and we give it up in the single position prone, but we maintain it in both single position of lateral and single position of the surgeon. Vascular access, questionable in the prone position, if not possibly potentially dangerous, but easily accessible, including stenting in the lateral position, single position, or single position of the surgeon. Sterile field, not likely sterile when we're going down below the table for the upscrew in a lateral position, but definitely adequate in the prone, single position or a single position served. Sterile field, lateral inner body. There's some questions sitting down below the field and, and working below with your hands and eyes, and but no question in single position lateral or single position of the in the lateral position. The best single position is single position for the surgeon. This allows us to place lateral inner bodies with the patient in a lateral, lateral position, place pedicle screws with the patient in the prone position, perform spine surgery in the best ergonomic position for the surgeon, innovates, not eliminates the flip. Full lift all the way up, innovates the flip. Single position of the surgeon gives us all the levels in one position. Prone with screws, lateral for the antibody, simultaneous access to three columns of the spine, all the decompressions and osteotomies we need to do, and sagittal balance maximization. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to present uh, the cutting edge technology for lateral surgery. Thank you. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hines actually for a great talk. Uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, a lot of uh, spine evolution has been made by surgeons who identify a problem and try to solve it. And I think single position surgery has, has been an attempt to solve the, the flip problem that Dr. Hines has um, mentioned. And uh, his take on it, I, th I think is very novel. So it's taking, uh, you know, instead of modifying a technique, it's actually modifying some of our equipment, which is a bed. And uh, this seems uh, to be 
honestly a viable option. Um, I have not personally used it, but uh, it, it seems to uh, offer a lot more uh, adaptability for the condition. Now I've done single position surgery personally and I find it challenging to a certain extent for a lot of the reasons that Dr. Hines outlined um, because you don't want to do more than one flip. Um, uh, so with single position, you're kind of limited in terms of osteotomies um, in, in the traditional lateral and in the prone where uh, you're just training one problem for another. Um, in, I'd like to see what the audience thinks. So, Neil, you do a lot of lateral surgery. I mean, what, what do you think about this bed? Honestly, I think, uh, is it on? Okay. No, honestly, I think it's genius, absolute genius. It single-handedly, I think, has solved a lot of issues. Rick's an unbelievably smart man, and uh, no, certainly, I think it, it solves what exactly what we talk about. And I personally do not like single position that exists today, but I'm not putting screws, bending my back upside down, or putting cages the other way. Just you don't have to compromise. This, I think, allows you to do it without compromising it, right? So I think it is genius, absolute genius. Love it. Yeah. So. Rod, I mean, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think there's advantages to either way. Um, I do think it's um, dependent on the surgeon, and I do agree. I think you know, ergonomics. If you're doing like five levels, um, you know, trying to go back and forth, and it, it's much easier to um, you know uh, get the patient to rotate rather than you know trying to do it all from one position. The other thing I think is important is, um, and we're actually looking at this, it's interesting what actually happens to the spine you know, when you're prone versus lateral, does it really shift? Do you get more lordosis? I think those things we're still trying to figure out, so. Yeah, no, it's an active area of research, pretty good for the prone, um, I think transoas position. And it's, um, I have seen a little bit of the data, and it's interesting, I, I do think the psoas and the nerves shift quite a bit. Um, I, interesting uh, is the, his use of navigation with this bed. So it seems to be secure enough where he's comfortable using navigation. Um, Timur, you do a lot of uh, sort of innovative technological work. What, what do you think of it? Uh, I think the idea of the bed is very cool, and they show they have a lot of robust uh, pressure points. I would still be leery, and maybe, obviously, Dr. Hines has said he's done 200 cases now, all safely. Um, changing the position, I'm sure no matter how rigorous that hold is, there's some shifts on the inside. So not leaving the retraction in lateral would probably be something that you have to keep in mind for new people doing it. You don't want to leave that lateral retraction and start moving the patient from lateral to prone because things on the inside will shift and the tips of the retractor may go in the places you don't want them to go. That's a good point. Actually, we've seen that with some of the you know, robotic technologies where an attempt was made to use a robot arm as a retractor and any shifting of the bed really resulted in real problems. So again, a very good point. Um, Osama, any, anything? I mean, one thing I noted was like uh, on his 200 patients, he had a patient with a BMI of 58.6 that he offered. <laughs> Impressive for that bed, I, you know, being able to rotate a patient of that size, so. And I think uh, uh, very impressive, obviously. The, I was going to bring up the, the point about the navigation. I'm, I'm surprised that it doesn't shift enough. Um, and the second point is, uh, you know, do you know or does anyone know if this bed is commercially available or is it still something that only Dr. Hines uses? So that's... I, I, I do know that he wants to make it commercially available. I, I'm not sure it's available yet. We'd have to ask him, and I'm sure I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, say. But, you know, the you know, cost of the equipment obviously will be an issue. Um, so I, I think we're um, actually right on time here. So our next talk will be by Martin Pham, uh, who actually is, uh, is definitely a well-known expert when it comes to robotic surgery. And he's gonna be talking about incorporating robotics uh, in simple and complex MIS cases. Thanks, Paul, for that uh, introduction. And as I share my screen here, uh, I just wanna say uh, thanks to, you know, uh, Paul, Rod, Christoph, of course, to be invited to speak to uh, such a great talk like this. It, it's really a privilege, um, I'll say, to be included, you know, in, in a lot of the esteemed faculty, right? Neil and I is back there, and then Rick Hines, Luis Pimenta, and, and all of these um, big leaders in spine and innovation. And to, uh, uh, to include my, uh, 
my small Play-Doh talk, uh, hopefully uh, will uh, um, will offer and uh, and contribute to to all the great uh, speakers here today. So for mine, uh, it's going to be spinal robotics in simple and complex uh, MIS cases. Now, for those of you who have seen some of my talks before, this is a, a slide that I use often. And again, what you see here are, are robotic arms, right? So these are CNC machines that build our phones and cars and spaceships and textiles. And this has been going on for quite a long time uh, in industry. And these uh, CNC machines, as you can see, are very accurate, precise, and reliable. And now we finally have an opportunity to bring this to the operating room. And for this, it's just a natural evolution of a tool, right? So when you think of putting a screw in drywall, you have your manual screwdriver, then you have your um, power drill, and then eventually you have something that's uh, partially automated or fully automated to put that screw in drywall. Now for all of these machines, uh, which are CNC machines, they need an input, right? So the input is what you tell the machine on what to do, and the machine executes that. And so for robotics platforms, they all require a plan, right? So that's oftentimes where you'll hear about the robotic plan. And this is the input to allow you to carry out, right, where you want the robot to go and how you want the robot to guide you. And so with this plan, then, it is essentially what we are already doing in terms of how we plan our cases and where we want to put our screws or cages, except now you can put it all in one place to help you uh, design your construct and uh, execute your surgical goals. So of course, um, with the robotic arm, the idea is that once you have your plan, the robotic arm goes into position, becomes rigid. You put your drill, tap, screw, you release your screw, send the arm to the next level. And then again, you put your drill, tap, and screw, and then you release it, right? And it, it's meant to be that uh, boring for lack of a way to say it, because you're, you're trying to partially automate a part of the case um, that is going to be less important than all of your other um, surgical goals. So in terms of this talk, it was meant to be how to incorporate robotics into simple cases versus complex cases. I think someone argued that, that you know, uh, there may be no simple cases in the spine, especially when you're trying to prevent adjacent segment or you know, trying to prevent PJK. Um, but the way I've distributed it, I think is gonna be your MIS degen and then your MIS deformity. And I know throughout the rest of the day, um, there's gonna be great talks uh, specifically uh, focusing on these topics, uh, but hopefully this will be a bit of a preview as to um, what the rest of the speakers will be talking about. So in terms of simple cases, um, and uh, sorry, for each case, I'm gonna be including tips about patient selection and kind of the technical things on either using the robot. What I term usual robotic care is just sort of the robotic technique. So similar to navigation, the robot will require the surgeon to do things to try and um, reduce the amount of error. So things like don't bump or lean on the patient after registration. I start all my instruments off the bone and I found that this uh, minimizes skive. So when I put down the drill tap or screw, I'm starting it down the tissue protector so that you don't um, slam it into the bone and introduce skive. And then of course, light touch surgery. So try not to introduce air into a system that is meant to be as accurate as possible. So the first uh, case, there's gonna be six cases total, uh, which I figure about two minutes per case. And then we can talk uh, for a discussion afterwards. Uh, an MIS uh, T-lift, right? So one or two level T-lift. This is a case that's very familiar for, for all surgeons and incorporating robotics into your MIS T-lift is very straightforward, right? So here's an example of putting a screw using the robotic arm uh, down a, um, in this case, it's a mini open incision using a quadrant, but it's really no different than what you're already doing. So if you're doing your MIS T-lift with either fluoro or navigation, incorporating the robotic system really doesn't change your workflow. In this particular case, it, it really is just another way of, of putting down a screw. And you can see the, uh, um, the straightforwardness of putting down that screw, right? So this is for a one level T-lift. If you're doing a two level T-lift, right, same thing. So here again is a video of, of putting down those um, three screws. And again, as you'll see here, this is the, the top screw. I put screws proximal to distal just because you're going from farther away from the arm to 
uh, the closest distance to the arm, so the potentially least accurate. And in this way, um, it's a, just a paraspinal incision. And you can see how straightforward it is, right? So even if you're very fast and proficient with navigation, this is showing the drill, this is showing the tap. And then of course, uh, lastly, is the screw being placed. And it, it's meant to be this straightforward, right? As, as um, nice as it's been to put in screws uh, using navigation, which I did um, earlier prior to the robot, the addition of the arm has made that um, even more uh, straightforward. And then of course you just proceed with your MIST lift uh, and then your incision, and then of course your usual closure. So in this particular case, the patient selection, it's any patient you would do an MIST lift on. And then technical, there's really no difference, right? Just your usual robotic care. Uh, I personally do screws first and then cages, but the reverse also works well um, if that's your workflow. Now the nest is a uh, single position, right? So here we have a four five single position OLIF and uh, this is showing a four five spondy. And this is following, of course, um, Rick Hines' great talk on, on the single position surgeon. But if you don't have the luxury of having his, you know, really fantastic bed, then single position for four five um, using robotic, uh, robotic arm is, is very um, doable and it, it's very nice in a lot of ways. Like I mentioned, the robotic arm requires a plan so here's your plan, right? So here are the screws already being planned. The patient's position in the lateral position, right? Position all the way close to the edge of the bed in preparation for screws being placed in the lateral position. And you can see here that the benefit of the robotic system is because all those screws are planned. And so instead of putting it under navigation or even fluoroscopy, it makes this part of the case much more straightforward. Once the robot is registered, I don't need to shoot any more fluoro. Right, so the arm here is being sent to the L45 level, similar to a navigated case. And so once I know that trajectory for 45, then the arm is then sent back to my assistant and then screws are placed at the same time. And you can see here that workflow where while I'm exposing for 45, my assistant is placing screws in the lateral position. And so it's uh, simultaneous or as near simultaneous as you can get. Uh, if you have the luxury of having a second surgeon or an assist. You can see here the benefits of an anti psoas approach. So the X is four five, it doesn't matter where the iliac crust is, right? So I'm going in front of the iliac crust. And then of course you have the robotic system telling you that I'm at the correct disc space. So I don't need to shoot another fluoro shot for this part of the surgery. The uh, retractors go in and then here is the robotic plan and then the intraoperative Thoroscopy. So again, for a single position lateral decubitus case, um, incorporating the robot is, is very, very beneficial because now you have a rigid arm that allows you to place your screws in lateral position. Now, I'm not going to lie, and I know um, uh, Dr. Luis Pimenta is going to be talking about prone lateral. And, you know, Juan always says that surgeons naturally want to place screws in the prone position. I think that's just a natural way to do it. But again, if you choose to put it in lateral, uh, the robotic arm is um, just very, very uh, useful for that. So for patient selection, any patient you would do an anti psoas approach on, and then technically, you really want the patient to be taped down very well to minimize movement for your lateral position screws. You wanna put in the right-sided screws first, that way all the, the blood drips down, doesn't get in your way for your left side screws. And then the anterior surgeon can expose simultaneously. Um, I tried to, to, to coin the a single, uh, I'm sorry, SRSPS, which is simultaneous robotic single position surgery uh, to much failure. Uh, but in case you ever see SRSPS in the literature, that's essentially what it means where you're doing simultaneously uh, because the anterior surgeon can't expose uh, at the same time. Now the next last EGEN case is 5-1, right? So as, as Dr. Hines has said, and there's another great talk later today, 5-1 is still really the only case where you can do single position with a large, large cage. So here you have a uh, 5-1 spondylosis patient coming in with foot drop. Uh, this is a, again, the robotic plan showing the screws. So the screws are already planned. In addition to that, I can plan where the posterior and anterior disc space is. So as you learn the OLIF or uh, lateral ALIF technique, you mark the disc space so that you find the sacral slope. You can see this gentleman, right? So high BMI, which is more ideal for a lateral ALIF. I think all my vascular surgeons, you know, hate doing uh, supine ALIFs in people who are over a certain BMI just because all of that fat gets in the way. 
But for a lateral ALIF or 5-1 OLIF, all of that falls out of the way. Patient's position again, uh, right to the edge of the bed. And here you can, can again see once the robot is registered, mm -hmm. I'm sending the arm to the disc space. And specifically, I'm sending it to the uh, anterior disc. And then I mark that and I send it to the posterior disc. And then I mark that. So now I have my sacral slope. The arm is then sent back uh, to the posterior surgeon. So while my assist is putting in those four screws, I can expose anteriorly to the 5-1 disc. And here is what that exposure looks like. And again, um, for that exposure, a great powerful way to put in a large A-lift cage. You see your psoas here. You know that medial to the psoas is the left common iliac artery. Underneath that is the left common iliac vein. Here is the discectomy, right? So you get a full discectomy from top to bottom, which is uh, uh, side to side, uh, you know, ipsilateral to contralateral. And then you have a large A-lift cage uh, being placed in. And you can see here, just like a supine A-lift, you get a really powerful uh, correction and distraction of, um, of the 5-1 level, right? So uh, you have pre-op and post-op, uh, so again, a good uh, correction at that level in the lateral position with screws placed in single position. So for patient selection, it's again, any patient you would do an MIS lateral alephon, right? So you would just have to check your vascular anatomy. Vascular to expose if you're unfamiliar with the exposure, of course. And so your vascular surgeons will just have to be on board in performing um, this type of surgery. And then technically it's gonna be the same as your uh, lateral positioned um, four or five or higher uh, lateral cages where the patient needs to be taped down very well to minimize any movement for the lateral position screws. Again, put your right-sided screws first and your anterior surgeon, whether it's you or your vascular surgeon can expose. You just have to be careful not to move the patient um, during the screw placement as you're exposing, um, but to save time that can still occur. So those are my three uh, quote unquote simple cases. I think moving on to incorporate robotics into complex cases. I think this is where you start to um, expand and see more of the benefits of the incorporation of robotics. So the first is minimally invasive deformity. And in this, um, I'm showing an L2 to S1 OLIF and then a two to ilium uh, minimally invasive perk in the single position, right? So you have someone like this, who's got a mismatch of 35, a pelvic tilt of 40 degrees. He's a tall guy at 6'4". Uh, he was in the Navy, used to move around ordnance, right? So moving around missiles and bombs, so huge guy. That's probably why he's able to retrovert his pelvis so much um, because of his uh, imbalance. So in looking at this gentleman, right, as a virgin case, you know, we figured, is there a way to offer him a minimally invasive option? If we put in cages at those levels from two to one, Will we give him back enough to balance him? And this is what you know the patient-specific rods and predictive analytics are, are meant to do to try and see if that's enough. Now, in moving forward with that plan, again, as I've shown you earlier, the robot needs a plan. So here is the L2 to S2 plan for the screws, and then the placement of those cages simulating what that correction would be. And again, you have a very good way to line up the screws from L2 down to S2 AI, and the, the purpose essentially in putting S2 AI screws, I, I typically routinely will put iliac fixation if I'm going up to two, especially since he's so big and heavy. It's just a weight off of my mind <clears throat> that even though I'm putting in a 5-1 cage that I won't hail out my S1 screws and protect them with iliac fixation. And really now, you know, one of the biggest reasons is that I can, right? We can do it in single position. So here you have the incision for L2-3 and L3-4, uh, and then you have here the incision for 4-5 and 5-1. So with this video, this is the 5-1 um, cage going in first. And again, you really see the, the benefits of lateral decubitus positioning. So although you give up a lot of things, as Dr. Hines has talked about, the ability to put in cages from 5-1 all the way up is a really powerful way to keep lateral to cubitus positioning still in your technical armamentarium. So that was the four or five cage that was, it was oblique. And here you have the um, uh, two, three or three, four cage going in 
uh, which is more of a, a direct approach um, going down into that space. This is the S2 screw going in, right? So you have the L2 to S1 screws, S2 AI screw going in, and this is what it looks like. So you have L2 screws at the top, you have the S1 screws at the bottom in these paraspinal incisions, and then you have your iliac fixation of S2 AI. And here's a video of, of what that looks like, right? So the robot comes into position, and then of course you put in all your usual tools. Here's your robot knife, which is a 22 blade. You have your navigated dilator, which is essentially a, a cannula and tissue protector. You have a long drill. And again, I'm sitting down and I'm not gonna lie, it's a bit awkward, right? Putting the instruments down, going from ceiling, I'm sorry, from floor to ceiling. But otherwise, the video is quite boring, right? I mean, all you're seeing are drills, taps, and screws, and it's meant to be boring, right? So as opposed to doing this with thoroscopy or doing this with navigation, where you're looking back and forth and it can be a, a terror, right? To, to slip off of the bone and, and be off of your trajectory, the robot arm keeps you in place so that you can actually place these iliac fixation um, points while in lateral. So again, you have this pre-op scan of 22 degrees of lordosis tilting at 48 degrees. And already in the hospital, he's, um, he's releasing his compensatory mechanisms, right? So I gave him back the lordosis that I wanted. He's got a pelvic tilt down to 16 degrees. And again, the power of some of these predictive analytics is you see here in the middle screen, this was the plan. And the plan doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't just give him lordosis to match his PI, but the plan is trying to predict how much he'll actually release his pelvic tilt. And what's really nice here is you can actually see the plan is, is helping to predict that he's actually going to um, unflex his knees, right? Which I think is so interesting and powerful and, and something that, um, you know, as we move forward with technology and machine learning and, and the use of predictive analytics and AI will only help us be better in terms of the plans that we use, right? To help these patients. So for patient selection, you know, the PILO mismatch has to be low enough to be corrected with inner body cages only, right? And as spoken in the earlier talk, you have to rely on indirect decompression um, if the screws are placed in lateral. So you've already decided up front that, especially in lateral position, you, you can't be doing any osteotomies, decompressions. It's just going to be too hard with all those screws. And then it just has to be an appropriate lateral ALIF candidate and appropriate, you know, antisoas candidate too. From a technical standpoint, um, I put all my cages in first with fluoroscopy. The right-sided screws go in first as well, just like all screws in lateral position. I put in L2 to S1, and then the iliac screws go in last, just because there's so much um, bony uh, attachment that it really moves the patient to get in those screws. You have to check the robotic software for potential tower collisions, right? Just because you're putting in a lot of screws, um, perk or transfascial. And then bailouts, right? I mean, when you're putting in something like this, either for the first time or the third time, you always have to wonder what you do if you just can't get in that iliac screw. Um, Bill Taylor here at UCSD is a fantastic mentor and uh, obviously another um, leader and, and legend in the field. And he always says that it's one of the hardest things for a surgeon to do is to change the plan once you're in the operating room, right? Once you're in the operating room, you have a plan, you wanna just run through it. One of the hardest things to do is to change that plan if things aren't going your way. So if you can't get in that screw, bailouts are to just leave in one screw, which is fine, right? People have put in single iliac fixation points, put in no iliac fixation because arguably you have S1 in a large alip cage or just flip prone, right? If, you're, if none of your lateral screws are going in well, um, you know, you're cursing the robot, you're cursing the decision to do something in lateral. Again, you can always just flip prone do your nav and still accomplish your surgical goals, right? Just have to be okay mentally with, uh, with changing that plan. Now, the last two cases, complex cases are gonna be um, minimally invasive deformity cases, right? Again, another area where robotics really shines. And in this particular case, it's gonna be a T12 to L4 OLIF with a T9 to ilium, um, minimally invasive multi-rod uh, posterior spinal fixation infusion. So I have a gentleman coming in, um, D. Jen Scully with sagittal imbalance. Um, he's 75, turning 76, right? So high functioning guy. And again, his, his um, charge to me 
was that he wanted to be better because he was still, you know, golfing and sailing on his boat, but to not kill him, right? And of course, we all know the morbidities that can be associated with open surgery. So, you know, I'm thinking to myself, is there a way to give him back his lordosis using either minimally invasive or at least many open techniques? The robotic software is nice because you can help to plan in an ideal world what some of your cages or osteotomies will do, right? So here I'm putting in four cages and I'm putting in just a little bit more of a, a PCO in the back. In an ideal world, if I get him 35 degrees across this region, will this balance him? And if you look at the bottom, his mismatch is 25, it gets him back to negative nine. This would be an, a successful plan if I'm able to accomplish that. Now you can see this plan, we're talking about putting in screws from T9 down to S2 and putting in multiple rods. So I'm not, um, I'm not a, a superhero like Neil Anand, I know is in the audience. I know he's been doing this for a decade. And unfortunately, I don't have his x-ray eyes to be able to, to line up screws with either x-ray or fluoroscopy. So being able to do this on the robotic system now makes that feasible because I can design these screws and the rod, as you can see, is planar, right? So it's a straight rod going down from T9 down to S2. And um, with this, the, the hardest part mostly is just getting the correction. So I put in my cages from T12 down to L4. Here are the screws going in transfashion, right? So I, I've done this both ways. I've done the stab incisions. I've done a single skin incision. This is an example of a single skin incision and you can really see how bloodless it is. And for someone who's 75 turning 76, I just don't want to have the stress of blood loss and fluid shifts and checking the lactic acid and the base deficit and making sure I have a good anesthesiologist so that he doesn't get behind. These screws go in and it's a nice, um, comfortable time in the operating room where I know he's, he's not gonna die. Uh, next, you can see here, just this forest of towers, which is already daunting. The fact that the screws are already planned, though, just makes this the result of it, right? It's not something to be scared of because I already know where the screws are going because I planned them. The next up is, um, this is just a demonstration to show that with the robotic system, it is accurate, right? I mean, is it more accurate than nav? Is it the most accurate and perfect thing? It, it's, it's not perfect. It's as accurate or a little bit more accurate than nav. There's going to be potential for error. Nevertheless, when you talk about a complex case like this, it is very, very good. And you can see here, even in the registration, the robotic system has detected that those cages have given my patient lordosis. Each one of those bones has been separated because it's detected that those bones have moved in three-dimensional space, and it is still going to place those screws into those bones in that three-dimensional space. As with my plan, I wanted to do a mini open. So I, I just opened up from T12 down to L4 out to the edges of the pars, right? And, um, and just to leading up to the bone. So as opposed to an open case where I'm exposing TP to TP, I'm just exposing enough for my osteotomies to get a little bit more compression at that level. And then this is my final construct, right? So passing down multiple rods, with a variety of screws. And again, when you look at the CT scan, I have your traditional transpedicular screws, in, out, in, uh, juxtapedicular screws, cortical screws, iliac screws, S2 screws, essentially any screw in bone that makes this line up and gets me good fixation. And it's all very accurate, right? So as long as you have good technique, then the system is very accurate. You can see my pre-op prediction in an ideal world if I can get 35 degrees across that region, will it match him? And you can see here, you know, that result, right? So for someone like this, 75 turning 76, he went straight to telly, right? So skip the ICU, no blood loss, out of the hospital in four or five days walking the next day, right? And the, the ability to design robust constructs like this now is possible, right, with the robotic system. So in terms of patient selection, you know, I would certainly defer to the MIS Def2 criteria that Praveen uh, released, especially if you're starting to do this. It's a great way to categorize some of these deformity patients. There will be some who are just not good for MIS. 
your MIS surgery is never going to be as good as open, but that means that for patients who are too frail or just not ideal for open correction, this is still an option for them. And again, in terms of that correction, you just have to rely on cages or a mini open posterior column osteotomy with those cages to add some more to make sure you still hit your surgical goals and your parameters. From a technical standpoint, you have to be comfortable with your lateral approach for inner bodies because you rely a lot on that, whether for coronal or sagittal correction. And in this case, you have to be familiar to plan the screws yourself. Your techs are great and all the plans earlier and all of the DGEN cases, your techs can, can plan them for you and you can just make minor adjustments. Um, and each region and practice is gonna be different. If you're doing MIS deformity for screws, you really just have to be familiar to plan it yourself because it's so it's much more complex, especially if you're trying to put in multiple rods, um, transfascial or percutaneous. And then lastly, you just have to decide how you want to perform your facet fusion. So this is more of a minimally invasive deformity problem, but you can do a robot guidance. You can do a navigated drill, which is what I typically do after my arm spin. You can do it blindly by right? just putting down a drill between your transfascial incisions and then decide on your graft, right? Put in none, put in DBM, and I know some places are using uh, BMP. So the last case uh, I'll do, which I'm, I'm uh, a little bit behind on time, but this, uh, for the last deformity case, T12 to S1 OLIF and then a T9 to ilium multi-rod. So again, another deformity case, right? You have a lady coming in, um, degen scoliosis, uh, pelvic mismatch with a pelvic tilt of almost 40 degrees. And again, her BMI is, is 42, right? So you're looking at someone who's not really the ideal candidate for an open correction, especially when you consider all of the, the wound complications for folks who are up at this BMI. But as a fairly flexible deformity, and for someone who's never had surgery, there is the possibility of putting in cages and getting that correction. So you can see here the robotic plan of going from T9 down to S2, with multiple points of iliac fixation. And with this robotic plan, I can try and simulate what that correction would be, right? So in an ideal or near ideal world, what can I get and how much can I correct with this? And again, you'll, you'll see here with the cages going in, there's, there's nothing that's gonna be more powerful than an A-lift cage at your four, five and five, one levels. And if you can do that in the lateral position through an, an MIS approach, then you can continue to walk up and don't have to reposition for any of your other cages. So you see here, you have your four, five, five, one. I put in lateral cages the rest of the way up. And this is the intra-op. And already intra-op, I've been able to correct her coronally, right? You can see here are her incisions. So to be able to put in six cages through an incision for someone, as you can see, as big as her, three inches and two and a half inches is incredible, especially when you're talking about a minimally invasive philosophy. Because this was staged, um, I, stood up, I stood her up uh, in between the stages. So she has a good correction of her coronal deformity. And this is a good um, estimation, right? Of what I was sort of predicting to what I actually got. And then sagittally, right? So you can see here, I'm getting back just with the cages alone. I got about 40 degrees, right? Already hitting very near hitting my target. And a lot of that is from my four, five to S1. But as you know, Neil and on will tell you in a lot of his talks, you can get lordosis from your lateral cages as well. And you can see here, um, a great prediction, right, of what I was going to have. The robotic plan comes in T9 down to S2. And again, you can see how that really um, eases a lot of the planning by placing these screws percutaneously and putting in the idea of um, multiple rod fixation, especially for someone who's bigger and is gonna be stressing that level. This is the intraoperative 2D film, right? So all the screws have gone in. You can see uh, four rods going down to get that extra uh, fixation. And then you can see here the passage of those rods. So um, there's three rod holders coming in here. <laughs> the two people in the background, it's my PGY7 and my PGY2. And I, I kid you not, passing these rods took about 10 minutes time, right? And it's because all of the screws are already lined up. So as long as you know how to slide that rod and, and give it a little bit of, uh, you know, grease, right? It'll go from screw to screw to screw to screw, and it'll just slide all the way down. The hardest part really is just getting through the soft tissue. 
but finding those screws is, is not that hard, especially when all of the rods are lined up. Here's our post-op films standing. So again, you have correction of her degen scoli. Again, good opposition to my predicted plan. And then with her standing, I got position prone, right? A few more degrees, almost about 10 uh, to correct her. And again, good opposition to what I was essentially predicting. So for someone like this, right? To be able to offer a construct that is minimally invasive, no drains, no ICU stay, no blood transfusions um, is, is incredible. And I think the placement of a construct like this is only possible by the um, incorporation of robotics, right? So the title of the talk, how do you incorporate robotics into your simple and complex cases? This is a great case to demonstrate its utility. And again, with the um, predictive analytics and confirming that this plan is enough for her, right? You again see the relaxation of her compensatory mechanisms sagely, which is a really powerful way that um, although open surgery would have given her more, I think this is enough to give her a really great outcome. So patient selection, similar to um, the prior case, you just have to be sure they're appropriate for a minimally invasive approach. And you just have to be comfortable with your lateral approach, planning your screws and how you wanna do your fusion. So, you know, in conclusion, a lot of the talk about robotics is how to put in screws. You know, do you put in screws with nav, fluoro, freehand, you use the robot. But I think, you know, that's just a small window into what the, the bigger picture is, right? And the bigger picture is, is that the use of these robotics platforms and um, predictive planning on the software is really allowing us to do our surgeries, the same surgeries we've been doing, but in a potentially different and better way, and especially for minimally invasive surgery, right? Where you don't have the luxury of seeing the open spine, incorporating robotics into minimally invasive surgery, I think is really gonna change and um, improve um, the good things that we're, we're already doing. So a uh, little bit over time, but uh, thanks again for, uh, for listening. That's a great talk, Martin. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's anyone in the audience with a question. I, I um, actually agree with you. I, you know, just for pedicle score accuracy, that, that's really been what's promoted with robotics and it's not a value add. I mean, I don't think it's any better than conventional navigation. It doesn't justify the cost. So it's really comes down to what else it offers and the ability for predictive analytics, which is also in its infancy, I, I think, is it, gonna be a big plus for the robot. And as, as well as increasing everybody's technical skills to a certain level. I mean, it does actually ease um, uh, some of the um, physical demands of an operation, as you mentioned. So th those are two big points that I, I think I've personally um, I found to be uh, a use for the robot. Um, anyone with a question, Timmer? Oh, quick one. Martin, big fan of your Instagram fan, uh, page. Uh, uh, nice presentation. I'm gonna call you out on something just for the sake of discussion. Yes, please. On T-Lift, you were mentioning that you go from the uh, further levels towards the pelvis where you have a navigation array. Yes. The um, accuracy changes. But then in your lateral, you're talking about doing all the right screws first or the floor screws first, I guess top to bottom, then converting to back to the top level, but on the left. Does not contradict your uh, the two statements? It does, it does. And I think in, in that case, um, I'm, I'm splitting the differences. Um, I think in an ideal world, you would do um, you know L2, L2, L3, L3, L4, L4. Um, but I think in, in that particular case, it just makes more sense to stay on that side. Um, you'll find I probably contradict myself a lot. Um, don't, don't search for me because I'm sure I have a bunch of talks out there or I'm just saying different things and saying that the robot is terrible. Um, but that's true. You know, I, I think in the, in the lateral position, um, the caveat in, in doing it that way just um, outweighs sort of the benefits of, of the workflow. Yeah, uh, Neil. There's a comment really. Those big deformity kits, I think, beautifully done and very elegant, as I said. I think as you get more comfortable, you might find that you did not need that PCO in the back. It would really be a bias. It comes just with the laterals. Trust your screws and rods to get you where you want. And I'm not sure you need those multiple rods. You'll be fine with two rods. There's so many in the body. There. And I can do it not have any problems with two rods. We just published our hardware failure rate. It's 2.2% over 13 years with two titanium rods. Mm -hmm. 
so pretty comfortable today that I think we need to move away from the open philosophy, right? It all comes from that open surgery, it where does. you need multiple rods. We're not doing that. So there is definitely a paradigm shift here, and you might find again, again, just look at it. You start getting comfortable with two rods. Everything else is perfect. Really well done. No, yeah, I no. really appreciate it too, and I, I will admit it's it's a bias, of course, from from spending an entire year with, uh, you know, Larry Linky and Ron, um, and just seeing the multiple rods, and I think that's a, a carryover. Um, but I do think that you know, especially when you're not disrupting the tissue and all of that is intact, um, that the failure rates should be, and as you're saying, are uh, lower. Great, Martin. I, you know, I think we could extend this discussion ad nauseum, actually. Great talk. Um, but we need to move on. We're a little bit behind. So, you know, I don't need to introduce Neil Nan. I mean, he, he's an old timer. <laughs> I say that in the nicest way. Um, and he's going to be uh, giving us his experience on oblique lateral, um, uh, inner body fusion versus la uh, laterals. Thanks, Paul. Always a pleasure to be here. And some of it may be repetitive, and I thought I'll take the liberty of kind of maybe maybe fine-tuning the talk a little bit i thought you know we all talk of mis mis i think it's interesting it's important to know what is mis to me this is what it is it truly is performing surgery with no collateral damage that's all great what does that mean though i think we got to find tissue sparing and muscle sparing approaches and i'm going to harp on that a lot that's what mis is to me and then finding aerial planes that will get the job done at our target site. You still got to do the job, but you find an aerial plane and not move things around. To me, that's what's MI. It's not a tube, it's not a technique, it's not a procedure, it's not a company. And end of end, this can lead itself to many things. We've all done this. I'm old enough to know I've done tons of these. We used to do thoracic approaches every day like this. You split the rib cage, put these things in, strip everything open, and we all know how these patients did. This was humongous, and all this was just to get to the spine. The chest wall is not the problem, but we didn't know how to get there, and that's what we did. And we know the mobility came from actually the approach, not what we did in the spine. So the idea is, can we do that without, right, without doing all this? To me, that's what am I as a go away from this to doing something different. Same with open cholecystectomy. I always, I always say this, that one year results of open cholecystectomy and lab code is exactly the same. It should be exactly the same, but it's a six week result that's different because you moved away from this massive abdominal incision. The mobility is the abdominal approach, not taking the gallbladder out. So I think it becomes really important what you're looking at. To me, that's MIS. You took away that muscle uh, muscle injury, which was not necessary to do the surgery. So that to me is MIS. And these guys, and general surgeons are a phenomenal job of moving from you. Nobody does thoracotomies. I mean, people are doing stents and everyone's evolved to doing different things. And we all have understood that and moved away. Same with appendectomy. You got a resident sitting out there and pulling on your abdominal wall. I mean, how can it not hurt? I mean, today we're all laughing, right? We all did this. I certainly did a lot of these. I mean, we all saw it, we all were there. And then you switch it to what we do today, laparoscopic. I think that's, that, that's what MIS is. That's why it's been so successful. And we need to look at that when we do spine surgery. It's not about a tube. I'm gonna say it again and again. I and mean, the amount of money that's spent on tubes is unbelievable. The amount of money that's going on, it's got nothing to do with it. You can put a single tube and you can put a speculum in, right? And when we do this stuff like that, this is what our patients feel. Ultimately, this is what matters. It's not ODI at two years and not SF36 or whatever. This is patient in the recovery. They're like shocked at what has happened. So it's that patient experience. That to me is what we need to change. That's MIS. That's MIS surgery, right? And I always say the best MIS surgery we do every single day is ACVF. Why? It's absolute areolar planes. We don't cut a single muscle. We do it every day. Why do they do so well? That's all. It doesn't matter. You can do four level ACDF here and still they do so well. You know, as long as you're careful tissue and there's your proof that that's what we need to do, right? And so I think it's important. So in terms of then going down to approaches, right? There are so many different approaches today. And why is, I, I, I hate saying old, if I'd rather say a pre service approach. And what's important, I think, is when you look at the difference when you go lateral, it's an areola plane you want to find, and the pre service plane is your areola plane. And when you go lateral, see what happens to the belly and abdominal contents. It actually moves away. It totally moves away and falls away from you, opening up that plane and the kidney. 
everything sweeps and falls away. So you get that access in front of the servers, between the servers and the IOTA. So that's what you want. Again, back we go back to ECDF all the time. But I think what you're doing is finding these access points segment by segment. And I think modern tool great. That's what you do. You decide how you're going to go to that disk. Are you going to go with, so I'll show you in a minute, in the bifurcation, or are you going to go lateral to the IOTA? Try not to mobilize the vessels. I'm a strong advocate saying L45 ALIF is not MIS. If you're going to take the iliolumbar, lumbar, you're going to take the segmental, you're going to mobilize the vessel, you're not really doing something. You're moving anatomy from where it should be. So you want to move it as minimal as possible. And that's where I think, again, the pre-service comes in. We'll talk about that in a minute. But so the, the, again, what, the other difference is the anatomy, right? Unfortunately, you, you have a muscle that's filled with nerves. The service muscle has nerves in it, whether you like it or not, it's there. That's your anatomy, it exists there. And I think, this is my 13th case, I can tell you that, that nerve is right next to where that guide wire went and this patient did wake up with a complete quadriceps palsy and monitoring did not pick it up. And so I think it's there, we get away with it. Is that necessarily right? Probably not. And so, and this one you rebase, I mean, he's done amazing work showing the dissections. But what I want to point to is not just this big nerve. This big nerve we can probably avoid, we can get away. It's there, and you may with monitoring get away with it. But I ask all of you to read Steve Ludwig's paper. It's a massive plethora of a plexus. They're all interconnecting fibers within the cervus muscle. If you actually dissect, you'll see it. So what happens when you go through the muscle, you're plastering the plexus down. You're not necessarily getting the nerve. So there is injury. So of course, what do you know to get away in 20 minutes, get away in 30 minutes, try to get away from it. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to battle a, a problem that exists with increasing different, different problems of doing it. But I don't want to knock it, but I think there are great experts of transverse approach. People have done extremely well and, and have very good results. They got nothing against all that. But can't we do better? Can't we go somewhere that's a little better than try to work through these muscles? And then you got zero femoral nerve sitting right on top. It's sitting right on the fascia. And when you do a pre-source approach, you'll see it every single time. And it's amazing to me how we don't get it every single time when you go transverse. It's sitting right there. How do we miss it? I have no idea. There's no way you monitor it. It's fascinating when you see that. Again, we get away with it. So why should we do that? Why, why can't we do something that we cannot, right? And then and there's, and there's enough. We can talk about paper after paper talking about the issues that come up with it, right? Cordyceps palsy is real. You never want to see it. No patient should walk with a knee brace after a lateral approach. And once that, once you see that, it, it really gets you. And unfortunately, I've seen enough. I've seen four. So, and if you look at all the papers, the, the problem everyone says it recovers. Yeah, we're lucky. Most of them do recover in six months to nine months, agreed. But some don't. Some don't. And that's the problem. And you can't predict that. Who are you going to predict on? How long are you going to watch that? So it truly is an iatrogenic injury. I think we need to be careful with it. And paper after paper will show you. Look, if you follow them, there's always between one to three to five percent. I actually think it's more than that. If you really, this is a great paper. All I said, the reason I like this paper is it was their learning curve. So if you're the young guy out there going out and going to do it, that's a good paper to read. At 18 months, they had 9.6% had sensory deficits with 2.3 and motor deficit and only 25% even followed up to 18 months. So God knows what happened to the other 75%. This is a pretty scary paper, but I take it more as a learning curve. I'm sure they're much better today. I'm sure they're not getting that, but if you're gonna start it, I think it's fair. These are very accomplished surgeons. So that's what they got, that's what they got. And I think that's a fair reflection of where it, it is, right? And it's not right. So, and we don't know if there's an anatomy on that. Four or five is obviously most at risk anatomically when it comes up and forward. And then we got all these things we came up with, directional EMGs and triggered EMGs and monitorings. And we talked of shallow docking for a while and how you look at it and dissect through it and so on and so forth, right? We had all these things we do, and including myself. But you get something like this. This is my 213th case. I thought I was the world's biggest expert in doing trans laterals. This was my best friend's wife. All right, when you see something like that, you'll never forget it. This is absolutely my last case I ever did. Monitoring was dead on perfect. There was nothing wrong. Case went smooth as a whistle. Last 20 cc of blood or whatever, as usual. And then if someone goes, you go to recovery, zero by five quadriceps. Now, luckily she did recover over seven months. But instead of dinner, be there in the house and she's in a knee brace. It's nothing obvious to my friend, right? But still, you don't want to do that. You don't want to see that. To me, I can tell you that's why I changed. This was my fourth case now. If you never had it, 
good for you, you're lucky. But for me, I won't go back to answers ever more. Let's go back again anatomically. In orthopedics, everybody did orthopedics, we never went through a muscle. Every approach we did, the orthopedic surgeon recognized were intermuscular approaches. We found planes between muscles. Where would, I mean, humeral plating, anyone who's done a plating of the humerus, the radial nerve sitting right there. You wouldn't go through the long head of the triceps. We went between the long and lateral head. We have all these approaches described for years. Nobody described a through muscle approach. It never happened. So why, why did we go there? I don't know. I'm equally guilty. I did that for nine years myself. So I'm not saying, and I'm not saying with anyone doing it is wrong, but I think you can use an aerial plane. That's all pre is. pre is nothing but an aerial plane in front of the service, between the iota and the service. But obviously you need that brain. You study that on the MRI. So how do you figure that out? You, you do the anatomical corridors, right? And this is no different than, again, thoracic abdominal approach. It'll go back to open. We did this for years. We have this big incision. We go down there. But we went in front of the service. Even when we did this big approach, we would go in front of the service and do what we need to do in terms of what we did. We never went through the service at that time, and I don't remember ever seeing a patient with cortisol palsy. We did a lot of these, and that's what sort of made me go back. I said, no, this is not right. We gotta go in front of the service. So the way we decide today is MRI. Study the MRI segment by segment. If, if, if the iota is not bifurcated, and you got space between the two, they usually always space. If it's not bifurcated, you can go lateral to the iota and in front of the service. It's always there. If it's already bifurcated, like this particular patient, look at four or five, it's already splitting, and you go one millimeter down, it completely split. This patient, you cannot go lateral to the aorta. You're gonna go in the bifurcation at four or five. So this particular patient would get what was already talked about, a lateral A lift for me, but it's based on that segmentation the patient has, five one is an A lift two. So all we're deciding on the MRI is whether we can go lateral in the bifurcation. This patient, three, four, four, five, and five, one. I can go lateral to the aorta. And this goes directly with your Mickey Mouse cells. If it is bifurcated, the cells will be highlighting the iliac crest will come in your way. It's embryologically and anatomically the same. They follow each other. It's a segmentation issue. That's how you develop. So the iliac crest is never an issue. We don't even look at it. Look at the bifurcation. If it's bifurcated, your psoas will be high, your iliac crest will be in the way. You do your go between the bifurcation. If it's not bifurcated, you can go lateral to the aorta for that particular level. That's all we do at every single level. So segment by segment, anatomically study it, see what you want to do, and find that approach with what you need to do. All right? So that's important. As that patient gets a two-level alif, right? In a, a lateral alif in the same position. So to me, this is how we already talked about it. It's a single position, lateral approach to every interbody level. Again, you can do phi one. Again, it was already talked about before. Huge advantage. At least for me, I think majority of patients need phi one if you're doing deformity. So what is the point? Now, all of a sudden, we've started talking of approaches where, and I'm not gonna say any names, where you can do laterals, but then all of a sudden, because you cannot do phi one, a T lift became great. Are we going backwards? I mean, we've talked about it for years, and I will talk coming up later, to talk about how do we now go back to T lift at phi one? when we've seen so much that ALIF is still the best. So because you can't do something, does it make something not right, right? All right, we know that it's not. You still want to do an ALIF at five. I think there's no question ALIF at five one is your best sagittal correction device, especially if you're doing MIS, right? You're doing MIS relying on the interbody. So you want a good interbody. So this is the biggest advantage to me of going pre-service, lateral position. You can do all the levels. You keep going how high you want in the same position if you need it, right? And then it's truly anatomical and, uh, and the aerial plane, there's a source in the back, you drop it right down, it's direct visualization, you're looking at it, nothing is blind, and make sure everything is swept out. Not one step is blind, we actually see it all the way down. And you can sweep everything out, make sure there's nothing in your plane, and basically that's where you five one and then move on to four five. I think all that is elegantly shown before, and basically that's how you keep going level by level. The other difference is you're coming obliquely. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, and it's surprising here that, again, people talk this orthogonal issue. It's just part of the technique, right? When you go oblique, you are going to correct that. You're not supposed to put the cage obliquely. It's part of the technique. That doesn't make the technique bad. It's part of the technique where you go orthogonal. It's supposed to correct that when you go in. And the instruments for me have been the same instruments I've used forever. It has never changed. It's the same instruments I still use. It hasn't, you don't have to change anything. All you got to do is correct your maneuver and make it straight. It takes three seconds to do that. And just remember that, that's all you gotta do. So you go still orthogonal, and then phi one, all you gotta do is retract the vessels. If you planned it right in the bifurcation, all you do is retract the vessels. You're staring at your disc, it's, it's the same alif. 
It literally takes three seconds, middle sacral artery is taken, you put a retractor on the left common iliac, one in the bifurcation, one in the right common iliac. It's a left common iliac, you want to watch where that trench should drop, and that's all there is to it, and you do your a -lift. So we're not mobilizing, we're not cutting, we're not taking anything around, and then you do your a -lift just like you normally would do it, right? So anyway, anyway, so this quick, you can, so regular a -lift, so this, this is a, uh, I'll be a paraplegic patient with severe sarco joint there, three, four. And just to quickly show you how you can do every single level, right? You can work it up, this CT scan, sarco joint there. And literally, that clunking joint, any, all of you guys know we have stage protocol for these things. And it's worked really efficiently. Again, Martin showed that very well. And, and I think he executed it extremely well. But again, you do your pre as you go down there, put the interbodies, line them up, make sure you preserve the end plate every single time, right? Make sure you preserve it, and you can go down there and do a regular ALIF. That's a regular ALIF device. Most people recognize what that is, as you do in supine. So you don't need a fancy device, you don't need a fancy equipment. It's the same ALIF, it's just a lateral position. And, and, and there's all robotic screws, by the way. It has totally changed my practice. So three years now, all we're doing is using robots. We never had to touch, remove, or go near the old screws. But again, that's a huge advantage, robot, you can plan it, work around it, put the new screws in, and get it, and um, these are almost three, three years out, I think, now. But anyway, just, just, just demonstrate how you can do a lateral ALIF, right? Complications. If you read the papers, every single complication you're going to find. But I think you gotta be careful. A lot of that were the learning curve of these authors as they were doing it. Two, a lot of things are called OLIF, and half of them you're gonna see are literally massive open surgeries. They just happen to go in front of the servers. Three, the biggest mistake is going and mobilizing the vessel. No. Do we see the carotid? Do we go around mobilizing the carotid and ACDF? We know where it is. So similarly, you can feel the aorta, you plan it pre-op, and you go down the plane. That is actually directly from the paper. I don't know how that's MIS. That's from the paper, the question of all of procedure. That's what we need to be doing. Something we're looking right down. You don't want to go. I don't want to see the aorta. I know it's there, we have planned it already, and you go into that plane right in front of the service, and it should be like an ACDF of the lumbar spine. And once you get there, I think it changes things a lot. It's part of this, our, our paper, looking at our results. And you'll see across the board, like the, the sagittal correction is actually really good with the laterals. We got a paper coming up right now, looking at the different stages. Anterior actually gives you the best sagittal correction. And it's the rods that give you actually coronal correction in a deformity, where you derotate and bring it around, and, and you can see the outcomes and so on. So I think end of the day, study the corridor, segment by segment. Look where access is. If it's in the bifurcation, you know, it, we, the only time I'll probably get an access surgeon, because if something happens, he can take care of it, that's about it. So if it's in the bifurcation, that's when he's access surgeon. And what's even better is, if he's not available, he's busy, I can do my laterals, he shows up anywhere between a window. I can always have said this between, eight and 11 or eight and 10. Anywhere in that window, he shows up, he does five one. In the main race of the time, I'm doing the rest of the stuff. So actually it becomes very useful, thank you. Neil, great, fantastic talk as always. Uh, any questions, uh, Timur, Sama, anyone from the audience? Just a great authoritative talk. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I thank you for that talk. So uh, one thing that uh, a lot of people are obviously fearful for from these procedures is, you know, how close is too close between the psoas muscle and the vasculature? Some people say centimeters. So what do you look at to, to make your decision on whether it's safe or not? It moves, nothing is stuck there, it moves. That's, that's the biggest mistake of measuring that distance. It's not static. As long as you've not had retroperitoneal surgery and there's no scarring, it all moves away. It literally a lot of it, I think, moves even more when you're operating, you sweep everything off. I make sure I'm looking at the ALL. I always, I always, that's the other thing I like about this, you always see the ALL. To me, anatomically is a way more relevant point than any X-ray in the world. If I see the ALL, I know I'm right there and I'll put my device just behind it. I can see it, feel it, put it. And you know the ALL is not there, right? The ALL is still further down there. So you, you're, you're pretty safe, you know you're not there. So, um... Uh, for purposes of time, Neil, I think we need to move on. We're about 15 minutes behind. I really would like to talk a bit more on it because uh, you bring up a lot of good points on maybe why we should rethink transos. although I honestly am biased. I, I've been doing transos for a while and I feel like it's a very good technique. And and um, that's a, a good segue into Luis Pimenta, who's uh, the father of transos surgery, if you want to call it that. And um, so he's gonna give us a good talk on why 
go prone versus lateral. So he um, has uh, embarked on a, a newer technique, the prone lateral, and I think he's gonna show us uh, the benefits of this procedure, so. Morning, everybody. Um, I will be talking uh, on why go prone versus going lateral after 20 years going lateral. Uh, and I can say- I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you um, go into a presenter or a, a presentation mode up on the top left? You can swap screens because we're seeing your full pr presentation, your presenter mode. So top left, there should be a button that says swap, switch displays, top uh, left uh, of your, I'm seeing it for mine. Um, so if you look above, I, there you go, you're in the right area, keep going to the left, keep going. You see these little things here where it says swap display. We don't have this. Um, uh, I, I wonder if I can control it. Do you see you're getting close to it? It's up on the top left. Uh, do you see your one minute counter? It says one minute, three minutes above that. Yeah. It's swap displays. Oh, right above that, right above. There you go, right above, swap display. Is it not? One more, no? There you go. Can you see where she circled? There it is. Yep. You gotta hit that button. Yeah, we are trying to hit, but. If that doesn't work, I can um, share your talk. There you go. Perfect. There we go. You're all set. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, I will be talking why going prone uh, and the changes that and the advantages to, to do the way we do. Uh, as disclosure, everybody knows I, I work for ATEC. Uh, and also everybody knows, and we are here talking about lateral because lateral during these 20 years has been proven a very good procedure because has such a large footprint is MIS, has less morbidity. Uh, we preserve muscle, uh, especially the stabilization muscles of the spine. And for lateral, we rely on indirect compression. What happens uh, when I moved four years ago, uh, we, we we observed that only 20% of surgeons really adopt lateral and that may be good reasons for that, right? When uh, we heard here before, uh, we don't access easily a posterior column. We need a robot and other things and still doesn't prove to me that is really uh, easy to teach uh, and uh, for everybody. So uh, positioning is a key problem uh, in lateral. Uh, several surgeons are afraid or doesn't want to learn how to position the patient and the need of requiring flips, it's not very uh, appealing. Uh, but one of the most problems, the biggest problem in lateral is the lack of lordosis and having to rely on indirect compression. That's why we start doing in prone, but it's not simply moving your retractor and start working uh, in prone. Uh, the benefits of prone is that we have much better doses. We can access from everything that's not 5.1. I agree that 5.1, we have to find what's best. My opinion is ALIF is better uh, when ALIF is needed. Uh, in prone, we have almost always uh, spongy 
uh, reduction, and we can access almost at the same time anterior column and the posterior column. We, we learned during these four years several uh, anatomical uh, difference between lateral and prone. One is the, the psoas, uh, it moves backwards in the prone position and bring the plexus more posterior, which helps, especially in 4-5. Uh, these two studies show this move, move of the psoas muscle posteriorly and uh, open space for 4-5. Uh, increased lordosis, segmental lordosis is more than twice bigger in the prone position versus lateral position, which allows you to do a better surgery in regard to lordosis. This is a case example, adjacent level disease. And when you position in prone in the second slide, you can see here that the disc opens up in the table before the procedure and after placing your cage, there is a significant gain of segmental lordosis in that level. Also, the, the system that we use provides coronal bending to replace the table and make sure that we access 4-5 always. Uh, specifically for 4-5, there is there are techniques to avoid coming close to the to the nerve because we have a different uh, uh, different uh, retractor with two blades we reach much more anterior to the disc and we don't mess with the nerve anymore so we reduce the risk of uh, neurological injuries by far uh, this is the typical this case shows the typical uh, opening in the table for adjacent level disease that is really important. Uh, so also uh, I have to talk on contraindications and of course 5.1 is not an indication for prone for lateral surgery in general. Uh, so uh, especially when we have, or when we have a, a Mickey Mouse a psoas muscle that uh, it's not because of the psoas itself, it's because it's a transitional level. Also, the vessels will be more uh, anterior, so it's not a good example. What about complications? People say, ah, Dr. Piment, you don't present your own complications. Okay, here is one paper uh, on the on axillary uh, lateral uh, showing 0.08% uh, of uh, uh, complications in general, including nerves and vessels. Uh, we, uh, there are some papers that have even more uh, to 10%, and this is the, at the time of lateral, right? Uh, what we have now is uh, in between uh, 2,500 cases, we had one bowel injury, two vessels injuries, which is under a point something percent. So it's, it's a very small number, but how to avoid the complications is more important than knowing that complication happens, right? It happens because of anatomy. Uh, it's, I always like to show uh, when I train surgeons, uh, the limits, so if you mark your spinal process, the crest and the ribs, there is a step on the quadratus that close to the quadratus, there is no bowel, no peritoneum. Uh, and we did a retroperitoneal study to show the distance between the quadratus and the peritoneum that is double the, the distance in prone compared to lateral. So when you position the patient in prone, all the contents, all the bowel falls down and makes more space. Uh, and you can reach as in this cadaver, you can reach the psoas uh, safe uh, without uh, being even close to vessels uh, or to the nerve. Uh, this is the study that we did, we stick 
uh, guide wires uh, in the 50 yard line uh, in three levels, L45 and two, two, three. Uh, and we had several violations, uh, around 70% of violations, bowel and uh, the kidney uh, in lateral versus uh, three uh, violations uh, in prone, uh, in L2, three in, on the kidney, but no uh, bowel. Uh, and the, the way we see this is that anatomy is important to understand and to be able to know that we have the risk avoiding the risk. Another thing is, Neil, uh, you are right that the EMG is not a, a, a good guidance uh, to avoid neurological complications. Uh, we have to learn uh, how to avoid these things to happen. And this happened, uh, I agree, uh, in different percentage in lateral procedures. What's the best way to avoid this? Knowing where the nerve is, but not only where the nerve is, but what happens to the nerve during the procedure. If you take uh, in the beginning, we would say that, oh, you cannot stay inside the psoas more than 20 minutes. Uh, we learn now that is not really correct. Uh, the best way is to measure uh, the saphenous uh, SICPs that we are doing now. Uh, and the saphenous SICPs uh, is 100% sensitive by the studies from, from Tomé in Spokane. Uh, and allows us to, during the procedure, measure the health of the femoral nerve. And frequently what has happened is that during the procedure, you look to the wave, the wave comes down, you close the retractor, wait some minutes and reopen the retractor and continue the procedure. So this has been very, very important, has to, has, repeatedly happen uh, and has avoiding uh, the neurological complications. Anyway, I think that the only reason I moved from lateral that we developed 20 years ago to prone is because it's better surgery. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luis. Uh, great talk. And um, it, it's interesting to get your perspective because you, you basically introduced us to the classic lateral transoas surgery and now you're introducing us to a new technique. And um, I, I've uh, done some cases and I, I think uh, for certain patients, it, it's, it's a wonderful option uh, to be single position, uh, just get, uh, particularly revision cases at the adjacent level. Um, you know, uh, one thing you didn't talk about was uh, uh, perhaps uh, positioning a patient on a specific type of bed, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, do you think that's important or not? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's not simply position the patient in prone uh, because going lateral, you have to take the crest out of four or five. And I always say that if you are not able to do a good four or five, you are not a good lateral surgeon. So if you use lateral only for two or three levels, uh, uh, superior levels, you are not a lateral surgeon. Uh, it's the, we have a specific positioner that holds the patient uh, in the thoracic and in the pelvis, and we do coronal rotation with that. And this takes the, the crest out and also makes the patient super rigid. It's very, very important to have your, your retractor rigid because in the prone position, we fight gravity uh, and having a light two-blade retractor with the strong positioner that keeps the patient immovable in the table is key for the procedure. Yeah, and, and gravity is a big issue too. So, uh, you know, a, a retractor um, specifically um, designed for that. Uh, and that's been my experience. I've adopted uh, a traditional lateral retractor and sometimes it's just not optimized for it. So I, I, I think that's a point as well with newer techniques. Uh, uh, you need appropriate equipment. Uh, yeah. 
And uh, we've talked about that before. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't, I, I think we're gonna have a prone uh, demonstration, so we'll be able to see that. Um, any questions at all? Because we're still a little bit behind. Oh, uh, Timur? Uh, for the sake of time, sorry. Uh, Dr. Pimenta, thank you again so much. Uh, such a pleasure being on the same forum with you here. Can you please, I guess, with your, uh, from where you are, give us your opinion on this? There's like an emerging talks now about prone retrosoas approaches, which is, of course, we already have a history with that and we know it's dangerous and, you know, but still people want to push for that. Give us your point of view on that approach, please. Yeah, uh, I always say that how I debate uh, anterior psoas versus trans psoas, uh, I respect a lot, uh, new enough, of course. Uh, but uh, he keeps saying that, oh, I look to the vessels, I, I measure the distance from vessels to the psoas. And I always say that when you have a neighbor, uh, one day you visit this neighbor, right? Uh, which means that if you are close to the vessels, it happens. It will happen, simply will happen. And my question is always, can you really fix this yourself or you need an approach surgeon? Probably you need an approach surgeon because you are close to the vessels. Going through the psoas muscle simply builds a wall that protects surgeons to the front, to the big vessels, bowel, ureter, uh, sympathetic uh, chain, uh, and a posterior wall of muscle that should protect you with the neural monitoring uh, against the nerve. So uh, you, you trade complications. Uh, is it having a neurological complication nice? It's not having a vessel complication. It's either uh, not a nice uh, complication. So simply said. Great, thank you, Dr. Pimenta. So uh, we're gonna move on to Victor Chang, who's gonna talk us uh, through MIS T-lift. Now this is not a newer technique, but I, uh, there's always nuances and pearls that could be obtained to just make it a more effective technique. And so v Victor's gonna give us his, his, uh, his opinion on this. All right, thank you for having me, uh, Paul. Um, hopefully this works. Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about MIST lift. So like Paul said, um, it's not a sexy technique. Um, and then, you know, in full disclosure, I actually did a prone lateral yesterday in an MIST lift. So um, I'm not just a MIST lift person. So what we'll discuss are surgical pearls, uh, as well as the limitations of the MIST lift. Um, now, just um, a background in the technique, uh, what we're looking at is the approach uh, through the foramen to do deliver an antibody fusion. Uh, but in reality, I like to say that this should be called a, the transcambin triangle lumbar interbody fusion. And really the, the key component of uh, refining your T-lift technique is to really understand Camden's triangle and, and how you can access the disc space. Um, here's a, a great paper that uh, was published in JNS Spine uh, by uh, Mike Wang and Tumi Allen and Andrew Fanus. Um, and they, they described in detail the relevant anatomy of the tri uh, Camden's triangle uh, for T-lift. Um, so if you've been to any sort of MIST lift course, uh, you typically think of the triangle with the three borders, the medial border being the traversing root or the lateral thecal sac, the lateral border being the exiting nerve root, and the inferior border being the superior end plate uh, of the vertebral body below. Uh, but when you look at Kamen's original paper when he described this corridor, there's a fourth surface here, which is actually the superior articular, uh, articular process uh, of the facet. And, uh, you know, in, in most T-lift uh, techniques, uh, the, the SAP is gone uh, as part of your removal. So, um, you know, understanding the relationship of uh, the, this fourth uh, surface, um, you know, you, you, it becomes more of, instead of a three uh, two-dimensional uh, corridor, it becomes a three-dimensional corridor. And so when we think of the traditional MIS T-lift, uh, this involves an extended uh, removal of the SAP uh, some removal of the IAP, and then maybe the lamina and pars. And here you can get a great direct decompression, the exiting nerve root, as well as the thecal sac. Um, there are some variations where you're 
that exist where you can leave the laminar and pars intact. And um, uh, also uh, this is relevant for when you're talking about doing endoscopic T-lift as well. But this is the, the traditional MIS T-lift that uh, most people tend to think about. So as far as for uh, versatility, um, you know, it, it, for a lot of surgeons still, uh, even though it's an older technique, it's the default MIS approach. Uh, the reason being there's few contraindications. It's really a war coaster approach for most degenerative uh, pathologies. Uh, I also like to call it the original single position surgery. Um, and, you know, um, you're going to hear a lot of um, great uh, technique talks about other approaches, but uh, which, you know, I tend to utilize when, when relevant, but um, there are still some cases where uh, the T-lift is actually a preferred approach uh, as opposed to say an A-lift or a lateral or, or um, anti-SOS approach. Uh, a couple of examples that, uh, and these are all relative, I guess, uh, you know, L5-S1 A-lift for, for male patients, especially younger male patients, um, uh, you know, the risk of retrograde ejaculation after surgery. Um, and also in certain uh, instances with the L4-5 with a, either a high iliac crest, the transitional anatomy that was alluded to earlier, um, and where the, the plexus is basically pulled anterior. So, you know, these are still cases where, um, you know, even if uh, it, it might be useful to be, to be proficient at a TILA. Um, so here's a, a case from uh, my practice. So a uh, 60-year-old female who had a prior L3-5 to uh, laminectomy had new onset of symptoms. Um, she actually progressed in the degree of spondylolisthesis and spondylosis, um, failed some conservative management. Uh, and so this is a case that uh, we addressed with the TLIF. So, um, you know, at least for me and my hands, um, the, the axial view here, you can see how the psoas is pulled anterior. So this is one where I'm reluctant to do a lateral approach, uh, even though it'd be nice because you're, you, you know, you don't have to go through the previous incision. Uh, but, you know, with the, uh, how lateral you approach the T-lift, uh, even if someone's had a midline laminectomy, uh, you can avoid the scar and you're really working through virgin territory. So you don't have to deal with some of the epidural scarring, uh, to access the disc. Uh, and then here's the, the radiographic result, uh, in the end. So again, maybe, uh, not as sexy of a picture as you'll see from the other, uh, my esteemed, uh, co-faculty here. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the patient did well. It's still a minimally invasive approach. You know, that will go home the day, next day after surgery. Uh, maybe you can do this in a surgery center and a select, select patients. Um, and the end result is a uh, patient did well as far as for her, um, you know, original complaints and her symptoms. Um, so as far as how we can improve the, the T-lift technique. So th these are the pearls that I would offer. Uh, one is to consider a limited removal of the SAP. Um, so we've seen a lot of success from direct de decompressions with the laterals and things like that. And you can actually achieve the same effect with a T-lift. So not every T-lift case needs a direct decompression. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then second, and in particular for a minimally invasive approach is incorporating expandable cages. Um, and here, what we're trying to do is maximize the inner body reconstruction through a limited uh, working channel. Uh, and then finally, um, just as an aside, uh, integrating some newer technologies such as robotics and image guidance for your pedicle screw placement. Uh, really, the idea here is to streamline the other aspects of the procedure um, so that you can focus most of your attention on your T-lift. Um, so if, if you have things where the um, uh, techniques where the, the screw placement becomes, uh, you know, you know, relatively trivial, then uh, you can focus on uh, just one specific part of the technique and that can help with uh, your workflow. Um, here's a paper, technique paper. This is from Operative Neurosurgery. Uh, this is actually a two-part paper uh, by uh, Zach Ray uh, out of WashU, and he described a limited trans-facet uh, inter uh, MIS T-lift. Um, so this is something that, uh, that I do similar, but the idea here is that you, you have a limited removal of the IAP and you remove just enough SAP to have a working channel for your cage. Um, so obviously this is a little bit more of an advanced technique uh, and you can see here on the figure um, on the panel A, you can see where the traversing route would be. You can see the working corridors, the rectangle. So basically to fit the dimensions of your cage uh, and you're, you're still preserving some of the bony anatomy with the IAP and the SAP. Um, so the nerve roots are protected by the bony anatomy. And really, um, you know, these are ideally suited for those cases where you don't need direct decompression. Um, and you, you can just, uh, you know, for instance, with the spondylus thesis, where you just need to reduce the spondy, uh, provide a little bit of inner body reconstruction, and then that's all the patient really needs. Um, 
uh, as an added thing, if, if, uh, if you've become facile at this technique, uh, in the cases where you do a direct decompression, um, you can actually take this approach first, do all of your inner body work, place your cage. Because when you think about what's really, uh, what, why do people not like MIST lifts? Uh, because they don't like the nerve root hanging there. They don't like having to put instruments in and out of the disc space. So if you can uh, utilize a limited technique like this where your neuro, uh, uh, relevant neural anatomy is protected, uh, put your cage in, put all your dangerous instruments in, be done with that part, and then go back and then do your direct decompression. That's, uh, I, I feel like that's a safer way to go, and you probably minimize your risk of uh, derotomies and things like that and, and uh, nerve root injury. Um, so the second point, talking about uh, incorporating expandable cages, um, so there's, uh, I would say there's two sub variations. There's the bulleted cages. So this is the familiar uh, kind of approach that um, pretty much everyone's familiar with. Um, and these have gone through several design iterations uh, over the years. And uh, a lot of modern designs, they, they go on fairly low profile and they'll, they'll die and, and they'll have uh, uh, lordosis that you can increase up to 20 degrees in certain, some designs. Um, most of these have some sort of option to backfill the cage. So, uh, so once you've expanded the cage from a collapsed position, you can put graft in, uh, afterward. Uh, and then the advantage of this, uh, type of design is, is fairly straightforward. You just take advantage of your, uh, trajectory where you're aiming across the midline to place your disc, um, more or less in the disc space. Um, disadvantage here is that you have a higher potential of subsidence. Uh, part of that is probably because, you know, where you're putting the cage is along uh, the channel of your disc prep. So if you're using paddle shavers and things like that, uh, despite being careful, um, like, like most of us are, uh, you can still get some bony violations and that might get exacerbated when you expand the cage uh, uh, after you insert it. Um, and then as far as for other uh, expandable designs, banana cages here. Um, so these include an articulating mechanism uh, that allow you to place the cage anteriorly along the popliteal ring. Uh, so you can take advantage of some of the denser uh, bone uh, along the end plate. Um, again, you also have options to backfill the cage after full, expan uh, full expansion. Uh, and then since the, the cage is placed relatively anteriorly, if uh, the anatomy allows and you have significant uh, or sufficient anterior to posterior uh, spacing, you can actually stuff a lot of graft behind your cage. Um, and then that's a great, um, that's a great uh, area where you can get some good arthrodesis. Uh, the other advantage is that since you're turning these cages, you can have a longer footprint. Uh, so something like this, you can come into up to a 36 millimeter footprint, uh, which, uh, you know, compared to a traditional T lift cage, uh, you know, you're not quite in lateral cage uh, territory, but you're getting closer. Uh, the disadvantage of this is there's an additional learning curve. So, there's more disc prep involved. There's a little bit of nuance in terms of maneuvering this uh, because essentially you're, you're relying on the anterior annulus uh, to be intact, to be able to slide uh, the banana cage to, to orient it. But uh, I think in a lot of cases, once you take the time to um, become facile at this technique, it's a, it's a fairly powerful thing that you can have in your arsenal. And again, uh, part two of, uh, of Dr. Ray's paper, they looked at their experience using this particular cage. And um, here you had uh, about 68 cases uh, where you saw on average radio, uh, with this radiographic outcome, seven millimeters of increased disc height, which is pretty good for a T-lift, uh, 2.8 millimeters of increased foraminal height. So the direct uh, decompression that we uh, talked about earlier. Uh, and he got almost seven degrees of segmental lordosis, which is fairly significant. If you look at some of the traditional T-lift, especially MIS T-lift data, uh, you know, traditional MIST lift is actually a kyphosing procedure. So the fact that he was able to get, um, you know, over six degrees segmentally was, was fairly significant. Um, uh, he did observe some subsidence. Um, it wasn't clear if, uh, there, I think there were a few cases in this where they had to go back and reoperate. So uh, like any technique, there, there are some drawbacks. So, uh, you know, as Dr. Pimenta uh, pointed out, sometimes you're trading complications in, in these different techniques. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, uh, you can also use MIT, uh, MIST lift for uh, deformity as well if you're trying to do uh, uh, mini open or less, less uh, invasive deformity. So uh, Mike Wang published this paper back in 2013 uh, describing uh, a, a mini open technique for improved sagittal balance with uh, uh, what was a mini open uh, T lift technique. Um, so what he does, uh, or what he described in this paper was uh, basically just exposing 
have uh, unilaterally uh, multiple facets. So if you're going to do three or four inner bodies, you would just expose on the one side. And then you do your facetectomies, uh, and then you access your disc space, and you're able to place a lot of cages. Uh, and then the rest of the screws you can place percutaneously, um, you know, either through um, separate stab incisions, or if you want to do a midline incision and go above the fascia, that's what I tend to do, uh, as well as Mike. Um, you know, there's some options there. And so uh, the approach here, um, you know, th this is a case where, you know, I, I think, you know, probably a mild uh, deformity for most folks here, um, where you can see this is primarily degenerative deformity. Um, she's got a fractional curve there on the left. Uh, so to approach this, uh, typically you would approach from the concavity of your fractional curve as far as for where you're gonna approach your T-lifts from. Uh, and then she does have some sagittal imbalance here. She has both pelvic, uh, uh, pelvic lumbar mismatch as well as um, positive sagittal balance. Um, and then this is the result maybe two years afterwards. So you can see, uh, I use the banana cages, uh, again, coming from the left side to correct that fractional curve. Uh, and then you use uh, the screws that basically correct coronally as well. Uh, probably nowadays, uh, I would do a little kickstand as well uh, on the left side just to, to get that uh, coronal balance just right. But Again, you know, this is, you know, for a lot of people, this is your, your entryway into um, some of the MIS deformity that, that uh, we all strive for. Uh, and then also for, uh, you know, we've done this in thoracic cases as well. So here's an example of a 42 year old male. Uh, he had uh, back pain, but also was developing some uh, thoracic myelopathy. Uh, the MRI here, he shows that he's got a disc herniation. It's uh, more towards the right side. And on the sagittal MRI, um, he's got a little bit of a uh, listhesis. I uh, apologize. He, he also had an x-ray that showed this a little bit more. Um, so, I, you know, I wasn't comfortable with just doing a, a discectomy um, on him. Uh, I felt that he, he might, he probably needed some additional stabilization. And so this is a case where I did a thoracic uh, transfernal inner body fusion. You basically utilize in the same corridor, you're going lateral to the fecal sac. So there's no, uh, no worry about uh, retracting the cord here. Um, and here I just use this uh, straightforward bulleted cage uh, to get the, the, the inner body reconstruction. And you can see in the post-op films, um, this is about a, uh, two years out now that, that, that the spinal thesis is reduced there. And, and, and neuro, uh, neurologically he improved back to normal. So I'd like to close with some limitations of the MIST lift. Um, so, uh, you, know, the, you know, despite the advances in technology, our cage footprint is still limited by the transfrontal corridor, and there's really um, not a whole lot we can get around that. So, um, you know, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Nan alluded to, if you're looking for a lot of sagittal uh, correction, especially at L5S1, uh, your A-lift is still your best bet. Uh, and then the segmental sagittal correction is somewhat limited through a true MIS lift approach. Uh, now, you can also take advantage of some posterior osteotomies where uh, you basically use your cage as a fulcrum, uh, but then, uh, you know, the, these techniques become less minimally invasive. Uh, and, and it's applicable in the majority of degenerative pathologies, but there are a few situations that are best avoided. So morbidly obese patients, you know, I practice in Michigan. So someone shows up with that MRI, but then you see uh, just scrolling through their films. This is a scout from an abdominal CT. Um, you know, she had a BMI over 50. Uh, but we're still able to get it done. So it's not something I recommend to do on a daily basis, but I, and I think, you know, any approach here is going to be difficult. So, you know, for me, I kind of stick with my default just to, to get the case done here. Uh, other situations to avoid uh, severe disc collapse, it's doable, but the osteotomy may be necessary. Um, for someone who's not so facile uh, at doing MIST lift, uh, you know, you might look to other approaches. Uh, this particular patient actually had unfavorable psoas anatomy, so I was forced to do an MIST lift. Uh, and then doing a dome osteotomy through a tube, uh, um, you know, it's definitely more, a little bit more of an advanced technique. Uh, and then there's some cases where you have severe coronal deformity where cam and strain is essentially obliterated uh, and you don't really have a safe approach. Uh, the nerve, the your exiting nerve root is draped over the disc. So that's not, uh, that's not a case where you would do a T-lift. Uh, so in summary, you know, understanding Kamen's prism, I think that's the key to the mastering the technique. Uh, there's a wide range of applications for most pathologies with the MIS T-lift. And really there's few, if any, relative contraindications to the MIS T-lift approach. Um, so I, I would argue it's still a great uh, tool to have in your bag um, as an MIS surgeon. Uh, thank you for your attention.
Great, Vic. Uh, that was a, a great talk, and the MIST lift. True, uh, real workhorse uh, for neurosurgery uh, and orthopedic spine surgery as well. Um, you know, I, I, I think, it, as you said, be applied to almost any degenerative condition, actually. And there's so many variations on the theme. And uh, you point out Zach Ray's uh, variation, and that's just one of many. And I, I think it's one interesting viewpoint because he's minimizing. Uh, the bony resection, and he de is dependent on uh, expandable case technology because he's really going for indirect decompression everywhere, and not so much direct decompression. And uh, um, I, I think that goes to where you know uh, surgeons are applying technology to solve a problem, not not you know the increased bony work required versus an a lift, uh, but also the segmental issues. I, I, what, what do you think uh, with expandable cage technology? And you you touched upon this where it may improve uh, your segmental uh, correction more than you know static cages. Yeah, well, I think at least for the Cajun Zach's paper, part of it is also the banana design. Um, you know, since you increase floor doses, uh, but also in the other cases where, um, you know, you, you have a cage that will go in parallel, but then you can expand it up to like 15 or 20 degrees. So. Um, you know, I just think that this is one area where the technology has definitely added uh, added some weapons in our arsenal to to address things. So, um, you know, maybe that you know, if you're doing a bunch of laterals and you don't want to do an A lift, that that L five S one T lift isn't doesn't look so bad. Um, so we, we keep Dr. Anand happy. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, um, any uh, questions at all? Because I, I think. Uh, uh, Neil Nan is actually going to give a demonstration on tubular T lifts, which is ironic, actually, because he's such a component <laughs> of anterior surgery. But, uh, you know, to be an MIS surgeon, you have to be facile with multiple techniques, and I, I think we're going to highlight that. Obviously, you gave a talk uh, on T lifts, but I know you do a lot of lateral and A lifts, and uh, I think uh, in this day and age, a spine surgeon needs to be able to do every procedure and, you know, fit the uh, technique to the patient. Um, so, um, is uh, Neil ready at all? Yep. Because we could transition to the cadaver okay. lab at this point. Can you guys hear me? No. Nope. Oh, there we go. Hey, all hey, right. Neil. You guys can hear me? I don't think we have the audio yet. Are we yes, on? We yep, we can hear you. Oh, good. Well, good morning I'm talking from about Seattle Neil. and uh, Seattle, the Seattle Science Foundation Lab. My favorite lab indeed. And I'm here with... Uh, Dr. Robinson, Jerry Robinson, a budding prospect for spine surgery the years to come. Anyway, so what we did quickly to save time was Jerry already did Jamshidi needles and cantilated the pedicles, guide wires are in place here already. And usually that's what I would do. I'd mark the pedicles, lateral border, this, in this case is three, four, connect the dots, that's my incision, both sides. I actually make the incision, cut the fascia, field into muscular plane and then we'll do my jam CD needles cantilate the pedicles put the wires in so the wires are already in so at this point we'll take our tubes you go straight down on ap straight to the parts i can feel the parts right there which i know is going to be right between these two pedicles right you just drop your drop your cannulas down basically dilating right down neil uh, yep. you're not going to use fluoroscopy here you're just kind of i know you're an experienced surgeon but uh, for I, some of our i use the fluoroscopy to put the Obviously, jam CD needles and the guide wires. Once the guide wires are done, no. I'll move to lateral now, and a lateral fluoroscopy. I'll confirm that I'm deep enough with my with my uh, tube. So now I'll get a lateral. Yeah, but to drop the tube, I don't because the wires tell me the the AP plane where the pars is, and I'm heading straight to the pars. So, but you're, you're palpating it, so you're comfortable just based on your knowledge of anatomy. I mean, do you put your finger down at all? Because, you know, when I trained, it, it was always that you should, you know, you can't see the anatomy for MIS, and so you, right. know, you need to replace your eyes with something that tends to be fluoroscopy, just, just to be absolutely safe here. I think putting the wires in helped me a lot. When I first started, I did do an AP, and I would guide it to the bars <laughs> and things like that. But once I got the wires and did, did, did this way, it sort of gave me a lot of comfort to know where the bars is. So at this point, we just want to confirm my tube is deep enough on a lateral image. So we'll just take a quick lateral. So I know I'm right there. We'll focus that a little bit. 
I may drop your machine down, maybe. Oh, the table's got to go down. Can table go down? Oh, up. There you go. And there you go. I think that's three, four. I like where I am. I'm just about the facet with my tube. I can direct it down a little bit, maybe. Give me another shot there. And at this point, we can just fix it. We can go ahead and fix the tube, which is already down there. So at this point, I connect the tube. The tube's ready to go. Most tubes have the same system. The tube connects to a fixed arm. The arm keeps it down. I purposely actually wanted a little more medial. Yeah, let's fix it. So I'm looking across and into the other side, right? So at this point, my tube's already down. This is a fixed tube. So my tube's fixed. I don't need to take all the other tubes out. And we yeah, should be ready to go. What, what is your viewpoint on fixed versus expandables here? I mean, I, I personally am biased. I think a fix is, is enough and it just makes the tissues a bit more, but what's, what's your opinion? I actually, I, I think when you start off, it's much better to have a little expandable retractor. It just gives you that comfort to know where you are. Today, I'm comfortable either way, mm -hmm. but I always tell people you're starting off, take an expandable retractor. I think it just gives you that comfort to know you can open a little bit more in case you're, you're stuck or constrained. So I always tell, and I teach this, honestly, this is one of my favorite operations. A lot of people don't know T lift is still my favorite operation to this day. And to this day, single level, I still do a T lift. I do not do laterals. Okay. I do laterals or multi level, three or more. And so that's again is something pretty important. So at this stage, I don't know how much we can see. I'm going to try to get the busy on camera. Oh, yeah. Because usually at this stage, all you see is muscle. There still is a thin layer of muscle that always sits over the bone. But usually at this point, I localize the facet. To give me another x ray there. Oh, please. Yeah. So that x-ray tells me I'm on the facet there anatomically, I can feel it. So now what I want to do is denude the muscle at that point. Do you want to extend it on this? A longer Actually, one? Neil, we got a decent picture down the tube. Yeah, try down the tube if you can. Yeah. We got this visio on camera mm -hmm. and see if we can see down this tube. That's what makes it hard. Yeah, that's there great. You. So all you see is muscle there, right? My suction is on the facet. That's the facet right there. Right, so Neil, you uh, mentioned earlier that you, you wanted a bit more medial. I, I personally um, uh, think that's a good idea just because you want to orient yourself by finding a canal, but you know, if you're too medial, you're gonna cross the midline inadvertently and your cage may be off, off midline. I mean, oh, no, you... absolutely. So I just do a little, I, I, I won't do anything to identify the pars, the lateral wall of the facet and the facet. So I won't change that to do any intra-canal work till I'm there. So at this point, literally, the whole game is to take away that layer of muscle that's sitting on top of the facet. I can feel the facet right down there. Do we have light? Where's the light that goes down the tube? Yeah. We should get the light that goes down the tube. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be because cool. you normally attach the light there. That's so all I'm doing right now, just taking the, the thin layer of muscle that sits invariably so, right over the facet you know like everything is pros and cons i feel like with an expandable retractor you can get a little bit more muscle creep whereas with a fixed tube it limits that to a certain extent yes that's true i, I mean i think a fixed retractor is is probably the best at the end of the day but i always when you start off i always tell people you're probably better off using an expandable retractor and then usually circumferentially i will i will cut the muscle i don't know how much you guys can see but I literally circumferentially will cut it. And actually, in effect, all you're cutting is the underside of the multiferous and a bit of the longismus. And it is the underside. So sometimes it looks like, oh my God, we're cutting so much muscle. But honestly, it's very it's little in, it's in, in, the, in the whole scheme of things. Right. Yeah. And this isn't looked at. I mean, you get a post-op MR after one of these and you don't, you hardly see any injury to the muscles. You're using a muscle splitting approach and then just taking a little bit right of, of the muscle just to run the, the other thing out. the other thing i always tell people always bovi before you use a pituitary to grab muscle i mean it's very tempting to go there and grab this muscle and pull on it the last thing you need is to get the pars segmental and that retracts on you and there'll be just a mess of blood in there so that's one thing uh, i caution everybody avoid that don't do that till you actually have bovied any single thing you're going to pluck when you will pull that and you don't want to get that pars breeder. So anyway, here's the facet. We'll quickly see that there. We should be able to see it. I see Dr. Nanan, on the same note, I have Here's facet, here's you... superior facet. Oh, at, at this point, right, there's something what I always call relational anatomy. I know that is the superior facet there based on the anatomy, right? 
I don't know how much you guys can see. Yeah, so, so Dr. Nan, I got another question. So for the, uh, so for the, in the same note. So your please... superior facet lateral border, right? Right, your superior facet lateral border. Relational anatomy is you have to know where the inferior facet is, which is right there. I can feel it. You know it's medial to it, just there. And then you got to know where the pars is. The pars would be just north of the inferior facet. I can feel it. I can feel it with my bovie. So I know my pars is there, which means I have to wand my tube even more medial. So if all the answers your question, I won't do it till I feel the pars. Uh, so Once I feel it, I will. So Dr. Nan, another question. Have you used uh, any of the pedicle-based retractor it. systems? And how do you compare those in your hands to tube? Sorry, say that again. Oh, I couldn't hear you. Pedicle-based retractor, so like the one that Dr. Pham had earlier, where instead of a tube, it's a pedicle-based retractor. Um, have you, do you have any thoughts about that versus using a tube? You know, personally, I'm not a big fan of pedicle-based retractors or pedicle screw-based retractors. For the simple reason, I always have believed that the screw, once it goes in, is the best screw you put in, has the best purchase you put in. I don't like torquing on it. And so I'd rather not do that. So the answer is, so I don't do that. So I know it's become popular, so that's just my personal choice. I don't like playing with the screw. And so there you go. So that's inferior facet right there. Your superior facet. Here's the lateral border of the superior facet. I'm staring at the pause right now. I don't know how much you guys can see. Here's the pause, right? I expose the pause. Once your pause is exposed, I'm ready to start the procedure, right? This is all I need to see. I don't need to see more than this. So at this point, I literally would take down. So I don't know if you guys can see. Here's the pause, right? All that's pause. That's inferior facet right there. We can take an x-ray right now and see. That would be at the bottom of the pause, x-ray. So there you can see I'm right at the bottom of the pause. That's exactly where I do my osteotomy. I don't do it in the middle of the pars. Don't go high on the pars. Well, the nerve is right below the pedicle. So I'll go low on the pars. So I'm very safe with my osteotome. As it goes down, right, to take that facet down. And really, I take that facet with an osteotome. It'll pop right out. So Neil, this is a cadaver, but live, do you use an osteotome or a drill? Or, or a you can use a drill too, hole. sure. I, I, I'm nothing against either way. So the first cut is usually the horizontal vertical cut. The next one is the is the horizontal cut that goes just medial to the facet to pop that edge down. Give me a pituitary. It just pops right out. That takes out the inferior facet. I don't know if you guys can see it on the other no, camera. The whole facet's completely out. We had a good view of that. That, that looked All right, so easy. Usually that pops out like just like this one shot. Where's the suction going? Oh, uh, right. oh, there you go. So I'm looking literally at the, here's, here's my superior facet. I'm looking right down. So here's the parts again. Yeah. Superior facet again. I'm already looking at the surface of the superior facet and into the into the ligamentum flower, which I can see that. Now I take a drill at this point and widen that transforaminal area, which I'm looking at dead on. So I usually take a drill. We got a pedal. Me one. Yep. Go for it. Usually right now I just widen this down and I go straight to the to the foramen. If you load down, there is nothing there. You can go straight to the foramen and feel it. And that's why it's good to be low in the, on the pars to go right down to feel that. Yeah, so orientation-wise for the audience, it's upside down, actually. So cranial is... Uh, so I'm already in the foramen. I can feel it. Give me a pituitary again. Then we got a small curette. So that's, too, that's, that's too big. Let's yeah, just take a small curette. We're good. At this point, you want to feel the canal, feel the pedicle, feel the medial wall. Stay lateral to the canal at all times. So, Neil, can Once you point to uh, medial and lateral just for the orientation? Oh, okay. Um, medial is, is there. Okay. Wait, there is medial. Okay. This is lateral this side. Uh -huh. uh, on the camera, I don't know how well that's showing. Okay. This is cranial uh -huh. and that's caudal. Right. So, here's the pars. 
I can see the ligamentum flavum right here. So do we have a, like a dental tool or a small curette or something? Just so I can take the ligament. I can see the ligament right here. A thick ligament staring at me. So pretty much I should be able to take that. Okay, got a kerosene? I'll, I'll take a kerosene, a small kerosene. Here we go. We'll make it work. Usually I'll take a, like I said, always feel your pedicle before you take anything out. There you go. That's a thick ligament there. The other thing is usually I'm doing this under a scope. I always do my tea leaf under a microscope. I think the visualization is fantastic. You're able to see everything all the way down. Now I'm in that lateral recess there. Take that lateral recess all the way back to the pedicle. I'm hugging the pedicle. I want to see the pedicle and take it all the way down. So again, what that does is takes you away from the nerve on the top. I don't want to see the nerve. I don't like seeing things I don't need to see, and I want to stay away from it and trust anatomy, which you studied before, right? So the nerve is there, leave it alone. It, that's not causing any problem. You can see the dural sac now, I think you guys can see it. There it is. That blue thing is all the dural sac there. At this point, if I have thick ligament, I'll do across over the top, the unilateral bilateral decompression. I'll get that done at the same time. I usually will take all the ligament out and do my decompression before I start any intradiscal work. So this is all done here. So basically we've taken it all, I can see, you guys see the dural sac, it's right there. No, we have a beautiful picture of it. Um, so Neil, three, four, you're gonna have to take most of that superior. Well, okay, okay, okay. So that's all, this, this patient doesn't need a lot. So you don't need a lot, I won't take the ligament. Just take what you need. Mm -hmm. To me, it's all about what the patient has what I'm trying to do. If he needs a decompression, he gets a decompression. If he needs bilateral decompression, he gets bilateral decompression. So, you know, take care of that first. Make sure the foramen's free. Here's the foramen right there, right? Mm -hmm. You have a little a dental tool or something? Something. Like so, Neil, what, what if you get a durotomy here? What, what do you tend to do in these tubular cases? The durotomy, I'll repair it. I'll, I'll get him there and actually repair it under the scope. Okay. If I get one, for sure, if I get in the lateral border right there, I usually am repairing it and I'll repair it before I do any interbody work. So it happens at this point, I'll do it, but I'm trying to stay really lateral. I don't go, I don't retract anything. Now the scope is, this is where the scope comes very useful. You're able to see the, the disc, which is usually sitting right there. At this point, I find a dental tool extremely useful. But I'll pass the dental or a Woodson down the foramen and medial to it. Do we have like a penfield, a small penfield at all? I'll use this as a penfield, that's a curette. You can just move that over. There we go. The dual sac is right there. There's a wood or a, there's a pin. Or a there we go. Septal. Take this down here. At this point, I'm usually tilting the table, tilting the patient over to the other side, so I can look across and get get underneath here at the disc which is right in this corner. I don't know how much you guys can see. Without a scope, it's really hard. You have a small, a pituitary small one? This is huge. Um, we've had huge. some good visualization. Oh, I'll just take a knife, but inside, get into the disc. Not currently right now, if you get yeah. repositioned. You got a knife? Like side. any knife. You got a knife over? There you go. Knife. There you go. <laughs> take a knife. <laughs> no. yep. Knife. So usually I'm using my, my, my sucker as my retractor in many ways. This is a huge knife, but anyway, we'll, we'll do it. We'll get into the disc here. <laughs> there we go. Awesome, even better. All right. Give me an x-ray right there. Only because I can't see, so I'm gonna take an x-ray. So I know I'm pretty much at the disc there. So, there you go. X-ray there. Bingo, all right. So do we have, um, like a small osteotome, I'll take it. Again, under the scope, I can usually see it, so it's a pretty big osteotome, but I'll manage, we'll get in there. There you go, I should be in the disc now. Next way there. Yep. 
I'm usually doing this maneuver under x-ray to make sure that I'm actually in the disk space, right? And there, x-ray, that's it. So once I've got in there, I'm just dilating it. You turn it, you dilate that, get your rasp. You wanna suction again, there you go. You know, give me the give me a curette or a rasp. Give the rasp, I can dig a rasp. Let's take a drill here. So again, now I'll take down a bit of the superior facet here. Is your drill? Yep. Yeah, typically you have to remove the upper portion of that. I actually rarely so, take that upper portion. Go for it. Hmm. I'll just take this part here, so it's not in my way. Mm -hmm of the superior facet. So an angle to go down. So I know some people take away the superior facet completely. I actually don't because I like my screw to rest on it. Hit it again. Again, I, I think all surgeons have their own little variation. Yep. So, so Neil, are you a comp uh, proponent for expandable cages here or do you still use static cages? I use pretty much a, a banana cage, non-expandable, so I can get a cantilever tea lift, which we kind of published a long time ago, like 2005. So you get really good lot of doses as best as you can. Uh, I'll take the Erasmus. So I'm usually using a banana cage. And um, oh, that's an interesting rasp. OK. So there's a curve to this rasp here, but we're going to make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see how this works. X-ray there, please. I have a straight rasp. Yeah, you just have a straight rasp. I'm not liking this. Yeah, nice straight rasp. There you go. So I, I think it's very important during your disk space work not to ruin the end plate. So getting getting fluoroscopy pretty good at the beginning is extremely important. Oh, absolutely. I you blow the end plate. X-ray there. Yeah, there's no question. You you really blow the end plate otherwise. And there, it, it's very easy to do that. And there. There you go. So what what do you use for biologics, if anything? Is it local autographed or yet anything to that? I, I usually use like three milligrams, two milligrams of BMP and okay. DBM. That's been my standard always. BMP works, but I uh, do you have the how about your payers? Are they are they allowing that? What's that? Say that again? Uh, do your insurance companies allow BMP usage here? Or? We've had no problem so far. I've not had any pushback on it. And I think the fusion rates have been really happy with the liquid pituitary. So, so far, no. Narrow, yeah, these are big, the, yeah, just a regular one. They're pretty big. You got a smaller one? That's a uh, really small opening. No question so, BMP works. It's just go ahead. these days, sometimes it's just hard to getting it reimbursed. All right, take the rasp again. or will wash it to him again. You got dilators? I'm going to use this as my dilator. So after your key lift, do you actually try to get a posterior fusion, Neil, or do you just... Do you I don't. I, I, you know, I used to, maybe 15 years ago, do the contralateral fusion. I've actually totally stopped that in the last 10 years. All I do is just the interbody, and that's it, and screws. I do not even fuse the contralateral side anymore. And I, and I think that is probably because of the biologics. If I didn't have the biologics or I had a smoker or something I was worried about, I probably would do the contralateral fusion. But generally, I don't. And uh, I'll just take some trials here. Here we go. Let's go. We're ready for trials here. I'm really staring at it. I got a good path here. X-ray there. Yep. And there. And there. I know you guys saw that. You, you align your sagittal angle. If I had done this, give me a shot there, and that I think you have to recognize. You're going to blow that end plate out the moment the trial goes in. I found most times the end plate gets blown in the trial. And so I always tell people to do navigation. That's the only part I have trouble with. It's very hard to get that perfect. Next way there. So you got to get this part really perfect. The end plate will blow. Next way. And then what's that angle once again? So this one, this is where I'm really careful about going right in there. And there again. And usually I like to go all the way in the front. And there. 
All right, we gotta get some disc out from the front now, but we will. I just want to open up the area. So that'll give me a little more room to do that. Give me a pituitary again, please. That's a, that's actually a good point you demonstrated. You when you, you can't get your trial in, it's probably you haven't done an adequate discectomy. Paul, what are you saying? Oh, absolutely. There's no question. I know I haven't taken out the disc in the anterior part. X-ray there. This is one another thing I always do. Always take one shot of the instrument inside to get yourself a depth perception. I certainly have been fooled in some patients who are very small and others that are big and obviously don't want to go through with the pituitary. I think we've all heard that and you don't want that and we don't want to be there, right? So once you clear as much as you can, I like to go as anterior as possible. I really like to get my device in the anterior column with a banana cage. We're not using that today, so it shouldn't matter too much. Next size up, is that? Go up. And just, just gradually dilate this. I do rely on sequential dilation. Uh, this is not really, but we will get it down there. So, okay. Once you line that up, x ray, and there, there, and there. You go. Like that. You have ease of speed. I'm just going to keep going. There you go, and that is in. There you go. Beautiful. All right, let's take that out. That is more anterior than I like it. And don't do that. <laughs> I'd probably just go up to the ALL. That's enough. We got a big window there. Actually, that's a great demonstration. I'm looking straight down. You can see the entire dural sac there. And if you notice at no point, I've retracted the dura. I don't know, for me, I'm a big proponent of not having your assistant retracting that dura. The whole idea for T lift for me is get away from cliff, right? And we all did a lot of cliffs, which I did. And the biggest issue was dural retraction. So I don't like somebody sitting there with a pen field or a dural retractor. I mean, uh, however great all assistants are, and Dr. Robinson here is phenomenal. Even he can fall asleep, right? <laughs> And then all you need is, you know, you're not you know, jet skiing on a duro here. All right, we can take the device, whatever, ready to go. Is that the device? All right. What trial was that, 11? And this, I think, is important when you place this down. You line it up so you know you're not going to get the duro right. My sucker's right there. I can see that opening, but I need to open that a little bit more. So I'm going to leave that there, take this down. I'm safe. Sometimes we can dilate one level higher. Sometimes I'll do that. Next way there. And there. Try that. I'm a little more lateral than I like it. No, actually, I'm not bad. I'm not bad. So here's a dural sac. I'm right next to it. I want to go a little more medial with this now. In there. there. I may be a little off to the other side. I think I'm all right there. Try like that. Bingo. And there. Okay. It's a good point to check your dural sac at this point. You're good. Not even touching the dura. I'm lateral to it. The other thing I use for, again, anatomical landmarks. I use x-ray mainly for alignment. I do not use x-ray for anything else, to be honest. Position, I'd rather go by anatomy. Yeah, that's probably kind of where I want it, right in the front, as much as there. So that's pretty much up there. I don't want to go anymore. That's about it. And the other thing I'll do is, how do I detach it like that? Once I've detached it, I'm actually looking down to see where the prosthesis is. Give me a pituitary here. And you want the lateral border of the prosthesis medial to the medial border of the pedicle. That anatomically is a very good landmark. Can you guys see down? I can see the prosthesis right there. Do you see it there? Down there? Okay, give me a number four pen field. It's right where I want it. Where your superior facet, your medial wall of pedicle. Yep, that'll work. Give me the number four pen field, that'll work. Oh, it's kind of short. You want something longer? We had it here. It was right here. There we go. I just want to show you that, that's all. I mean, you can take 100 x-rays, but I don't. I try to keep it down once you get used to it. There you go. So now you can see it. Can you guys see the prosthesis there? 
It's at the bottom. Yeah, no, we have a good picture of it. Right there. You see it? Yes. So I know my prosthesis is medial to the, I mean, sorry, medial to the medial wall of the pedicle. And then obviously I'm going oblique. So that's a pretty good position. And we'll see where we are. Getting a quick x-ray here. We should be done. That's it. We're not going to put the screws in. You guys have put the screws in. But I think honestly, it, it's, I'll say two things about it. I think T lift is technically demanding, but it's a fantastic operation if you can master it. It absolutely is my favorite single level procedure. Without a question, I rarely do single level laterals and screws. I'd rather do a T lift. It takes me the same time to do it. I, mean, I like it. I've been doing it for 20 years now. Uh, what else? I think people get in trouble mainly for anatomy. You have to know relational anatomy. It's a term I like a lot. You have to know where the, if you know superior facet, where the inferior facet is. You know inferior facet, you got to know where the lamina is. You know where the pars is. But you're not seeing anything. You have to know where to go without actually seeing it. That's what MI surgery is all about. And unfortunately, it is anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. You can't bumble through and figure out where you are. That'll be a really bad day. That's all I have to say. I do not try to see the nerve. I do not want to see the exiting nerve. I know it's safe on the top. I'm low down in the Cambin triangle, like we just, someone just talked about in the previous talk. So it's very rare I ex expose the nerve. Sometimes you see it, but I'm not trying to go for it. I feel it. I know it's there. Leave it alone. Don't devascularize it. Do nothing. Leave that alone. I think that, that stops radiculitis. It stops a lot of other things that if you can be slick and quick on it. Um, what else can I say? I mean, I'm happy to answer anything, but other questions. But honestly, it's a good procedure. Okay, but once you go beyond two levels, I think it gets very taxing. Three or more levels of a T lift. I, I know some are very proficient, like Mike Wong's phenomenal. I, to me, at that point, a lateral becomes far more efficient and faster, as opposed to a three level T lift. And I rely more than on indirect decompression. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yes. Great demonstration. And at this point, I'll put the screws in. I don't even compress. I used to compress before. I don't even do that today. I just put the screws in and lock it in, done. Because my discectomy and by placing it anteriorly and the prone positioning, I've got enough lordosis. Now, if I do want more, really, really want more, I'll then do an SPO, do an osteotomy, both sides, and then compress, sure. And I'll show you a case when I'm giving my talk next. That's a really good tool to get good, good lordosis with the T lift. You certainly can do that. Okay. Thanks, right. Neil. Great. Okay. Uh, we're still running just a tad bit behind, not, not yeah. horribly. Dr. Yeah. Robinson was amazing. The camera work was fantastic. Give him a good hand, guys. Yeah. No, it was, it was very good. Good man. So uh, we're going to proceed with um, going with uh, Dr. Birch from U, uh, UCSF. And uh, he's an absolute expert in deformity surgery. And he's going to be talking about uh, when to use ILAC fixation, the setting of MIS posterior uh, procedures. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to start my video, but um, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, so again, um, I'm never fails to amaze me how after two years of Zoom, it's I still can't get this to uh, work sometimes, but uh, I'm going to try and I'll share my screen. Um, and um, let me know if uh, you can see that. Looks great. Just did go into presenter mode and yeah. Good. Okay, there. Yep. All good. All right. So I, I've been tasked to uh, talk about when to use iliac fixation in the setting of MIS posterior procedures, and really the the indications for using iliac fixation. Um, I don't think are really uh, there's a difference between MIS or open procedures, and so. Um, the objectives really are to compare the techniques and indications of the S2AI screws versus iliac screws, and then describe, you know, when to place pelvic screws, and then kind of illustrate um, how the SI joint sort of um, is affected by pelvic screws, um, and you know when to think about fusing the SI joint. So, you know, why do we care? Why did pelvic fixation, you know, start off? Um, so when you look at the literature in the early 2000s and mid 2000s, these case reports and these case series came out talking about early fractures of the sacrum and pelvis following longer constructs. 
And um, it, it uh, you know, as we kind of moved into uh, performing more um, adult degenerative scoliosis stuff and longer constructs, we started getting these complications. Um, and here's an example. Um, this is a patient that came to me a long time ago, um, had a long construct. And the, you know, you can see on the, the image, um, the sagittal um, uh, or the lateral views show that the S1 screws have pulled out. But more detrimental to the patient is that the sagittal imbalance is a direct cause of the sacral fracture. So to fix this, um, I ended up having to do a, a sacral osteotomy. So this is not an easy thing to fix. Um, this patient came to me late and you know, it, was, it was a bit of a challenge to fix. So this is kind of what, you know, why pelvic fixation was, um, you know, we started to use it. From a biomechanical perspective, the, um, when you look at this, this is a nice paper by uh, Cunningham and McAfee. Uh, and what they did is they, they instrumented uh, cadavers from you know, L5 up to L1, and they looked at the uh, strain on the S S1 screws. So the strain on the S1 screws goes up as the construct becomes longer. And at L3, there's a significant difference between the reduction of uh, strain on the screws when you put in pelvic fixation, in this case, iliac screws, and also reduction of strain with um, a femoral ring allograft. This is also borne out by um, the study by Gary Fleischer, who is one of our fellows, and, and Dr. Bawachi, again, looking at iliac fixation, a lifts and, and versus pedicle screws, and significant reduction in the uh, S1 screw strain across all uh, all aspects of motion. Um, and so, you know, the indications for pelvic fixation, um, there's a few of them. So one we've already talked about, which is prevention of a sacral fracture following a long construct and reducing S1 screw strain or loosening. Um, the other indications are uh, if you have sacral pathology, so a tumor, sacral insufficiency fracture, and you wanna bypass the sacrum and essentially connect the lumbar spine to the pelvis. Uh, another one would be to anchor. Um, you can use uh, pelvic fixation for an anchor um, when you're reducing a, a high grade spondy at L5S1. And then the other um, thing is fixation of uh, satellite rods or kickstand rods. And certainly, you know, that's becoming more common. So, um, and it comes, you know, you can do this in, in different flavors. There's single, you can use dual, um, unilateral, bilateral, and, and dual fixation, both um, iliac, iliac screws and S2AI screws. So here's an example of a, um, an older gentleman. He was 78, uh, prostate cancer, had an insufficiency fracture in, in his um, sacrum there was an attempt to fix it with SI joint fusion, which didn't work. And so I bypassed again, the sacrum with a dual bilateral iliac bolts and um, you know, his pain went away significantly um, and very quickly. So although it looks like a big construct, it, it's, it was a very effective treatment. And here's an example of um, using uh, both an iliac fixation and uh, uh, iliac bolts and an S2AI screw. Again, in a patient who had, um, you know, a degenerative scoliosis, she also had a sacral insufficiency fracture. And using the, um, the those kickstand rods to balance the pelvis to the spine was um, was really instrumental here uh, in getting the patient balanced. And here's the example of using S two AI screws as an anchor um, into the pelvis um, using a, the T lift technique and uh, reducing that, um, that high-grade spondy uh, from a kyphotic angle into a, um, a lordotic angle. And, and that was very, very helpful having that, that foundation to work off of. So how do we do this? So the iliac fixation um, starts at the, the starting point is at the PSIS, and essentially you're going down the inner and the outer table. Um, I've done hundreds of these and don't use fluoroscopy for this. You can feel with the, with the all sort of the Kinsella's bone. And when you get to a, a hard point, you know you've, you've reached the cortex. Um, and it's a relatively simple uh, procedure to do. The downside is that the, these screws tend to be prominent and 
bone has to be removed. So in the setting of an MIS procedure, um, there's a little bit more work to do um, with an iliac screw. Whereas the SUEI screws, um, it's just distal to the S1 foramen, just a little bit lateral. Um, and again, your trajectory is uh, down the column, um, but you have to cross the SI joint and you're, sh and you're shooting just above the, um, um, the sciatic notch there. Uh, in, in you get really dense bone, uh, both above the sciatic notch, but also as you cross the uh, SI joint. And it's somewhat challenging because again, that palpation that you get with the all, you have to cross multiple cortices and you, um, that brings into it a level of uncertainty about where it is and requires a lot of imaging to do it safely. Um, and he, here's an example of where the start point would be in, the, in panel A and the imaging, the fluoroscopy imaging that one would use to, to do this. Um, but you can get you know, uh, great fixation with this technique. And the nice thing is that it sits below the PSIS, sits below the iliac crest and is um, non, um, you know, it's not really painful for the patient um, in contrast to the iliac fixation. Um, I, I personally don't use fluoroscopy, I use navigation and navigation makes this, um, you know, a chip shot, it, you drill it, um, you tap it and you put the screw in, but you, you know, you want the, it, it's ideal to put the screws in under power because the, the amount of insertional torque is significant. But in terms of biomechanics, if you looked at the iliac fixation versus S2AI screws, there's no real difference in the, the biomechanical um, uh, strength of either fixation. So it's kind of dealer's choice, but every good deed, you know, um, goes, uh, gets punished, I guess, in the sense that with the um, fixation, the pelvic fixation, we get an increased rod strain and you get that primarily in inflection and also in compression. Um, and so that's something that you have to be aware of that you're increasing the stiffness of the, of the, um, uh, um, of the construct. And so that's gonna translate into something and obviously translate in part onto the, onto the rods. And again, here's a good example of a case that I have where you know, the rod broke distally. Um, not saying it's entirely the, the fault of putting in the SUAI screws, but I'm sure it, it, it contributes. So how does the SI joint kind of get affected by pelvic fixation? Well, when we think of the SI joint, we think of SI joint pain, and obviously there can be degenerative pathology, inflammatory arthropathies, but also this post-surgical or this adjacent level concept of how the SI joint is affected. And, you know, in thinking of the SI joint in pelvic fixation, you know, is there a reduction of broad strain when we, if we would, uh, were to fuse it, is there a reduction of SI joint motion and would it prevent post-op pain? So here's a, a, a paper that's kind of looking at SI joint pain after lumbar fusion, and they kind of um, defined SI joint pain by uh, using anesthetic blocks. And in this paper, the incidence of SI joint pain after a, a short construct without pelvic fixation was um, you know, quite high as in the, you know, about a third of their patients. Um, and here's an example of, of what the SI joint can look like um, in a patient that has had a long fusion without pelvic fixation. You see the vacuum phenomenon in the, uh, in the SI joint. And, Fusions without pelvic fixation certainly can increase the motion at the SI joint. Um, and so, you know, you go on, the patient had uh, SI joint pain and went on to have, a, uh, have, a, have an SI joint fusion bilaterally. But what's interesting is that is this paper where they looked at their group that had um, fusions with and without pelvic fixation and the patients uh, with pelvic fixation they actually, that's the, the P um, on the graph there um, on, the, on the far right. They, they actually had a very low incidence of patients with SI joint pain with pelvic uh, fixation. So that's, I, I found that pretty interesting. And so there's this concept that pelvic fixation actually may be preventative for SI joint pain. And if you look uh, biomechanically uh, at this, um, certainly bilateral, in this paper, they use bilateral iliac screws and bilateral iliac screws had the same reduction in motion as um, six um, uh, SI joint 
um, fusion devices. So you're 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 dropping your your uh, motion uh, at the SI joint significantly by just having pelvic fixation. But the one caveat there, um, and I'm trying to highlight it with this example, is that 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 was a biomechanical study. These screws still can loosen over time, especially in somebody with an osteoporosis. So it doesn't really tell the whole story in the sense that um, the iliac fixation or the S2I screws can loosen. And, and then that may also lead to um, SI joint pain if there's, if there's motion. That's what happened in this patient. The patient ended up um, getting SI joint fusion after their S2I screws. Um, so in summary, you know, pelvic fixation is advised for longer constructs to prevent screw failure, but it does increase rod strain. Um, iliac versus S2I screws off, offer similar reduction in strain on S1 screws, so it's kind of dealer's choice. The advantage of the S2I screws is that it's lower profile, um, and that SI joint pain is common post-lumbar fusion uh, without pelvic fixation, and, you know, fusion remains kind of an option for treatment, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, so you would outright uh, do it prophylactically. Um, thank you. Great, Shane. Uh, thank you very much for that great talk. Uh, you know, quick question, and maybe you touched upon this, but maybe you could expand upon it. Is like, are are you a proponent for fusing the SI joint if you if you have to go to ilium or fixation? Uh, it looked like you had put what well, looked like bedrock there in your last example. Um, uh, because of the concern for pain uh, in the long term? No, so I'm not a, so I've thought about that and I'm not a proponent of it. I, I don't think we have enough data to really determine whether it's the right thing to do. Certainly biomechanically, if you, you know, if you use pelvic fixation and you use kind of a bedrock device, there's no biomechanical advantage of the bedrock device. So the only advantage of the bedrock device would be to say, hey, I think my, pelvic fixation is going to loosen over time. Therefore, I'm going to prophylactically fuse the SI joint so I don't get that motion at the SI joint down the road, which then can create pain. So, um, uh, so right now, no, I'm not, a, I'm not, I wouldn't advocate it yet, but I, I do think we need more information and data on that whole thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I know there's uh, currently a study ongoing, randomized prospective study, just evaluating that point specifically so it'll be interesting to see what the data is because having um I, i've done a handful of bedrock cases maybe between five and ten um and it, it's a challenge sometimes to actually get bedrock uh in you have to plan uh, uh sort of ahead in terms of where you're gonna put your s2 ais you have to modify the bed and patients pelvic anatomy certainly is an issue so it, it's not a it's not an easy um, to add a, a fusion, uh, and so it, it need to have a, a clinical benefit from it. Yeah, um, I you know I think with a lot of this stuff, um, especially the S2I screws, like navigation, um, you know, makes it so much easier. Um, and I, I'm a huge proponent of of navigation for you know with this stuff. Uh, so, Dr. Birch, on the same note, uh, do you, when you do your S2AI screws and you see the uh, SI joint there, do you arthrodesic it while you're there and put graft in it or no? No, no. I um, bypass it. Um, essentially, I think bypassing it offloads the SI joint. It prevents the increased range of motion you get if it's, you know, without the pelvic fixation. And I think that's sufficient. I don't have a lot of patients, honestly, with post post-op um, SI joint pain. Um, so. You know, it looks like um, well, Dr. Lieberman actually has a question. Just, uh, just wanted to make a comment, Shane. Great, great talk. Uh, wanted to emphasize one point. A, a general principle of orthopedics when you're fusing anything is always getting two points of fixation. So what makes us think that just putting one screw across the SI joint is going to really fuse it? It just doesn't work. And as I've evolved, yes, I do. When I do an open SI joint fusion, I do decorticate that for all my long constructs and pack the SI joint with bone and then try to get two screws across so I've been using a lot of S1 aleroiliac and S2 aleroiliac screws. 
And as Paul pointed out, the pelvic anatomy is so crowded in, in the sacral ala and the iliac wing, and, and you're looking for that teardrop notch, uh, that it's sometimes very hard to get the granite device and an S1 and an S2 screw in that little space. So you do have to be creative uh, when you're doing it. And this is where uh, I'm a big proponent of the preoperative planning. So before you even get into the operating room, you know exactly what you can fit in there and, and how you what the configuration is going to be to optimize the fixation and optimize the fusion. Yeah, Izzy, I, I, I agree. I mean, you know, as you know, the, um, the anatomy can change from one side to the other. You know, it, you might have one um, side of the patient that is uh, quite amenable to a lot of stuff. And then the other side is much more challenging to fit all that stuff in. Absolutely. So, um, Izzy, you bring up a, actually a great point, and I know we're a little bit behind, but I think it's important. It, how, how do you decorticate that side joint? I find it a bit of a challenge, and uh, this may go to you pre-operative planning, maybe using utilizing a robot or, or navigation even, because the, you know getting adequate decortication of that side joint is, is um, not easy. No, no, it's absolutely difficult work. And it's all on the basis of the exposure ahead of time. So if I'm doing this, I, I, if I'm fixing to the pelvis, I'm not doing a minimally invasive procedure here. So I do expose the SI joint. I do resect the dorsal sacroiliac joint ligaments and they are very tough, thick, tenacious ligaments. You get right down into the joint uh, and then it's a combination of curettes and a high speed burr. And I try to get down at least a centimeter depth into the joint uh, till I see some bleeding cancellous bone that, that's coming up there. And then as I proceed with the rest of the case, I will then go on and um, put some flow seal or pack some Surgicel or something into that SI joint to stem the bleeding for the rest of the case, and then come back at the end of the case and pack it filled with bone graft. Great. Um, so uh, in the interest of, of time, we'll move on. Um, uh, and uh, as they're getting the cadaver set up, uh, we're gonna change the agenda just a bit. Neil Nan is gonna give his talk on uh, preferred approaches for adult deformity, MIS, T-lift, lateral, or A-lift, while the cadaver is being set up for uh, for Rod Oscurian uh, and his uh, uh, demonstration of the pr prone transillus. So, Neil, thank you. Thanks, Paul. I actually love this topic. You all gave it to me because it kind of made me think about how I approach patients because I do all the above procedures, and it's sort of there is a decision-making at least algorithm for me as to how I approach these and why I do when I do what, right? So I think it kind of made me think, but but let's just start with the very fact why interbody fusions, right? Because we all know you can do everything posteriorly, but if you're doing MIS, your fusion is in the interbody. I think that's a given right there. If you're gonna do any MIS technique, you're relying on interbody fusion. So that's a given. But then the most important thing we want, what do we want out of this, right? We want a fusion. You got to create and maintain sagittal and coronal balance, and both are important there. You also want to create stability. And this, I think, is the most important. It has to be easy to use for the surgeon. It doesn't matter what it is, but that surgeon should be comfortable or proficient in doing what he's doing. And I'll be the first to say, I don't think it makes a big difference what you do of these three. There are nuances as to where you can get more leverage out of one technique or the other, but I don't think you'll ever find anywhere one is significantly better than the other. So we'll go through that in a minute. So I threw this table together to kind of summarize a lot. We'll spend some time on it. I know it's full, but I want to show the surgeon comfort, right? We're all used to T-lift, P-lift. Most surgeons, you know, open posterior, you get down there, you, you know the area, you know the anatomy, and people are more comfortable doing that. Today, more and more are getting comfortable with the lateral interbody fusion at the top, right? And then Olif now is kind of getting only put two because I think this is definitely less than trans-sewers. pre sewers people are kind of getting comfortable. And then ALIF again, the only reason I did that was yeah, you, you need a vascular surgeon. And some patients, vascular surgeon is not there, so you may not have access to do an ALIF. That's why I only put three. But I still think in terms of comfort, I still think today posterior people are most comfortable. No visualization, obviously, you see the nerve clearly. 
You clearly do not see the nerve in any of these three procedures. Access, again, access is pretty good. You, it technically sometimes can be difficult to get good access into the, into the canal and down and do your job. But again, lateral and OLIF, the access getting down there, you gotta be proficient of getting down there to do the job. Certainly easier to get down there on a T-lift lift, lift than in a lateral or an O lift, unless you get proficient. So I kind of put one plus less there. Same with the A lift because you need a vascular surgeon. You don't have a vascular surgeon, you're kind of restricted. So if you have a good vascular surgeon, that makes your A lift better. And those of us who have good ones take this for granted. But having traveled and spoken to a lot of people, some areas just don't have a good vascular surgeon. So that turns, so you may not be able to do the A lift that you'd like to do. So you gotta look at doing something else, right? Vascular issues, obviously, hopefully you don't get that with a T-lift, that'll be a bad day. But lateral again, obviously you can have it, or if you can have it. A-lift, I think you definitely have a much bigger chance. We start mobilizing vessels, doing three, four, and two, three A-lifts. I mean, you got a good vascular surgeon, sure. But you're looking at vascular problems a little more, I'd say, if you're doing that. Interbody height, again, T-lift, lift, are not gonna give the same height that you're gonna get with a lateral or with an O-lift, right? And the A-lift, I think, most of us would get really, really good height. We were used to it, the ALL is resected. You'll get really good height. So that's something to think about. ALF gives you the best height. Those of us who are proficient can say probably we do it also with lateral or OLIS, right? For amino light, same thing. TLF can get it to you, but not as good because you get good height, you get good foraminal height too. And again, ALF can give you good foraminal height as long as you kept that open. But why is it important to come in a minute to make those decisions of what you need? Neural decompression to this day, even though indirect decompression, I think a lot of us have become more used to and started using it more and more. There's no question that you do a T-lift, you're directly visualizing doing a good decompression and I'll still give it four pluses can compare to this year. And I think if you're starting off early, you may have some trouble with indirect decompression, but it is real, it does happen. I'd say 97% of patients to 98 get a good indirect decompression. Reticulitis and nerve injury, no question, and TLF and PLF is more prone to it. You're right there. Don't dissect the nerve, don't retract the nerve. Try to stay away from it. I think you'll have less of a problem with radiculitis and nerve injuries. Obviously, you, with, with lateral, I put that only because of the transverse and maybe some lumbar plexopathies. I think a little less with these two in terms of nerve injuries. Single position, clearly TLF is the best single position 360 surgery we do every day. We get so carried away, it's the best, best single solution surgery. Now, can you do single position? The other show, we just heard about it. You can certainly put screws from the back. Posterior muscle injury, clearly T-lift, right? You're in the back, you're dissecting. Even if you're doing MIS T-lift with the tube, you are damaging that muscle to some extent. And the sooner you can do it, less retraction, less ischemia. Obviously, no posterior muscle injury here. So as injury, clearly nothing on T-lift, but certainly more so with trans a little less with OLIF and obviously ail if you don't. This I think becomes really important, segmental lordosis. On average you get, we showed that way back in 2005, you get about seven to eight degrees of increase with, of T lift for segmental lordosis, sometimes you're lower six. Clearly the lateral and O lift are getting a lot more, they're getting at least about 12 to 15 degrees, depending where you place the cage, more anterior you place it with the lateral approaches, you get a better lordosis, but A lift clearly without a question, gives you the best lordosis. So if you're trying to achieve or create that, remember that, that an ALF gives you a much better option of creating a good lordosis. Can you do it with the lateral? Sure you can, but I think ALF is better. Coronal balance, again, I think, TLF, you're not really looking at getting coronal balance. People would say, put her one side, again, a little bit more. You know, really, I don't, I don't buy that. TLF doesn't give you as much of that. Laterals clearly help you with that. ALF, again, is the best. You resect the ALL, you put a big footprint spacer in there, you, with ligament taxes, correct the coronal balance a lot. So ALF again is a good one, especially at 5-1, to correct that. End plate preparation, TLF and PLF, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty good, but not that great. You, you only get much better with laterals in end plate preparation. ALF again is the best because you're really looking at it, and I think you get great end plate preparation if you really were to see, as opposed to laterals. Again, something to think about. It because you get much bigger surface area of control and much better discectomy. Implant size, clearly. <laughs> TLF probably the smallest implant size ever, but still we get it in and it, it kind of works. So we want to talk of footprint, clearly the smallest footprint, but it does work. And laterals, clearly much better footprint. ALIF has the best footprint. So again, if you're thinking of that, stability, think put that in place. Again, standalone. I think TLF obviously cannot do standalone. 
laterals and uh, laterals. I personally would not advocate standalones. Very, very, very selective for standalones for those patients. ALIF, you can. I mean, you've got a pretty stable spine. ALIF with good anterior fixation, you can do standalone, and we know that works out pretty well. Fusion, interestingly, is actually the same across the board. They all have pretty equivalent fusion, with the laterals and ALIF maybe a little more than the TLIF. But fusion results are actually the equivalent. So, so where does all this come from, right? There's, there's, there's data, and unfortunately, every time data comes, always meta-analysis. I, I hate meta-analysis, garbage in, garbage out. And that's the only problem, but, but Ralph is a phenomenal, Ralph Mobb is a really good friend. Sydney, Australia does great research, good work. And I think at the bottom line, there's a meta-analysis across, I think you had about 36 papers, ultimately narrowed it down, similar fusion rates, ALIF clearly better height, better lordosis. Interestingly, TLIF, he had a better ODI, and I'm gonna think that, I think, really because he probably is a very good TLIF surgeon, and then switched to laterals kind of later, and this is 2015, so it might be kind of learning curve. I'm gonna guess that, I, I can't explain that. Uh, obviously, proliferate the greatest blood loss and complication rates are pretty similar across all these publications, right? So he doesn't, so again, interestingly, Ralph is so good, he puts the same paper out two years later. It's the exact same paper, so it actually works. Just keep publishing it, you can put another meta-analysis, but it's good, good stuff. I actually love this paper. Anyone should read in terms of where they are. What they did was, rather than do meta-analysis, they actually looked at the literature across the board and then sort of reviewed every paper and then made comments on it, which I thought was pretty good. Again, okay, ALIF and X level L45. So any of you guys want to read a good paper in terms of comparing, this is good. Again, okay, fusion rates were great across the board, right? And then you and then you follow it, both X level, ALIF, they all look good. They quote these papers that are there. So they were directly quoting papers and the results. Fusion rates were fine, no big deal. If you look at segmental lordosis, clearly ALIF had much better segmental lordosis than the trans service lateral. And this was across two papers, big series, between 4.5 to 4.7 degrees on an ALIF and about 2.1 for in terms of increased correction in terms of a lateral, right? That's what, that, that again makes sense. Again, ALIF was superior. Now you resect the ALL, you could get some more clearly to an ACL. But what's important is this, even after resecting the ALL and putting cages of 20 and 30 degrees, you only get seven to 11 degrees. Don't assume you're gonna get 20 degrees or 30 degrees just because you stuffed a 20 degree cage, it doesn't work. And the reason for that is you go back to the original paper of Akbarne, most of them had a particle subtraction of Oscar, sorry, yes, with SPO in the back. So you gotta do, if you want that 20, 30 degrees, you want an ALR resection with an SPO in the back, then you'll get your 20 degrees. And I think a lot of people have forgotten that. Go back to the original paper of Akbarne. And, and, and remember, it was over, I think, five or seven years and there were only 17 patients. So the thing was very selective when he did that. And I think we all do ACR. So if you're doing a, an ALL resection to me is different from an ACR. An ACR is with a SBO in the back to get you your 20, 30 degrees. That's a great option in terms of getting that. So if you want that, that you can do that option, right? For amino light, we talked about a quick ALIF and TLIF. ALIF was clearly better. TLIF basically got nothing. And it makes sense. You're not gonna get a lot of for amino light on TLIF. You know, you, you, you decompress the for him, which is good, but you don't really increase the height significantly. So again, something to think about, what are you trying to achieve? But it's a direct decompression, so maybe it doesn't matter as much. But the contralateral side, watch it. I've had at least two patients with contralateral change in geometry of their foramen by doing a TLIF from this side, and they get pain on the other side. Rare, but can happen. Uh, complications across the board. There's complications in every approach. They're unique. Each one has its own unique complication. You got to know about them. There are some peculiar ones like lymphocytes and ALIFs. It's not that uncommon. I know patients who have it, have had it, and you can get it, especially start doing higher level ALIFs. Don't forget, that's where I talk about the mobilization, the retraction, the blood vessels you're pulling over. All that starts these problems. Don't do any of that, you're not gonna get it. Stay away, find the aerial plane, don't start mobilizing things around. Now you got a very slick vascular surgeon, but you might be all right. Retrograde ejaculation is real. We all know it, 4.5 and 5.1. Obviously, transperitoneal is way more than retroperitoneal. And retrograde ejaculation, obviously, a lateral, you're not going to get retrograde ejaculation. No root injury, ureteral injury. Interestingly, in this paper, this is extremely uncommon. That's the only thing I would disagree. Ureteral injury does happen. We published the first three right way back. And since then, unfortunately, I do know a few more. Uh, I have defended a few more. And it does happen. And it's hard. The only way to avoid it, in my mind, Contralateral is sad. Do not put a device through the other side. Do not pass any instrument across the disc on the opposite side. The ureter is sitting right there. And I can tell you two of them, I know that's exactly what happened. 
and don't do that. You just need to go up to the annulus and tease it to allow it to extend and spread and let the dilator do its job. I think that's been wrong in a concept of going across. That's the only thing I stop. Ipsilateral, make sure there's nothing horizontally across your plane. Just keep sweeping everything before you do something there. That's the safest way to avoid it. But unfortunately, it does happen. You're there and can. So be careful about the lumbar plexus. We talked about it. It's just part of the trans service approach. You do get groin hypostheses. Uh, we talked about motor deficits, and most of them do resolve, I would agree, and, and we talked about time. So it's all about retraction time, keeping it as low as possible to try to avoid that starting to make sense. And you do want, if you're going to go trans so let's try to get it done within 30 minutes per level, and that makes complete sense, right? Sympathetic dysfunction, it, it's there in ALIFs, it's there in laterals, you're going to see that somewhere. There's some talk about it could be higher with OLIF. Again, I'd say the same thing, if you look and sweep everything away, you're not gonna see that chain. So be careful before you make that first annual lotomy, and I think you'll be fine. When you do that blind is where you may get it with a pre service approach, other than that, you, it, it's fine. Obviously, I told you, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, I, I will always disagree. The neural deficit, I think, is more than we talk about with the trans service approach. It is there, talk to patients, they'll tell you. Be careful, and I, again, I'll point this paper out, it's a good learning curve. Today, obviously, everyone's got very proficient, and I know people do fantastic laterals and do a great job with it, so I'm not knocking any of them. But just be careful, it exists, and be aware of it, that's all. If you look at LF again, at the end of the day, though, clearly, Excellent is better than ALIF in terms of sympathetic issues, vascular complications, retrograde ejaculation, a lateral approach is way better than an ALIF. ALIF will reduce the plexopathy, obviously, and stuff like that. So end plate preparation, we talked about that, right? Again, the end plate, interestingly, these guys found at two, three, and three, four, the end plate was better on a lateral than on an ALIF. And I find that probably is an exposure problem. They must have a less difficulty exposing two, three, three, four, right? We are way up there, you gotta move the vessels right over. So that was interesting, I just found that interesting. I, I, didn't, I didn't, couldn't believe that. I always think ALIF has better end plate. You see it really well, you go all the way back. And uh, no, no MIS talk is ever without. Dr. Uribe, there's another paper of his, with a great diagram, I like the diagram showing the approaches there. And again, they looked at that, ALIF showing, what I, this was indirect decompression. ALIF had a 67% increase in the cross-sectional area, right? Lateral as 24 to 33% increase, only a similar increase. So you're getting good foraminal and cross-sectional increase of the spinal canal, sort of testament to fact that indirect decompression is real, and clinically, we've all seen it over the years. And to me, I stage them so I clinically know they got it. They're up and walking, so when I do multi-levels, that's what that's how I convince myself that you get them and walk, and they have no leg pain. They got no leg pain, and you know they, you know they got better. Trajectory. This I have a problem. That's why I want to bring it up. The fact that you get more intraneural complications because your trajectory is off in pre service That's really kind of sad. That's like saying you put the T leaf in the wrong place. It's part of the technique that you correct yourself to go orthogonal. So I, I kind of disagree with this one. I think if you do it right, that's not an issue. And you can't, we've uh, done spondylolisthesis grade two and grade three. It's all about the technique of getting it. I don't think there's any difference between a lateral and a pre service for doing that, for that point of view. Ultimately, you, you have to go orthogonal to get it done. And again, this is just, uh, again, overall hordosis, ALIF again is the best. Lateral is okay, lateral and TLIF. Posterior spinal fusion in situ is the worst for lordosis. I think we all would agree on that. They're just locking it in, which is where the interbody, I think, gives you that lordosis. Unless you're going to do the osteotomy in the back and create that from the back, which certainly you can with the TLF. So I'm going to say, I think first point is the most important. Do what you're most comfortable with. It doesn't matter. That's much better for the patient. Don't just run and do something with someone told you to do it. If you're really good with TLIF, do it. It's okay. Lateral, OLIF, pre source, whatever. Do it. Without a question, ALIF gives you the best lordosis. So if you want to get lordosis, create lordosis, you got to find one and just go for it. You're going to get the best lordosis there. Again, with LF, OLIF, you're going to get a good one, four, five, and above. You can great lordosis, place it right. OLIF is better. I think at four, five, now going trans service. You need more, we'll set the ALO. You need more, do an SPO. So kind of in your head, plan these things when you go pre up. What do you need to do? If it TLIF, you're forced to do a TLIF, great, but you need a lot of lot of dose of so TLIF, do an SPO. Plan on it, do an SPO with the TLIF. Post your inside to fusion, I think is the worst in terms of sagittal balance. I think we all know that today, not that it doesn't work, outcomes may be great, but not. And everyone's unique, understand the complications, they're all different. Just understand them. I just quickly, quick case, 
SPO, small bowel obstruction, exploding laparotomy, it's actually a really good director, prior fusion, 4551, abdominal sepsis. There's no way in hell I'm going in the front. Colostomy and reversal, no. Nah. But there's a great patient for doing a multi-level T-lift with an SPO. You'll get the same correction. So have these tools in your hand. That was totally three-level MIS T-lift, poke screws, everything else. Poke the whole thing down, correct it down. You can do it, right? So you can do it open, it doesn't matter. But I'm just saying have the armamentarium that you gotta be able to do that. And it works very well, right? On the flip side, you're fusing again, four to one, fused, imbalanced. Three, four ACR is a great procedure for this patient. Let's do a three, four ACR on the top instead of a PSL. I would have otherwise it would have been a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Instead, you do this procedure, lose 100 cc of blood, and you get the same correction, completely MIS. So these are things that you can think about how you apply these things. And at the end of the day, I'll say, if you have a disc, go for it. Your disc is your best friend. I'm always looking at five one as it open. Always go for it. You can get great raw doses from there. You don't have five one, then maybe think of an ACR. But assume where you're going to get your raw doses. That's it. Every procedure is great. Just use it wisely. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Neil. That was a great talk. Uh, you know, it's a, actually a huge broad topic and I, I think you were able to distill it down to like a 15 minute talk, so that's fantastic. I, I, I think we said it earlier, to be a spine surgeon in this day and age, I, I think you need to be facile with pretty much every interbody technique because they each have its uh, their benefits and disadvantages. And depending on the patient's condition, again, it's very important to individualize your treatment to the patient. You have to just select the best interbody technique that in your hands, obviously, but they all offer uh, pros and cons. So, Neil, I I know you've already mentioned a lot of things like for a single level, you like T lifts, but. Um, is that always the case? You know, I, I like T-lifts too, but a lot, sometimes I'll choose a lateral be, just because of the segmental lordosis issue. So if I, if I just, you know, again, you could argue whether one level makes a huge difference or not, but at four or five in particular, I just think a lateral um, with indirect decompression is a better option than say a MIS T-lift. But, but that, that's, that's sort of my bias. No, no, I, I think you raise a great point. I think if I want to create lordosis without a question, I think I'll pretty much do a lateral. But single level, if I already have the lower doses, I can maintain that with my T-lift. So then I'm happy, I'll go with the T-lift. The thing I like about T-lift is single level, I'm, I, I'm fast, I've done it for years, of 15, 17, 18 years now. So for me, it's the same amount of time, actually faster than doing a lateral and flipping and putting screws or same level. And so the only time I do single level lateral with screws is I don't need a decompression. Like patient doesn't need a decompression. It, it's maybe just a grade one spondy, doesn't really need it or very rarely you do a single level who doesn't need to dose this very rare operation. So that's why, that's why a single level for me is just, it's just easier. I'm not saying there's nothing, you can do a lateral. I love t it's just a good operation. Uh, absolutely, and it, again, it, I think it's, last I checked, it's the most popular interbody option. I, I mean, by far, actually. Uh, we, we talk a lot about laterals and uh, A-lifts all the time, but T-lifts really are the most popular technique. Uh, so any, uh, Questions, Timur, Sama, anyone in the audience? So, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, uh, you just comment on your use of like intraoperative monitoring, you know, as, re as related to like OLED or ALED. do you use it in those cases or? Uh... Uh, the, the question was uh, intraoperative monitoring in, in OLIFs and laterals and things like that. Well, OLIF, honestly, you don't need it at all, but I always have it because everybody else is using it in the next room. I have eight rooms going and everybody's using it. So there's always monitoring in my room. I have no idea what's going on. I don't even look at it, don't even see it. So honestly, if you get good at OLIF, you don't need it at all. The only thing I'd say there is do not retract the psoas. I've seen that with people do a pre-psoas approach, but then they're retracting the psoas. You basically lost all the advantage. The retractor should be about the psoas and let the psoas just roll over. So I don't think you need it. And so I, I, I've done it in other countries, never used it or elsewhere. So that's my answer. t I rarely have it. Uh, if I was doing trans psoas, of course you need it. Uh, and uh, even a I do. Actually, a is interesting. I use it more for the vascular retraction if I'm moving the vessels. It actually is a very good indicator of we've been retracting the vessels for too long. It actually works really well. We today even have a pulse ox. We put a pulse ox on the leg and we, and the SSCPs will drop. It's very interesting. So that's the reason I like it. Yeah, I, I think um, there, there's a clinical component to it. And you could argue that 
it hasn't been shown to be beneficial per se, but there's also a medical legal component. Uh, and in some ways, I think that's the bigger component. I've done personally some medical legal reviews, and I think uh, nowadays uh, lawyers are pretty savvy about looking whether monitoring was done or not. And to them, you know, as as lay people, it makes sense. You're not you're not taking every measure to prevent a problem because you're not using it. And uh, it, it's a hard argument to uh, to make, actually. Just you know, intuitively, for the average person, it seems like something you should do. Just have it. Right. It's, right. It's just, so I, I think most hospitals um, allow it. it. You know, as long as in these days, it doesn't take that much operative time to, to use them. So it, it's a good good question, though. Um, anyone else? Well, you had a question. Yeah. No, I don't know. I had another question in terms of when you're doing your lateral approach uh, pre SOS. Um, so you, first thing, so you, sometimes you see the sympathetics there, and you try to you know move them out of the way. What do you do when they're just kind of rigid? And the second thing is, uh, you said that you, you don't retract the SOS posteriorly. So what if that window is still small? Uh, even after, after everything else. Both great questions. I've seen the sympathetic chain only twice. If you sweep everything away, you rarely ever see it. But good point. You should look down and make sure it's not traversing. It's actually a very thin fiber. And as ganglion on, you can see it's very, it's very unique. As opposed to your reader, which again should move with your peritoneum. If you swept properly, it goes with the peritoneal sleeve. So it should go. Nothing horizontal should be crossing. Before you make anything, look at it. So I'd be a good, that's one. Two, uh, you were asking about the sewers, right? The psoas is not attached anteriorly. Its attachment is posterior vertebral body and the transverse processes. It sits on the body. It just rolls over. You go underneath it and it rolls. If it's a big psoas, you'll see a psoas minor tendon. It's a very specific tendon, a great anatomical landmark. You see that tendon, it's the anterior border of the psoas. Now, if it's a very big psoas, you can go between the minor and the major. There's no nerves there. There's absolutely no nerve in that plane right there. It's four or five, sometimes you might have to do that, but that's okay. Just the minor tendons is there. You'll get a little groin pain that lasts for a couple of days and goes away because you move. Uh, that, that's the best way to do it. But you don't have to move the source. It's not attached until a lot of people go look at the MRI. It's never attached. It's attached to the back. It rolls. So, um, it, you know, that, that's a very good and detailed explanation by Neil. And anatomically, um, he's always great at that. And I just want to let everyone know if you're not aware that he is actually the editor of Gray's Anatomy. <laughs> so, um, so you should know, understand the anatomical structure is actually uh, better than anyone here. Um, so I, I think uh, if there's no other uh, questions, I will proceed to the next cadaver demonstration. Obviously, Rod uh, Askurian, uh, Jonathan Plumer, and Jared Crook uh, are going to be demonstrating the prone transoas. Hi, Paul. How's it going? So um, we're in the lab today, and uh, next to me is one of our, uh, actually, both of our fellows. So Jared Cook um, is standing next to me. He's one of our fellows, and then Jonathan Plumer. And um, uh, we're going to do a prone transoas approach. Um, and uh, um, we have the patient uh, uh, position. We actually put the retractor in already just to save time. Um, but I, I kind of want to show everyone the retractor itself um, before we get started. And basically, what we've done is, um, here's the retractor, and um, you can see here it's got, it's basically, it's got an anterior, posterior, and then it's got some markers in there. So when you get a good AP and lateral, um, you can see some of these radiolucent markers. And so you can see there's a triangle anterior, and then there's posterior. And what's unique about this retractor system, which I really like, is the fact that it's so rigid. So one of the things, and I think, um, you know, Rick and uh, Dr. Hines and Dr. Pements talked about it, is how, you know, whether you're going prone or if you're going lateral, is that, you know, the retractor um, and the abdominal contents um, are, can move. And so when you're prone, you know, there's a tendency just because of gravity, the retractor tends to sneak um, anterior. So you're, even though the abdominal contents have fallen away, there's a tendency for the retractor to drift down because of gravity. So um, this, the way this retractor is positioned, and we actually have under here, this is the other thing I wanted you guys to see. We have some very nice uh, patient positioners. So Jared, if you can grab 
Um, and so we've basically um, uh, used this thoracic and uh, pelvic positioner. We've opened the, um, uh, in the coronal plane a little bit. And so you're able to crank um, uh, literally in the direction that you want. So I'm just gonna show everyone, can you guys see that? So we're just cranking the thoracic and then now we're gonna crank the pelvic. And what that does is it opens up the disc space for us. Um, and you can see just because of the way it's, it's um, positioned. So now I'm gonna crank it the other way. And then the retractor arm is, goes right on the patient positioner. So now we've got an, um, a nice uh, opening. We've opened up that area. And again, historically, when we do these lateral, you'd have to tape the patient's iliac crest and try to get out of the way here. It's very nice. You can just use the thoracic and pelvic positioner. And then what we did is we dilated down. Uh, we used neuromonitoring, um, and we were able to get the, um, uh, the dilator in. We um, got in there and basically got on the 50-yard line. We put our um, uh, guide wire in, and then the guide wire has a little, uh, uh, basically goes in. I'll just show you guys. And then, then we'll do our discectomy. Go ahead and hold on to that, Jonathan. So this guide wire actually comes off and you can actually stimulate this. So this goes on, there has a little ball and then use this to get in the disc space. And then once you get in the disc space, then you take the ball off and then you leave the guide wire in and then you sequentially dial it, just like if you're doing a lateral approach. And then we could see that the distance was about 140 millimeters. And so that's what we put in. And then now Jared, the, um, we're gonna put a Visi on camera so you guys can all see this. Maybe for now. Rod, uh, um, can you uh, talk about some of the maybe contraindications to this technique that's specific for prone, prone tra uh, trans? So it's like, you know, I, I feel like obese patients are worse here. Whereas in the traditional lateral, the, it sort of develops a cavity. And so it's, it's almost easier when you put them lateral, but when they're prone, uh, their width doesn't decrease at all. I mean, yeah. you end up having to use a longer retractor or, I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, honestly, so here's my, um, uh, my experience and what I've learned is, um, is thinner patients, I've had a lot more, it's, it's a lot more challenging because they don't have retroperitoneal fat, really. So the patients I've had the most trouble with are actually, thin, um, uh, very um, skinny female patients who have osteoporosis because it's very hard to see the, the uh, bony anatomy. Um, so Jared, if you want to start the annulotomy while we're talking, um, and uh, those have been more my most challenging. And what's ironically, the patients that I've, the, the um, patients with a little bit uh, higher BMI, little heavier patients um, actually uh, are easier to do because their belly kind of floats down. And as Dr. Pimenta showed, um, we're gonna go ahead and put the Visi on camera now so you guys can see what Jared's doing. So I've had much better luck with patients who are larger, ironically, um, and just because their retroperitoneum is massive. And again, um, uh, as, as we, have shown and, and multiple studies have demonstrated. I mean, I think the key thing for me when you're doing uh, uh, lateral surgery is really the lumbar plexus. Thanks. And so, um, you know, in, in, in patients that are skinnier, their, their psoas muscle tends to be a lot smaller. So it's very difficult to navigate. Um, you know, you can't really, there isn't the, the plump, you know, you don't have the, um, the fibers aren't as big. And so I think, again, just my experience has been, can you guys see that there? Yeah, Jared is just starting to do his discectomy. Go ahead and grab it too, Terry, now. It's a little blurry, oh, that's perfect now. Can you orient us? Uh, yeah, post, uh, so basically, nope. um, again, just, just based on what yeah. I showed you guys earlier, there's, uh, this retractor has um, an anterior and posterior component. Um, and then Jared is now uh, um, uh, taking out the, he's, in the posterior section of the disc. So he's higher up. And then we actually put a shim anterior and posterior. And we're going to rotate the bed because Jared's about 6'5". <laughs> and um, 
<laughs> doesn't look like he's very comfortable. I so Alexa, that. if you can rotate the bed for us. And again, once once you uh, get a good AP and lateral image, then then you can ro that's when I rotate the bed. Um, and then now it's a lot more comfortable and then so now we're going to go ahead and do, and I actually like using the box cutter. So the next thing we're going to do, once you do your an annulotomy, Jared, go ahead and grab your box great. cutter. The box cutter just makes it so easy. And again, the, the key thing I think for doing, uh, for me, there's like three major uh, steps when you're doing um, trans psoas surgery is number one, getting good x-rays. Number two is the um, uh, retractor position. And then number three is understanding where the lumbar plexus is and uh, what, that, uh, what that looks like. Um, and, and, you know, basically, if you nail those, uh, um, go ahead and get a shot there, Sean. Then, then, you know, you, you're going to be able to do safe lateral surgery. Um, and again, as we discussed earlier, that looks pretty good. Um, so, go ahead and hold on. Go ahead and so, hammer that. So, box cutter is a dangerous piece of uh, instrumentation, and getting that X-ray to make sure you're lined up is mm -hmm. is important. Do uh, you think, Rod? Or... Yeah, definitely. And that's why we put shims in, and you can see how rigid this arm is. Um, so that's that's really the key to to this approach. I think is you just have to stay within the the um the retractor take a shot and um that and you good. can see we went we went across the disc space there but that's okay um and then let's go ahead and get um let's go ahead and get our just our blunt trials as well the key thing i think whenever um you're using the box cutter is to uh again it's all about angles and so you want to make sure not in again if you're going prone you want to try not to come out the front okay and so now let's go ahead and just give me one little tap here let's get the posterior wall yep keep going good so now go ahead and put the trial in let's see what that looks like and then we'll after that alexa will get the six millimeter box cutter so shut there so it looks like he's sinking, um, you know, to the floor. So that's one of the biggest issues with this. Yeah, exactly. So let's go ahead and get the pituitary. So we're going to take a little bit more disc out. And then, um, and then let's get, uh, let's come around, Shelly. Let's get one more. Let's go and lower the table. So is this getting, uh, three, four then? This looks like actually, Paul, that's excellent. We were just talking about it. I think it's L2, three. Yeah, you know, the uh, yeah. floor is um, upside down on our screen. So. Let's go ahead and come back down and let's get a quick lateral. Let's see where we're at. So. So Ron, then, how high do you think you go with the prone, Francois? How high Two, can we go prone? How, how high would you go with this? You know, I mean, I think, uh, again, um, you know, I think obviously uh, it depends on, you know, the pathology and what you're doing. Um, but I think right now most of the surgeons are um, concentrating on doing, um, uh, you know, basically staying in the lumbar spine. I think probably, oh, I think you can, I mean, you can do thoracic, obviously, but... Um, I think most everyone, including myself, are, are staying in the, in the lumbar spine. Um, and then let's lower the table. Yeah, perfect. So, so now we're going to, um, let's go ahead and rotate. We're getting one more x-ray just to see what that looks like. So, great. And then let's go ahead and... Um, and Come back around. That's perfect. And then what we'll do is now we'll use the six millimeter box cutter. And you can see, I mean, and and how rigid this arm is. It's it's you know, it's it's not gonna move at all. But that's always the fear. Um, is you can you can again if you're doing this, it's 
the the um, the main thing is to make sure that you're not going anterior because obviously there's vascular structures. Yeah, it looks yeah. like on your fluoroscopic image, the, the, the down blade is just on the anterior border of the of the disc space. So you, I, I guess you could see why you could get an inadvertent AOL sort of release, and then everything sinks more. Yeah. So it's just, so we're going to try to put a 22 millimeter cage in. That's why we went down so far, Paul. Let's go and get one more shot there, Shelly. So maybe it comes straight up. I think it's a little bit off. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so now again, um, uh, just because of the position, um, we're going to go ahead and um, so Shelly, if you can just go, just go straight up and down, I think. And then. Hi, Rod. Yeah. It's Pimenta. Uh, just uh, helping a little bit on the concept and the risk of ALL disruption. One of the ways we find uh, interesting is to place an anterior shim. So then you, you will not allow any chance to have a ALL opening. So using two shims instead of just one. Yeah, that's a great point, Dr. Pimenta. Um, and I agree. I mean, uh, there's a significant risk of having ALL rupture when you're um, doing this approach. Um, so let's go ahead, let's get, come back around. Let's see what the position looks like. Also, and right, please. when you when you look after the position, it's interesting to have uh, your trial inside and then takes the lateral x-ray because then you have a better reference where you are. That's right. And then you can see, um, yeah, let's go ahead and read, Shelly, if you can just. So you can see we're pretty, an, the, we're a little bit anterior, but we can easily shift it. So it's just a little bit anterior, but it's not too bad. Um, so let's go ahead. And so what size was that trial there? Okay. So let's go ahead, um, let me see the, let's see the six. Let's see what that six looks like. Shot again, shot. Okay, yeah. So come back around and then let's see if we can, let me see the pituitary as well. And then we've almost done, finished with our disc prep. We're just going to take a little bit more disc. And you can see there we got very nice exposure of the disc space. And let me go. I'm just going to go move the blade a little bit. Um, oh, yeah. OK, so. Let's go ahead and yeah, let's go ahead and put that in. Um, and then it's going to go exactly just like this. And then we're going to aim it a little bit more posterior. Okay, and then let's see the mallet. Go ahead and mallet that in. I'll just hold on to it. Yep, keep going. Keep going. Yep. Yep, keep going. That's how you want to stop. Okay, good. And then come back around, Shelly. So, uh, and um, again, the nice thing about, you know, doing it, I think, um, in this position is that for me, and Dr. Pimenta actually showed one of the most feared, uh, so one of the most feared complications of doing this approach that was a little bit anterior. Um, is coming out, um, uh, is having bowel injury and vascular injury. Come back around, Shelly. And then let's redo the retractor, just slid just a little bit. So let's redo that just for a sec.
Okay. Um, okay, great. And then go ahead and tighten that. Position. Come back around, Shelly. And then let's get one more shot. That's better. So um, let's do, uh, let's come, uh, let's come back around, Shelly, one more time. And then let me see the pituitary. And then we'll be ready. And then let me see that six millimeter box cutter one more time. Okay. And then let's see the um, let's see the six millimeter trial one more time. The other thing I think what uh, what's what's nice about this retractor is that if you stay within the um, uh, the retractor itself, go ahead. Good. It's got these two little, um, it's radiolucent markers, so it kind of shows you if you're parallel to the floor or not. Okay, so come back around. Shelly, let's get one more shot. It's still kind of going a little bit anterior. Okay, come back around. So let's just adjust this. Actually, this is good that this happened. So this happens um, every now and then. So the key thing is, is that now what we're gonna do is adjust our, our retractor and our shim. So let's go ahead and get the, let's get the Vision out for one second. And then let's readjust. And the nice thing is this retractor is, um, it's got a little, okay, let me see the shim remover. So we're going to take the shim out and then let me see, go ahead and loosen it just a little bit. Loosen a little bit more. Okay. And then tighten that. And, and very little adjustment needs to be done. Let's come back around, shall we? But you can see, um, you know, just with even just putting that, trial in you can really see you know just the, even a couple millimeters um off and and the that looks a little bit better so let's go ahead and get the trial back and then let's put the shim in rod so may actually... i suggest may i suggest one thing uh it's clear that uh the all uh was open so uh you should move your interior blade more posture and when you implant your cage make sure that you have a, a lateral plate uh, with a screw prepared so because there is a tendency that the cage always migrate to the front yeah that's that's an ex that's exactly what happened dr pimenta um you're 100 correct so let's go ahead and put the so once you lose the the um the all um it's really easy i mean the coming out the front um is is a lot easier to do and so that's why we readjusted the retractor so now we're going to go ahead and once we uh and then we'll get the vision in in a second yep go ahead Okay, let's see what that looks like. It's still drifting a little bit. You can see that. So we'll probably have to readjust the angle. Let's see what that looks like with the Vision. Okay, get a shot there, Shelly.
Okay, so yeah, that's that's definitely gone more anterior. Okay, so let's readjust it. Um, and then let's take that Vision out. And then let me see. And then come out just for a second, Shelly. Yeah, come back around. And then I'm going to take the shim out. We'll make one more adjustment. Let me see the shim remover. Let's see. Okay, and then go ahead and loosen it, Jonathan. Okay. Go ahead and tighten that. And then let me see the, uh, I'm going to do a couple clicks, Jason. I think we open it. We got two more clicks. So we'll be able to get that retract a little bit more posterior. Okay. Okay. And then Shelly, come back. Let me see the mallet. Okay, and then come back around. Let's get one more shot. Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, and then, um, so Shelly, come back around one more time. And then let's see the pituitary and the box cutter. Actually, let me see the annulotomy knife. I'm just gonna make the incision a little bit more posterior. Then we'll be able to get our. Retractor. Okay, and then let's see that four millimeter box cutter. Okay, good. So. And then I'll hold it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, great. And then go a little bit further in. Okay, good. And then let's see the um, the bigger box cutter. Let's see the six millimeter box cutter. Okay, go ahead, Jared. Great, and then let's see the trial back. That looks better. Okay, and then let's get the Vision camera in there now. Still trying to slide out the front. Okay, go ahead and hit that. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. All right, let's see what that looks like. So, we readjusted the retractor and then put it just a little bit more posterior, but you can see it's still trying to sneak out the front. So what we'll do, one more adjustment and um, see if we can get, let's see the uh, shim remover, and then we'll move the arm back, yep. Okay, great, no, so leave that one in. Let's see the shim remover. Uh, right, may I? May Please. I suggest you to bring the retractor posterior, but also place a screw on your anterior retractor so you fix your anterior position and will be a little bit better to avoid migration of the of the the trial to the front. Say that again, Luis. You cut out there. 
ahead. Yeah. Come on, uh, so uh, I know. Oh I, yeah. I, okay. I see I, what you're I know saying. what you are doing. Yeah. Uh, another thing that you could do also is using the screw that goes on the wall of the interior blade to fix your interior blade yeah to the position that will anchor your trial instead of going always to the front okay go ahead and tighten that okay let's see what that looks like yeah that's an excellent point um dr pimenta shot there so let's go ahead and come back um Come back around, Shelly. And then let's see the, okay, that's a lot better. Hit that. And then let's see the four millimeter box cutter again. Great. And then let's go ahead. Mm -hmm. Keep going, Jared. Good. Okay, let's see the uh, trial back. That feels a lot better. Go ahead and hit that. Okay, good. Okay, come back around, Shelly. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, it still looks like it's drifting a little bit. Yeah, so what we'll do is, let me see the smaller trial and then we'll put the, let me see the pituitary. And then let's loosen, let me see the uh, shim remover and then, yep, great. Shim remover. Yeah, for you. Kick it off there. I'll show me that. And then let's see the, go ahead and loosen that for one second. Okay, go ahead and t tighten that. Yep. And then let me see the shim again. And then go ahead and hit that, Jerry. Great. And then let's see the uh, box cutter. Okay. And then go ahead and hit me, Jerry. Great. Okay. And then let's see the trial back. Let me see the six actually. Yeah. Okay. And then go ahead and hit me, Jerry. Uh, Rod. Yes, Luis. Uh, can I comment one thing? Uh, the yeah. trials, they, they are. Uh, they have the border very uh, soft. They have a tendency to slide to the front so much easier. If you use, if you use just a 18 millimeter wide cage with a previous, with a plate, you'll see that you can place your, your cage much more posterior because the surface is yeah. much more rough. Uh, and will 
prevent to fall to the front. Well, and you know, I think this would this is actually a good case too, Luis. I think we probably this is what happens when you don't do a dis good discectomy. I think we. This is also to, true. I didn't want little, to comment this way, but bigger dis discectomy. What size is that one there? Yeah, perfect. Let's do that one. And so, um, you know, I think if you do a good disc prep, um, then uh, then you know the chance of going anterior is less likely. So now we're going to go ahead and put our implant in. Um, so this is a okay. And then let's go ahead and hit that. But again, I think the the nice thing about you know when you're when you're um, you can see here you can you can really see whether oops um go ahead and hit one more time okay good and then yeah now he's good now it's good go ahead and loosen that for a second yep so i think we're good there okay and then tighten that jonathan okay and then get one more shot Shelly. So I think, I think we yeah. uh, got it. And then final position there. Okay. And then one more shot. Okay. That looks pretty good. And then so the, on camera, what we're going to do is let's just slowly come out with the retractor so you guys can see and we're basically done so go ahead and loosen it Jonathan so now you can see just like you know most transos approaches I want you guys to see so here's the um, retroperineal contents and then here's the psoas as we come out and again the, the beauty of this is that for me the two kind of the most feared complications are the vascular as well as um let's go ahead and bring down this so we can is the vascular injury i want to see if we can we need that little t-handle to bring down the dilator so why don't you dial down the dilator let's see yep um and the nice thing about you know when you're if as and you can see here hopefully you guys can see the abdominal constants kind of they're more anterior than normally would be. And then let's get a quick AP and lateral. And actually, you know, this is this is one of the things I think, and Dr. Pimenta pointed out, is that, you know, if the retractor does go, if it starts to drift, I think he made an excellent point of you can um, uh, um, easily, uh, you know, fixate in place with a little shim. Um, whoops. Uh, so we should have got another uh, x-ray there. Um, but uh, let's go back to Let's get one more shot. Yeah, I think it slid when we were coming out. It, it slid forward. So come back around. So it's a little posterior, and then we could tap it in a little bit more. Um, but those are the the main things. Do we have the? But any questions at all? No. What'd you say? I think Neil had a question here. Do we have, oh, is it on your side? Yeah. Let's get this. Hey, hey Rod. Good yeah. Time, so just just a quick question in terms of ALL. How easy it is to see the ALL and. Can you sort of protect it in that sort of angle? I know, I know. Um, you know, um, Luis is there too. Maybe you can comment too. Oh. That's a great question, Neil. Usually, um, unless you're doing an ACR release, I try not to look for it. Um, but it's not. You know, it's 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 one of these structures where again, um, it's you really can only see the side part. Uh, you know, when you're going in, you can kind of see the fibers of it. Right. It's very difficult, I think, um, to sort of um, try and uh, look for it. Uh, but it's not a structure that I, I normally try and, um, you know, uh, 
look for, but it's it's very easily um, uh, you know disrupted and and like you saw here, um, it's 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 much easier to disrupt than than you think. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's uh, can I comment in uh, in uh, with with this? Uh, it's important that we really know where our interior blade is and make sure that we protect this point instead of looking to the ALL is fixing the anterior blade where it is and not allow surgeon to go to the front angled or because if you have a shim inside, will not go to the front. You, you could have the two shims is like a bowling track. The ball never falls out of the, the track, right? Yeah. That's a good point, Dr. Pimenta. Uh, you know, an anterior shim, um, mm -hmm. you know, not something we're typically taught to do with uh, lateral. So this is just a nuance for the for prone trans So, so anterior shim right. seems like it would be a very good. Uh, oh, you got it. Okay, good. You know, boundary. You know, um, I had a question. Yes. Uh, just in terms of the uh, the lateral X-ray when you place the retractor. I mean, I've never done a prone uh, position surgery like this, but um, it seems that the you know that that patient is bumped up on that on that ipsilateral side, right? So do you do you have to rotate the table to to get your perfect lateral? Or, you know. Um, because the C-arm is already fully rotated, right, underneath the, the table? Well, I, I think that may just be um, how this could ever, typical prone lateral, they're, 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 they're prone, so they're not tilted at all. No, I was just, I was thinking, though, with the, those positioners on uh -huh. the same side that you're going to operate on, it seems that that would kind of rotate the, the I see. patient, you know what I mean? Right, so that. Right. Um, I, I don't think it's meant to. It, it allows okay. rotation, but I, I yeah. don't think it's meant to. Come back around. Uh, can I answer that too? Uh, sure. The question is very appropriate. Is is correct? So we do the procedure with the table slightly rotated, but we only take a lateral X-ray uh, when the trial is in the position. We have to bring the table back, take the last lateral and then implant the cage uh, but you are right don't take don't try to take lateral x-ray with a table rotated uh, it's very unpredictable not precise and then can we see the vision really quick so uh just really quick actually dr pimenta and i think uh non um you can actually see a little bit of the um, anterior structures. Let's open it up just a little bit more. And then we uh, put a pretty small cage in. We actually put a, could have put a much larger cage in. Um, let me see if I can open this up a little bit more for you guys to see. Because I think Neil's point about the ALL and then Dr. Pimenta's point about the vascular structures. Can you guys see that a, a little bit? So let me see the pen field, and then we'll call it a day. Um, is, uh, so I'll just point out, so here's the ALL, you can see it's gone. And then the vascular structures obviously are anterior to this, but can you guys see that, Paul? Yes, it's a good view. So, and that's why I was having trouble, and Dr. Pimenta could, could you know, what Dr. Pimenta was saying is put your retractor and put a shim in here, because there's nothing here it's, that's holding it. So your retractor is gonna to start to, and, and your instruments are just gonna come out this hole. And the only way to really recover, which is kind of what I did is go posterior as you can and put your shim in. Um, and uh, that's what we ended up doing. But you can see how, you know, the, the ALL is gone and then the vascular anatomy is down here, so. Great, thanks Rod Great. for Thank you. showing us that. And um, I, I think uh, that's 
one of the interesting things about these cadaver demonstrations, you know, you, you often want to see some of the problems associated with the procedure. Um, it's actually very helpful rather than seeing a perfect procedure sometimes. So um, yeah, that's uh, right. it's, um, actually it highlighted sort of one, one of the uh, biggest concerns about this approach is the gravity and the sinking of the retractor and inadvertent AOL releases. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Timur Urikov uh, from University of Miami, and he's going to be talking about a single-stage lateral lumbosacral arthrodesis with robotic assistance. So again, uh, sort of novel use of technology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Timur Urikov. I'm a, a neurosurgery spine uh, specialist at the University of Miami. It is an absolute pleasure to be here alongside such an amazing faculty. Let's see the slides going, perfect. Uh, a lot already has been said today about the lateral and oblique approaches to the lumbar spine. Uh, and it's great to see so many open-minded people willing to go outside of the normal, comfortable zone and explore these uh, approaches. So let me continue with some of the points and hopefully we'll keep driving in the idea of the importance of knowing how to access pretty much at any angle the lumbar spine. Quick disclosures. Uh, in terms of minimally invasive, right, what does that mean to everybody? And it's not just about the skin incision. I hope everyone realizes any surgical procedure involves multiple systems and how we um, affect them, affect the overall outcome on the patient. It's not just the incision, again, it's about amount of destruction or uh, changes in the structural uh, components of the spine that we're doing, and also time. Time is a major component. The time of operation, the downtime of post-operative recovery period, all of that has to be taken into account how minimally invasive we were with the uh, surgical approach. Let's take this kind of a, a basic premise. Degenerative disc disease is the root of all evil. All right, as the uh, age progresses, the iridiparal disc height slowly deteriorates, the interior column loses its overall height or length, uh, and as a result, you get the flat back, loss of lordosis, and all of the associated pathologies down the line. We know the importance of the lumbar lordosis had been reiterated so many times with the original Schwab classification and the addition from the uh, SRS Society. By now, no one questions that. We all know we need to match the PI with lumbar lordosis. Um, the SVA is important, so talk is not about this. I think this is a well-accepted um, concept at this point. It's how we do the correction, how we achieve the favorable lordosis that we still discuss a lot. Traditionally, doing posterior osteotomies, removing the facet joints, and cranking on the spine um, allows you to restore some of the lordosis. And the point of articulation then becomes the posterior corner of the vertebral body. So that's what we're pivoting against. And of course, gravity being prone becomes important because a lot of times when you talk about lateral, people say, well, in lateral, you don't really get that gravitational force. You don't get the full benefit of lordosis. Yes, for this technique, you have to be in prone. It helps you when you remove the piece of bone and you want to crank on them. Of course, realizing that placing an inner body spacer, either a T-lift or a lateral, allows you to achieve uh, even, even higher grade of uh, angulation together with osteotomies, like in this case, maybe a little bit too much, but the point is proven. It is a really powerful technique, whether you do that single segment or multiple segments. Uh, and once you place something in the uh, intervertebral space, the pivoting point starts to shift forward. It becomes more anterior, but you're still relying on the closure of the posterior element. So again, maybe prone positioning is more preferred. And the actual choice for intervertebral disc graft, of course, is up to you. Many discussions, we talked about T-lifts today, why people love them. The T-lift has been the workhorse of minimal invasive spine surgery. And of course, I could have made an equal slide for a bad lateral case, right? But the associated issue with T-lifts being a small graft size, the approach, uh, the migration, the subsidence, I just felt like maybe doing the lateral cage or leaning towards it kind of alleviates a lot of that in my practice at least. And so uh, that's how I turn into uh, coming more and more from the site and trying to get the larger footprint, larger craft, getting a lateral inner body um, approach as much as possible. And in this situation, when you do it with minimal invasive approach, the pivoting point now shifts back towards the facet. We're restoring the intervertebral disc height, probably getting the anatomy the closest it's, it's been when patient had been in their younger years. Do we really need that prone positioning for, to achieve the lordosis? I would argue not anymore. 
This is a very uh, common picture we know about different ways of getting to the disk space. And of course, uh, as uh, Dr. Anand already showed in his chart, in Lato you probably have the most access. Um, and that's what we're gonna concentrate on. Traditionally, when we taught direct lateral approach, and of course, starting with Dr. Pimenta's work way early in 2000s, in my residency, I was told you look at the crest. If the crest is about four or five, nah, it's gonna be difficult. You know, you can try to angle the bed, but if it's still about the four or five, you try to avoid that, right? And that preoperative decision making. And so uh, now the four or five is not accessible. Of course, now we're learning to do anterior to psoas oblique approaches that alleviates that whole idea of uh, considering the crest position. And also with the anterior to psoas, you don't even need to put the patient on the uh, cranked angled uh, bed anymore. The patient can stay neutral on the side. Four, five, and five, one are not really accessible with direct lateral. And uh, Dr. Anat made that point today, right? What do you do? You can do uh, all the beautiful X lift and laterals, one to five, and then what do you do at five, one? Stage it, do an A lift, flip around. Nobody likes to flip, right? As was mentioned earlier. And so do you end up with just putting a T lift cage that looks like this? Well, the slide, of course, is not the demean the idea and technique, but it kind of feels a little bit of oxymoronic, right? When you're working with large graphs and everywhere else, and the most important space, the L5S1, gets that little T-lift. And here you have a comparison of a banana cage versus a lateral cage. So hopefully, point well understood. And just a quick slide, some fixes, just from the beginning, you look at it and you know, they're not gonna work, something's gonna break, right? As in this case, that same cage just pops out. So hopefully by now, with all the presentations prior and a couple of slides that I've shown, it becomes maybe more acceptable, apparent, the real power of having the complete ability to approach lumbar sacral region through the oblique, lateral, versatile way. And just to, you know, a little bit of a humor, right? Direct lateral by now, with all the works, all the big guys and the years now becomes like a, riding a tricycle. It's simple, people know what to do, complications are well aware, ATP, Something that's novel, you know, not as hard, requires some adjustments, and of course, coming to 5-1, and we've touched on it today, do it by yourself, having an approach surgeon, it becomes more of a, a kind of an advanced technique that needs to be further explored. Having that unrestricted access to anterior column gives you so much power with what you can do with spine. Great cases uh, by Dr. Pham already demonstrating that. Uh, here are just some of the um, uh, incision con uh, consideration. Smaller approaches, because you don't really need that shark bite incision uh, to different areas, and I usually prefer to make them along the same hypothetical dermatomal line, so the pain is really supplied by the same uh, neurological, I guess, uh, components. Uh, in this particular case, as you can see, I've noted the M&M, &M, right? Painless right quadricep weakness after the surgery. It was nothing really during the surgery that would direct towards me. Again, new approach, new complications, have to be aware of it. I track all my cases prospectively, so I know I don't lose anything out, everything's recorded, and I can look back and try to analyze what, did, what went wrong and what do we do about it. In this particular case, you see the uh, five one was in the lateral a lift, which is another consideration. Do you do a lateral a lift where you just expose inter um, vascular space and pretend this is just a lift in the lateral? Or as I'll show you later, I have uh, um, became a fan of articulating cages within the five one space as well. Incision planning, traditional a lift is usually done through the uh, uh, rectus sheath across the uh, you know the abdominus rectus muscle. With the oblique approaches, we're more in the obliques, and when you require multiple access point, going through the aponeurosis line becomes very powerful as well because even less distraction happens, but the closure, I've noticed, becomes a little more trickier in terms of trying to get that wall together again if you had made the cut on the offsite from the, um, from the, um, the cartilage. So uh, just to summarize quickly, for the lateral approaches, we already talked about it. A lot of advantages we do uh, restoration of lordosis, large area of the implant itself, dissipation of forces, subsidence, uh, more volume for graft, uh, that help, hopefully helps with fusion, uh, reduced tissue dissection, so that's more going towards the post-operative recovery, how much pain patient has, uh, the hospital stay, less blood loss, uh, again, not manipulating paraspinal structures, the benefit of de indirect decompression has been shown already, and all of that hopefully leads to decreased hospital stay, improved recovery, better outcomes, better patient satisfaction. But keep in mind all the uh, pitfalls again, 
new approaches, new anatomical structures to be aware of. Of course, we talked about lumbar plexus versus, and, and talking about direct versus anterior to psoas, how it all can be avoided in terms of complication. But now we're in a completely different zone. You know, We're used to doing prone procedures where it's just spine, muscle, bone, and nerve, and we're comfortable. And now we're converting into an all around uh, full body and there's a real person in front of us with all these other structures that can be damaged. Coming at any oblique angle, now we're deviating from that direct vertical or direct linear axis, and that can stray us in the direction that, you know, whatever the oblique uh, approach shows, and pretty much everything's at risk that we're coming through. The peritoneum, the psoas itself, it's very common to end up on the dorsal edge of the psoas initially when you start doing these oblique dissections, the sympathetic chains, vessels. Um, the spinal canal itself, putting the cage that you're not angulating enough and then thinking that you're in line with the disc but you're oblique and all of a sudden you end up either in the foramen on the other side or the canal. Uh, I've experimented a lot. As you can see, this is a very uh, industry agnostic presentation. Pretty much every single company is represented here for the retractor that I've tried to use and optimize in my approaches. I found uh, something that keeps the bulk of the retractor away from the incision with radio-loosened blades. Uh, and of course, versatility with the blades themselves helps a lot with these approaches. And as, you, as I've now been doing more and more, I realized anatomy is not always the same. Of course, simple realization, right? But it's an uh, unpractical kind of approach. You start doing, you think a uh, patient's super skinny, it's gonna be a chip shot, you get in there, and you can see the vessels are just not amenable to opening up in that 5-1 space. In this particular case, you can see the um, uh, left common iliac vein is traversing right across the disc space and was not really mobile. So I elected to go between the artery and the vein. So having that versatility again helps. And I've used the articulating cage, which I've mentioned earlier, uh, an advantage to a lateral a lift an articulating cage in this uh, case specifically allows you to have a smaller window of access. You don't need to expose as much. You don't need to have that full left to right um, annular um, uh, approach. A small window performing the discectomy distraction allows to open up the space and place a still pretty large graft within the disc space, maintaining all of the benefits of that approach. High sacral slope, uh, traditional a lift access may be difficult if that pubic symphysis isn't in a way. Having angled instruments, like in this case, uh, with a high sacral slope patient, still allows you to access and perform the adequate decompression, height restoration, and grass placement. So now I have shown that really the uh, access to the full lumbar sacral spine is important if you want to achieve, if you want to, as Dr. Pimenta said, if you only do the top two levels, you're not a lateral surgeon, of course. It's a very dogmatic sentence, but it, there is benefit to lateral approach, and we want to maintain that benefit across all levels. Otherwise, this, the spine construct is going to be as strong at its weakest point, right? Uh, coming on to next, right? So now let's say you're comfortable with doing laterals, but the time for surgery is still long. Do you stage it over several days? Do you just toughen it out and do a 10 hour procedure? Or can we combine the stages, which has been mentioned already today, with a single stage, simultaneous uh, kind of a surgery being performed? And it's just a quick blocks demonstrating, right? That flip, you eliminate the flip, and further you can overlap the two steps. On the pictures you can see how uh, the teams are working pretty much. You can see on the bottom right, there's a direct lateral, an oblique to five one, and the screws being placed all at the same time. Um, hopefully saving a lot of time. And time is important, especially nowadays, right, with all the uh, staffing issues, OR space issues, now uh, the crackdown on the double rooms. It's gonna get tougher and tougher to perform bigger surgeries because you have a line of patients that need to be operated on. So do you do a 10-hour surgery or three three-hour surgeries, right? It makes a difference. Uh, I trained at University of Miami. I did my infolded fellowship at University of Miami with Dr. Wang, Dr. Levy, Dr. Green. So I am as inbred as it gets with spine surgery, right? And I started as faculty at University of Miami three years ago. Coming in, I have never seen a single stage surgery done or performed, but I felt like this is what we need to be doing. So I had to develop it slowly. And of course, I had a lot of support from my uh, senior faculty, even though they have never done it. But I was very grateful that they were able to allow me to push for it. I started simple, single level um, procedure that, you know, usually that 
is not a problem. Lateral position or T lift, uh, any of those surgeries would have been okay for the surgery. And we've placed lateral screws in lateral, uh, screws in lateral um, by using fluoroscopy initially. And that just proved that having that extra bulk of equipment gets in the way. You have to fight between the screwdriver handles, you can see on the bottom left picture, an actual line of sight, you're not looking at the patient. Doable, but cumbersome. For the next kind of a period, we're like, okay, so how can we make that better? And that's when we start using the navigation techniques, and that made things easier. We can see the anatomy better. Uh, as long as you set up the navigation properly, with all the right steps before you start operating, uh, it, the system should work. And it's always the humans that make the mistakes, right? The machines work, the machines do what they're programmed to do. So it, it is important to keep all those preliminary steps in order. And I like Dr. Pham's notes about soft touch, right? You don't want to change things a lot too much. But doing the uh, navigated now allows me to uh, um, kind of come on the other side, do the interior to source approach as my residents can follow the navigated trajectories. So we did that for a while, but then again, something's not right. Using the navigation in lateral, yes, doable, but requires a lot of still sweating, a lot of work. What, what else can be done? And that line of sight is a way, uh, which was bothering me the whole time. So the next phase, we were using heads-up display with augmented reality, overlaid images, to be able to see the anatomy at the same time as you put the screws. You're in lateral, you're already off by 90 degrees. Your hand-eye coordination is completely different. And you know, having turning your head all the time back and forth kind of confuses you even more. In the academic environment where residents switch, the rotations come on a monthly, every other four month, whatever, the level of uh, skill changes all the time. So how can we make that more uniform? So we tried to do that and made things a lot easier, but still using the navigation system, you still rely on the technique, on the skill of whoever's doing that particular uh, instrumentation. There's variability. And then you can see on the post-up, you know, uh, uh, patient did well and slowly recovered. There was a long recovery, the 5-1. At that time, I was still avoiding doing 5-1. I was not comfortable. It took me some time to get comfortable. Um, but eventually, that's how we got to a robotic phase, right? We've learned, okay, we're using navigation, even though with the heads-up display, we don't have to look away. But still, a new patient, a new person comes in, starts putting the screws in, and they bump something, they get off, and it's like learning curve every time. Bringing the robot in allows you to even further level out the playing field. Uh, let's see. You can see on the bottom, uh, on, on the left, as I'm doing my exposure, a PGY-5, uh, they had just come on the rotation, able to follow the robotic arm. And now that screw placement, while still requiring a lot of consideration and taking care of the positioning and structures, becomes much more streamlined. And just a little more pictures, and uh, we use Excelsius in our practice. You can see it's a little bit different. We saw Mazor systems earlier. They all do the same thing, they allow you to follow the predetermined trajectory and hopefully stay within it, not deviate. So now with the uh, robot in place, I feel at ease. I, I can slowly concentrate on uh, doing the exposures at whatever levels we're looking at uh, while the screws are being done. And the workflow usually, we position the patient, place the navigation array, do the O-arm spin, and start the robotics part with screws starting from the top level towards uh, the pelvis where the array is. And as the screws are being done, I perform the exposures. At, if I have two incisions or three incisions, I just get down to the spine and, and leave a, a lap in there without mobilizing anything. Once the screws are done, x-ray comes in and now we can perform discectomies and placement of the cages. So, um, as of now, uh, all of these cases are being prospectively collected, and of course it's ongoing and we need to have longer data for the um, uh, better outcome measures and more of a uh, data on adjacent level disease, proximal junctional kyphosis, whether or not that original hypothesis that restoring the anterior column height only without doing osteotomies brings patient's anatomy closer to the original alignment uh, and therefore alleviates the added forces that sometimes we add with surgery by hyperlar dosing or underlar dosing. And hopefully, we'll see. We'll see in the future if that will be the case. So far, 33 cases collected, 77 total levels, and 20 of them at 5'1". 186 pedicle screws in the lateral position, with three of them 
obviously that once we do the x-ray, like, no, we gotta change that. And we would exchange it right away. Even though no neural monitoring changes and no neurologic sequelae were noted. Of course, the breach analysis is gonna be completely different. It's not gonna be three out of 186. There's gonna be a lot more uh, screws that are breached, like at the top right picture, you can see the top screw. It's definitely having a superior breach, but some of it is acceptable, I think. If the purchase is good, I think going after it and trying to make it look perfect for the x-ray may actually compromise uh, the actual construct. Complication, and I think this is the most important part. Uh, I think it's uh, in a way dangerous when someone starts quoting a uh, low complication rates from meta-analysis, 1%, 0.8%. People coming in feel like, oh, it's a safe procedure to do, and then you start doing the surgery to get at the 30% complication rate. Are you a bad surgeon? Is this a learning curve? We, you know, when, what do you do about it, right? Two choices, you can continue getting better, or three choices, I guess. Continue getting better, reduce the complication rate. You can, um, stop doing the procedure because you're just like, oh my God, everybody has a 1% and I have 30, probably I shouldn't be doing it. Or you, know, you can under-report probably, which is what happens a lot of time, right? So you have to take all these numbers with a grain of salt. As you can see in the complication here, uh, so far four venous injury uh, during the surgery where venous blood starts pulling and all of them were controlled with just pressure with uh, fibrillar and not requiring any uh, major reconstruction. In one case, I had to abandon placing a, a cage because uh, I felt like I couldn't get a good control without pressure, so I just let it sit and once it was all stable, not bleeding anymore, I exited. Um, one post-op cystic collection, which uh, originally I thought maybe it was a hematoma, but then getting in, it was a bright yellow fluid, which I sent together with a UA. Slight difference in numbers, not completely together as if you know we had a ureteral active injury, but the color of that fluid was very suspicious for that. We had urology on board, they we did all the studies, could not really find that uterine injury, but I feel like it was probably maybe something that was transient, collected, and then occluded, and we were dealing with it. So a real uh, uh, something consideration. Um, ipsilateral leg swelling, right? I've had one in this series of 33 cases. I think there's a different series that we have where we use a single stage lateral with plates and I feel like in those cases there's a lot more patients coming in with that uh, ipsilateral leg swelling, probably related to sympathetics, which uh, remains to be further determined. And also interesting ones, uh, the approaches are left-sided, but I've had several patients that come up and wake up with the right-sided um, Def, uh, or neurological symptom. In one case that was shown earlier, quadricep weakness with no neurological, with no uh, neuromonitoric changes. Uh, one right foot drop, which I believe probably was from the oblique angulation of the cage and trying to get too aggressive on the contralateral annulus. Uh, and then three patients that are, surgery went well, no indication of any problems. They wake up and they say they have intractable pain on the right side along the L5 distribution. All three had the L5S1 done in oblique fashion. And again, I think this is where a DRG sensitivity comes into place, probably being too aggressive, uh, maybe as a root malleting or even passing the instruments to the other side. So far, recording and thinking about it and trying to reflect on it, right? We'll see what the total numbers, how they look, but they're, the complication, I believe, are always the most important part of any new approach that we're trying to teach to others and trying to make it more popularized. So in conclusion, uh, as I believe, anterior column height restoration in itself allows for a lot of good MIS techniques and good um, biomechanical outcomes on the patient. Lateral and oblique approaches, uh, theoretically, right, provide the low morbidity axis being the only thing that's cut is skin, as we've mentioned, right? Going intramuscular between the muscle fibers, not really cutting anything else allows you to have that lower morbidity. That's granted if nothing else happens. And knowing all levels and being able to access all levels in the lateral is important to really benefit from the full power of lateral and oblique approaches. Of course, screws in lateral control multiple times it's feasible. Robotics make it easier as I've shown it too. And keeping that in mind, hopefully over time, as the technique gets better, the invasiveness, the total invasiveness, depending on the time, the amount of exposure needed, and what's done to the patient will keep getting better and better and better. My email is at the bottom. Looking for collaborators, multi-center studies, please reach out, we'll work on it together, make it better. Thank you. <laughs> uh, great talk, Timur, and I, I think a very, um, actually, I, I think an honest representation of your experience with uh, single position lateral. I, I think um, one of the uh, problems with a lot of these presentations that we give, I'll stay right here, Timur, is I, I think we try to, 
you know, give optimal results. You know, we're trying to drive home a point that uh, procedure has uh, its advantages, but we, we kind of shy away from disadvantages. Uh, on the last one, we saw the uh, ALL um, uh, uh, injury kind of problem. And I think uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, he gave a really good sort of, uh, and I think a realistic um, illustration of the potential complications of single position surgery, particularly at L5S1. Um, I um, have also uh, done procedures uh, laterally at five one, and I find it challenging. I, I think it's not as easy as people uh, outline, and there's definitely some pros and cons to it. Uh, the vascular issue is uh, a big one. Uh, particularly if you're doing your own approach. And um, I understand, Tim, you do your own approach? Okay. Yes, yeah, I do Yeah, so I, I think um, I, it's, it's an area where if you have a vascular problem, it could be uh, potentially life-threatening. And uh, so I wanted to ask you about these vascular uh, bleeding issues. Uh, did it come from retraction uh, when you were putting your instrumentations in and out? And I know you addressed it with just pressure, but what would have happened if it was more pronounced than that? Now, how comfortable do you feel with closing a, ve a venous injury primarily? A great question. As I mentioned, it took me some time to build up some confidence doing my own approaches. Uh, we have a great approach surgeon in South Florida, and I've taken upon myself anytime we did an A-lift. He, he hadn't done any obliques, but anytime we do an A-lift approach, I would treat it as a mini fellowship. I'd follow his steps, I'd do the things, and I'd learn the anatomy. And then I would go over a multitude of cadaver labs of getting further comfort level. You know, if anytime we have a lateral cadaver lab, as people work on direct laterals, I just sneak in and always do the oblique approach, visualize anatomy. As I learned that, you know, getting down to that disc space, uh, respecting the vessels, um, and kind of anticipating where the vessels could be, I became more and more comfortable. And the most important thing, who should be doing the approach, right? Should I be doing the approach or the vascular surgeon? I think whoever is ready to deal with the complication should be doing the approach. And, and you think of a worst complication that can happen, which is a large vascular injury uh, and less so large arterial injury. I think that's the most devastating event that can happen. And you shouldn't approach it like, I, I wish it never happens to me and I hope it never happens to me. No, every case I start, every day I wake up and I know I have a case coming up with 5-1, I think it's today's the day I'm gonna kill somebody by letting them bleed out. So I anticipate that from the beginning. That's just a general mindset, right? And I know I only started doing it when I felt that, yes, I can suture the vessel, I've learned that, I can control the vessel, I, and you know, and there's there's a stepwise progression of how the, ble the bleedings are dealt with. Uh, so far I've been lucky enough that all the, the, um, the venous pooling that I saw was very low volume very easy to control with just by putting a, a Yankara suction while you get the um, uh, fibrillar or surge cell snow and you start slowly packing around the vessel, slowly releasing the pressure or adding more of that uh, fibrillar material. And I would tampon that enough where I did not have to put an actual stitch on the, uh, uh, on the common iliac. But we always have a 5-0 proline with a pledget available if we have to put it together. Large vascular clips, you know, all kind of, there is a protocol that my scrub tech knows on the back table, it's all there and ready within seconds. It's a, a great point, but uh, an important one. I, I think uh, now that I think surgeons are becoming more comfortable with anterior approaches, you need to be able to address the complications. And I, I think that was a very good you know, explanation of how you became comfortable doing it. Uh, I also think it's regionalized. You know, in my institution, if, if you're doing an anterior approach, you're not, uh, at least having an anterior um, or general surgeon or vascular surgeon on standby, um, it'd be a real issue. So I, I do think there's some regional implications of doing your own approaches. I know a lot of surgeons who do them and are very good at it, uh, but those are things that if you're gonna embark on, on doing anterior approaches, you need to really settle where, where you're practicing. And I would say, you know, and it's an old adage, you know, complications are like death and taxes. They're gonna occur if you do enough surgery. So you need to be able to address it. And, and that's a very good point and very good presentation, Timur, appreciate it. And so uh, we're gonna uh, move along and Isidore Lieberman is, um, in many ways, a pioneer when it comes to robotic surgery. I think he's one of the first surgeons uh, to uh, embark on robotics. I think he did one of the initial papers looking at feasibility studies, and I actually um, uh, quote him, uh, actually, I think it was a uh, paper from 2006. Uh, he had a couple on robotics, and um, really a harbinger to where we are now. And so he's gonna give uh, his uh, presentation robotic MIS deformity surgery. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, 
honored to be involved in the, the session. And as always, uh, Seattle Science is doing just a, a fantastic job with it. The talks today have been really, really good. So I am going to share with you some of my uh, insights into robotics and into MIS surgery. I, I've been at this for well over 30 years now and multiple aspects of uh, robotics as well as multiple aspects of MIS surgery. Although today my practice is kind of refined to uh, revision. 70% of what I do is revision surgery, unfortunately, and revision deformity surgery. So I'm going to show you some of the little uh, tricks that I've been uh, working on over the years. Uh, in the spirit of disclosures, I do have uh, relationships with each one of these companies here. Uh, some of them are uh, robotics companies, as you can see. Uh, I was one of the inventors, patent holders, um, conceptual designers of the Mazor uh, robot early on in, in 2000. That's when we started that project, although I'm no longer affiliated with that, that project. Yeah, the interesting thing is we are all sitting here talking about MIS surgery as, as if it's something that we dreamed up today, something that's, that's sort of brand new. But in fact, the first recorded minimally invasive surgery was in the age ancient Egypt transcripts from Ramses II. And this is a statue of Ramses II in, uh, in the middle of the desert in Egypt in Memphis. And if you look closely, you can see just inferior to the umbilicus, there's this scar that the sculptor put in there. And as history recorded, Ramses II had his gallbladder drained in a minimally invasive fashion, just through a puncture wound. Now that's a long route to the gallbladder from underneath there. So I kind of wonder exactly what went on, but minimally invasive surgery is not something new. This has been around for hundreds and thousands of years. In the 1800s, this is what an operating room looked like. Very, very different than what we do today. And here's what we were doing 15 and 20 years ago for a lot of our spine surgery stabilization. And by no stretch of the imagination is this good. We know that all the collateral tissue dissection damage causes harm. So we, we've learned and what we've done is we've taken the tools that we have, we've recognized the anatomy and we've been able to focus down and being able to target the pathology. So minimally invasive surgery is not one item. It's not one robot. It's not one technique. It's not just perk screws or single position laterals. It's a philosophy of targeting the pathology in the least invasive, most appropriate fashion. And right now as spine surgeons, we're privileged. We have all these tools on the shelf right now and what we need to do is figure out how to use them appropriately, how to take advantage of them for the various pathologies that we treat and the various patients that we treat. Because we all know that every patient is a little bit different. So here's sort of the synopsis of targeting the intervention to the pathological tissue with little or no collateral tissue damage. And this is, was my learning over 30 years, essentially, where we went from fluoroscopic guided percutaneous techniques with biopsies and vertebral augmentations to laparoscopic endoscopic techniques, and then going to mini open type techniques. And now we've added all these different new tools. But we have to remember that spine surgery is about control. We don't wanna ever be in this kind of position where we have lost complete control. You know that this is not gonna end up good. And in spine surgery, we tend to measure with a micrometer, but then we pull out a chainsaw and make our cuts with chainsaws. So this is where robotics now has helped us. It's helped us become more precise and more efficient. And these are the minimally invasive spine procedures that we can now do, decompressions, discectomies, vertebral augmentations. But with respect to the robotics, 
We're now doing percutaneous fixation, be it pedicle screws, facet screws, cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine. We can do our fusions with our anterior, transfer aminals, direct lateral, again, using the enabling technologies to get us where we need to be, minimizing the collateral tissue damage. Now, the single most important lesson that I've learned over the years is the value of preoperative planning coming to the operating room prepared. If you were about to build a house, you would not let that contractor build the house unless you saw the plans, the bill of materials, and you had a budget. They've got to come prepared. Likewise, if you're going on a plane, are you going to get on that airplane if the pilot doesn't know how much fuel he has on board, what the payload is, how the weather is up ahead? you need to have the preoperative planning. And this is where we've been deficient. And now I think we're all starting to realize the value of this and the new technologies that we have is allowing us to preoperatively plan appropriately. So one of the um, criteria, the parameters for this talk was supposed to be accuracy of robotics for MIS surgery. And I really don't wanna spend much time with this. Uh, because we all know it's accurate. There's dozens and dozens of papers showing that the accuracy rates of screw placement are well over 98%. And yeah, so we can get to 99%. Yeah, that's better than 98%, but we're still pretty, pretty good with robotics for MIS surgery in terms of accuracy. But again, just to emphasize the robotics has allowed us to preoperatively plan better, to facilitate these MIS procedures, to reduce the X-ray exposure, and ultimately reduce revisions. So this was the second parameter for this talk. Of what are the risks of robotic MIS deformity surgery? And as I broke this down, I broke down into three things. Fusion, obtaining correction, and maintaining your fixation. So these are the things, and as I mentioned earlier, 70% of my surgeries now are revision surgeries. And these are the three issues that I see most commonly. Pseudarthrosis, lack of correction, and, and terrible fixation that's completely fallen apart. So this is where I embarked on percutaneous facet screw or facet fusions using the robotics. And this is a case, this is a 68 year young male. And you can see here, multi-level degeneration, an L4-5 spondy, end stage generation at 5-1. Here's his MRI scan. You can see what's going on. This is a dime a dozen. We see these patients every single day and we wanna do something in the least invasive fashion for him. So here's my preoperative plan, coming to the operating room prepared, percutaneous, posterior instrumentation. But if you look here, you can see these areas where I am drilling out the facet joint in a percutaneous fashion and then stuffing the facet joints with bone graft to facilitate that posterior fusion. And here's what it would look like intraoperatively. I've got my screws in place. I've got the drill down through the facet joint. I've already got my cage in place for him. And then here's his three week picture, but here is his one year follow up. And you can see how we've been able to fuse the facet joint on both sides in a percutaneous fashion, in a minimally invasive fashion. And I've got good anterior column, good restoration of lordosis, indirect decompression, all the things that we have talked about. So we've now analyzed 53 of these patients that I've operated on. Again, it's a typical cohort, uh, mid age somewhere around 57, body mass index around 30-ish. Uh, the diagnoses, spondies, degenerative discs, scolies, post-laminectomy syndromes, adjacent segment issues, and metastatic tumors. But here you can see 55% of these people had prior lumbar surgery in this group. So again, a, a heavy revision group. And you can see here the levels that I operated on, um, one level fusions in 24, two level fusions in 19, as we're going through it. And here's the surgical data, minimal, and this is all MIS stuff that we all already know. 
uh, very little blood loss in, in total. Uh, some of these 18 were staged, uh, 35 of them were done the same day as well. And then here were the complications that we had. We had one intraoperative minor surgery where one of the screws just didn't go in the right spot. So we had to revise that one. Um, a screw loosing for a pseudarthrosis later on, um, superamp plate compression fracture in, in one patient. And then we had a couple neurological type radiculopathy things that sort of resolved. And then some wound issues, two were at anterior lateral, and one was, was posterior. But again, a very typical cohort of patients. The length of follow-up was um, well over a year in, in this group of patients. And then here is the combined uh, pre-op VAS and ODI, which is, it's an interesting score, but it's, it's really um, just more of a guide than anything. But these patients did do better. But the important thing is, is getting the fusion, doing that in a minimally invasive fashion, so that when we are doing something, we are achieving the same outcome. So the second thing was obtaining the corrections that, that we see. And this is a work that we did with the utility of the preoperative planning for robotic guidance to gain the corrections that we wanted to get. And again, highlighting the importance of the preoperative planning and taking advantage of the robotics to obtain these corrections by placing the screws exactly where we want them to be placed. So this is a typical, this is a 16 year young male with an adolescent curve. Uh, here again is my preoperative plan. And I typically do plan multiple levels above and below my intended fusion levels. If I run into a problem, I've already got it planned ahead of time. So I've got my plan A, my plan B and my plan C. And here I am working through using the preoperative planning software to define the correction that I want. So I see where he lies now. I see where he is with the hardware in place. This is him in the coronal planes. We can see the extent of the curves. And then I start to rebuild his spine in a virtual environment. And I try to achieve a perfectly straight spine with all the parameters that we want. So I'm trying to take him down to zero in his thoracic curve and lumbar curve. And then if we look on the left side, you can see the thoracic curve. I'm not quite happy with that. I want to give him a little more kyphosis. So I build in a little more kyphosis into it. And likewise, build in a little more lumbar lordosis into it to try to achieve the optimal correction. So here he is. This is what we started with. You can see what I planned and what I ended up with. And by placing the screws where they need to be placed, by contouring the rod in the way that we need to contour it, we're able to achieve those corrections. So we collected all the data prospectively. This has now been, been published, actually. Uh, this is the first group of 28 patients of which 15 were scolies, five were kyphotic patients, a couple spondies and adjacent segment deterioration patients. And here's the table with all the various parameters that we went through. And here you can see what we were able to achieve. So preoperatively, the coronal cobs measured somewhere between 27 and 30 degrees. Uh, we planned to get them as close as we can to zero. And postoperatively, I ended up with about seven degrees of coronal angulation on the various cobs. In the sagittal plane, preoperatively, there were 20. Uh, most of them, we want to increase the kyphotic angle. So it comes up to 26. And the post-op was about 25. So if you look at it, the accuracy of planning and the execution of robotics allowed me to get within seven degrees of my coronal cob angles and within 10 degrees, say, of my sagittal cob angles. Now, you can say, well, that's, that's not good enough yet. And yeah, it's not, but we're getting better. We're understanding more. Now I'm understanding more how I can achieve those corrections in a less invasive fashion. And one of the things that I'm still very, very uh, concerned about, particularly with our deformity surgery, is the lack of ability to distract, to derotate, and to uh, compress with the current instruments that we have. 
And there are things coming out and I know we're going to be doing much better with it. So stay tuned. Uh, two years from now, hopefully I'll be able to show even better numbers than this with respect to our corrections and achieving those corrections. So our work showed that we can get within seven degrees of the coronal plane and 10 degrees of the sagittal plane, but stay tuned because we are going to get a lot better. Now, this is what I feel really does matter. And for those of you who, who know me, you know that at Texas Back Institute, we have a gate lab. And I can't give a talk today without giving reference to the team and the gate lab and some of the work that we've been doing there, because it's just fascinating to me to, to see the numbers that we get. But it's really the patient objective functional outcome. And this is a great example that I like to show a 56 year young female with this degenerative spine who uh, presented to me with tremendous back pain, really a lot of difficulty with her day-to-day -day activities, uh, ridiculous symptoms, as well as numbness in the right lower extremity. We also send a TBI, send our patients for pre-psych evaluations. And this was really, really important. If you look at her pre-psych evaluations, the patient believes that she cannot be helped. She broods and ruminates about her problems. She has an elevated sensitivity to pain and feelings of helplessness, but the psychologist felt that her psych issues were not so intense that surgery should be avoided, but that we should counsel her even more and get her through with these functional gains. So you can see what, what we started off with a degenerative scoli, someone who's got some psych issues. Again, here's my preoperative plan, trying to get her going. This was a staged procedure. So I did anterior interbody fusions first. In between the anterior interbody fusions, I look at their alignment and then assess the extent of my posterior procedure for her. Here is the pre-op, uh, the intraop just before we did the, the screws. Here is intraoperatively. You can see we've got all the screws and we've got her correction in place. And then here's her pre-op and one year post-op x-rays. And really good alignment. I'm happy. The whole team's high-fiving themselves. We achieved our goals. But this is the patient's functional outcome measures, or sorry, her patient reported outcome measures. Here's her VAS. I got her from seven to six. Here's her ODI. You can see she's 58, 58 at one year. And she does not like me. She does not think I really helped her. But then we take her into the gate lab and this is her pre-op analysis. And you can see her posture. You can see what she looks like there. Here's her 12 months. Right off the bat, you can see she's standing more balanced. She's walking better. But here we've got all her numbers. So you can see her cadence is much improved. You can see her stride time is much improved. Her walking speed is much improved. You can see her stride length and single support time. Every parameter has been improved. But one of the more important parameters is her overall balance. And you can see how we measure balance on a force plate with this cone and the center of gravity. The red line that you see down here is the center of gravity wobbling back and forth. And you can see how at one year post-op, she is now balanced again. So I show her these results and all of a sudden her attitude changes. She now sees visually that she is functioning better. And this ties into her psych history and everything that's going on. So she's done really, really well. But here is how we were able to take advantage of the minimally invasive tools that we have, the robotics that we have, and using the gait analysis as well as the psych eval to optimize the patient's outcome. So please remember that robotics and navigation are not gonna make a bad surgeon good. What it does is they will make a good surgeon more efficient and more precise. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and would ha be happy to address any of the questions. Izzy, thanks. That was a wonderful talk on uh, sort of the evolution of robotics from your standpoint. Uh, and, um, I, you know, it's interesting, you know, um, and this is maybe a bit of an aside, but, you know, PROMS now, PROS are, are considered really the gold standard, and uh, there's so many limitations. You know, if, if you measure 
uh, say an ODI uh, on a patient and they're having a bad day, I would argue that they would answer poorly compared to maybe the day before when they you know, were happy for one reason or another. And it's a major limitation on, it, uh, on, uh, on pros, but yeah, right now that's a standard. And I think you showed very clearly in you know, your gait analysis testing that objectively, you know, by objective measures, patients a lot better. And uh, you know, the, the subjective component of it from the patient's perspective is a real thing. And so I, I, I don't know you know, what can be done for the future, like people are looking at like, you know, not your, you know, your gay lab's great, but it's, I, I think a little bit challenging to generalize that to like, say, my practice. Um, so people are looking at like, you know, measuring steps, for example, you, using your smartphone. I mean, do you think that's a viable um, alternative or, or what, what are your thoughts? <laughs> So you, you bring up a gate point. Yeah, not everybody can have a gate lab. And quite frankly, our gate lab was established eight years ago, and it's already primitive. It's, it's not even state of the art anymore. And state of the art today are the IMUs, the inertial modular units that, that we have that are in your cell phones that we can strap to patients um, and actually measure it. Uh, I have no doubt that the patient reported outcome measures have misguided us over the years. Uh, we've relied too heavily on them. And if you sit in my waiting room for 15 minutes, you'll see we give all our patients a tablet and grandma looks at the tablet, can't figure out how to enter her ODI. So she hands it to her granddaughter and her granddaughter then spends the next 15 minutes while they're waiting to see me figuring out how they can surf the internet on the TBI tablet. And, and we have this document because we can see what, what they're doing on it. It's very interesting. So patient reported outcome measures are not the answer. Functional outcome measures are the answer. And IMUs are the next step where we're gonna be able to do that. And there, there's um, different devices you can put in your shoes, you can put on your wrist, you can strap with um, little tapes onto your shoulder and be at the cervical thoracic junction. And we're getting tremendous information that's state of the art, more than what I showed you in this talk. Great, great. Thank you very much, Izzy. Um, any questions? Yeah, Timur has a question for you. Dr. Lieberman, thank you so much for sharing that amazing data. Uh, question, you and other presenters today have discussed the um, uh, convenience of using that preoperative planning software that comes with a robotic system and showing amazing cases how your preoperative plan matches your outcome. In the cases where it hadn't really helped you or you've had some issues and you couldn't achieve what you've plan for, what are the usual problems that you face? So th there's, um, there's a whole list of those things. The biggest issue is obtaining the registration in someone who's osteoporotic and obese, or someone who has curves that are ranging over 80 to 90 degrees. That's where I'm finding a lot of problems. And as a surgeon, you always have to have your plan A and your plan B and plan C. You always have to have your bailout. So there's a bailout. If you can't get the registration, you can't get things in the right place. The second big issue is the revisions that I'm doing. Very often, the spines have uh, large, wallowed out pedicle screw tracts, and I'm trying to find creative ways to drill across a pedicle screw tract. And as the drill is advancing, it deviates or skives off some of the cortical bone in the pedicle screw tract itself. So those are the other problems. And again, at that point, you just have to be creative in how to figure out how to, how to do it. Uh, occasionally, um, again, dealing with the osteoporotic bones, the problems that I've had has been when I'm going for my correction, I've got the screws placed well enough, but I'm putting too much force on it and I'm pulling out the screws. So I have become a very, very liberal cement augmenter of screws. And I'll augment the screws at the upper instrumented vertebrae. I'll augment the screws at the apex of the curve. And less commonly, I'm augmenting the screws in S1 or in the ilium because I'm now using a lot more S1 S1 ailer iliac and S2 ailer iliac screws. I'm stacking screws to achieve my foundation. So those are the issues and those are just some of the, the, the tr tricks that I, I've evolved to to try to avoid those big issues. 
Okay. Th thanks, Izzy. Appreciate your awesome. presentation. En enjoy the day, everybody. Have fun with the rest of the talks. Great. Thanks. Um, so we're going to move on to our next cadaver demonstration, and you know it. it it's uh, it's an endoscopic uh, T lift, and uh, the the actual didactic presentations will follow. But uh, right now, Sama Kashlan is going to give uh, a good demonstration on uh, the technique for uh, utilizing an endoscope to do uh, uh, the workhorse operation that we've talked about, the T lift. Can you hear okay? All right, is this good now? Good. We're good, right? Okay, all right, awesome. Well, thank you all so much for the opportunity. Um, uh, so my name is Osama uh, Kashlin. I am at uh, University of Michigan now. I spent six months with Dr. Hofstetter last year as his fellow, uh, and you know, really learned all this uh, from him in addition to, to other people. And I'm sorry that you don't get to hear his uh, sweet Austrian accent or hear his dry humor um, in person. Uh, I think he's going to be talking about this virtually later. Uh, so looking forward to hearing from him. So he's going to talk about the kind of the didactic portion of doing an endoscopic T lift, the indications and all that stuff. Uh, just in a matter of time, I'm just going to go through the uh, technical aspect of it um, and leave all those, uh, you know, the questions about indications and all that stuff to the to the master. So I uh, started doing a little bit here just in a matter of time. So the most important thing when you're doing uh, anything endoscopic is that you have perfect x-rays. So uh, if you look at the x-rays that I have on there now, you want to have a perfect AP, you want to have a perfect lateral to the limits of obviously what you have. Um, so you want to boost, like rotate the patient so that you have the perfect AP where the, the spinous process is in the middle of both pedicles of the caudal level that you're working on. And in terms of the AP, you want to see a crisp uh, end plate on the inferior um, level that you're working on. So here we're doing a T lift at four five, um, and uh, I used a jam sheety to access this space. So, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. So again, you have to have a perfect AP, perfect lateral, and then you want to mark your midline on that perfect AP. So this line here in the middle of the uh, donor is the midline, um, and then what you want to do is measure out eight, ten, and twelve. Thank you, uh, eight, ten, and twelve. Uh, millimeters uh, from the midline. Uh, usually at L45, it's between 12 to 14 millimeters off the midline in terms of the approach uh, uh, distance. Uh, so as you can see, it's super lateral, um, but it all depends on the patient, depends on how large the patient is. But these are kind of landmarks, and that's why if you start your trajectory and you're way off of the numbers that you would expect for that level, then you just have to second guess yourself. Think about why am I very different from where I'm supposed to be. Uh, but really, the way that you know where to start your T lift, where you put your incision, is uh, you look at a lateral, once you have a perfect lateral, and then you start uh, from where, if you put an instrument on the dorsal aspect of the patient like this, you start from where this instrument is slightly deep to the spinous process line. So your starting point is always between the facets and the spinous process line on the lateral. People ask, okay, how do I know what angle I want to take? So if you're doing a transferaminal approach for a disc, it depends on where the disc is. If it is inferiorly migrated, you're going to be more inferiorly uh, pointing with your uh, approach angle. If it's superior, you're going to be pointing up. For a T-lift, you kind of want something that's neutral. So you draw a line from the center of the patient out towards whatever angle you want it to be on that perfect AP. Um, so you see this is kind of the line that we had here. It's a little sl slightly bent upwards like this, and this is what made it look perfect on an AP shot. And wherever that line bisects the point where on the lateral x-ray my instrument is slightly ventral to the spinous process line, that's the starting point for our approach. Um, and what you use is you could either use a spinal needle or use a jam sheety needle to access the foramen through that starting point. So again, the starting point is on the AP, AP, on a perfect AP is based on the angle of approach that you want to have and on the lateral where your instrument barely goes ventral to the spinous process line. So you make an incision there, usually it's about 12 millimeters because that's how big the cannula is going to be for these T-lift cages, they're 10 millimeters now, they're making one that's 12. Um, and you take the approach angle that you took to the foramen. This patient has a humongous foramen. So 
I was able to actually access the foramen right away without having to go through the superior articulating process of L5. In someone who has a very small a foramen, so they have a collapsed disc, they have a lot of ligamentous hypertrophy, we do what's called a trans-SAP approach, where you dock your uh, jam sheeting needle on the superior articulating process, and then you mallet it in to get to this final position. So regardless, this is the final position you want to be in. You want to be on the medial pedicle line on the perfect AP shot that you have. This one's not that perfect, but good enough. Um, and then on the lateral, you want to be slightly you want to be either at or slightly posterior to the, um, where the posterior vertebral bodies are. So this is a really good place to be uh, in the foramen. So uh, I put in the jam sheety. The next step here is to try not to dislodge myself um, and then put in a K wire in here. Um, so can you come in an AP, please? I'm going to put in my K wire. Um, and I should be, it should probably go into the disk space. I'm sure it is right now. And again, usually you want it to kind of bounce off and go into the epidural space, but since we're doing a telif here, I don't really care if it's going into the disc space or not. Okay, so we're kind of, so that's where we want to be. Uh, now, actually, can you come back to do a lateral? Just to see where we are. I'm curious to see how deep in the disc space we are with this K-wire. Okay, so we're actually, can you take another shot, please? Okay, so we might be bouncing off into the epi epidural space, which is great. Okay, so I'm going to push this in a little bit more. Uh, can you get a lateral shot here, please? Okay, great. All right, now can you do an AP again? Uh, and again, when I'm saying AP, it's not really AP like straight up and down. It's AP to this patient. So either you have to tilt the patient or tilt the uh, C-arm to give you that perfect AP shot where you have a good uh, end plate view. Okay, great. So we have enough of this K-wire in. So we want to make sure that we don't dislodge the K-wire and pull our... Um, jam sheety out. And then now what we want to do is... Osama, is that uh, a good position? Like, it doesn't look like it's entering the space. It's like skirting of... The so the thing is, is uh, what I th where I think it is, I think we don't have a perfect lateral. I tried to, like, uh, kind of boost the patient. Um, I think we're literally hitting the back of the disc and ricocheting off into the epidural space. Right, that's what it looks like. Is that okay for the endoscopic helix? Absolutely, yeah, it's completely fine. Yeah, I mean, again, if we, I, what I was saying earlier, I don't care if it goes into the disc or not in this situation. Uh, usually, for like, if I was doing a discectomy or, or like a microdiscectomy, I actually don't really want it to go into the disc too much. I want it to kind of ricochet off like this because the K wire is really just there to guide these next instruments. Um, so I think either way, if it went into the disc space here, it would have been okay. But the fact that it ricocheted off, it just tells me that we're in the ventral epidural space, or most likely in the ventral but epidural space, which is fine. Okay, so we have a series of dilating uh, working channels here. So, and these are, uh, starts out, they're color coded. Um, and what you want to do is that, x-ray please. You don't want to go further than the medial particular line in the lower lumbar spine. In the upper lumbar spine, because the thecal sac goes a little bit more lateral, you want to stop actually at the mid particular line. If you're doing this in the thoracic spine, you want to stop at the mid-particular line. But for a lower lumbar uh, issue, so x-ray, you want to stop kind of at the medial pedicle line there. And if you usually if you have a lateral recessed disc there, you can go to town because there's nothing there that you could hurt. That's actually where the disc is. So if we had a disc there, a lateral recessed disc, I we would be landing right on it there. Okay. Um, so now we'll get the second. So it's green, green. And then we got these... Um, these reamers. So the reamers are great. Uh, X-ray? X-ray? So I don't think we're going to have to ream too much because this foramen is so huge. X-ray? X-ray? Okay, but I'm still going to do it just for uh, teaching. So the, these reamers are sharp. When you rotate them clockwise, they uh, bite through bone. If you rotate them counterclockwise, it goes through soft tissue, uh, theoretically, atraumatically. So I'm doing that here. So I'm going to go rotate counterclockwise as I'm going through all the soft tissue until I get to the bone. So I'm on bone there. X-ray? Okay, so I'm feeling some bone there. And again, because, so for these T-lifts, you, you can make a decision. Do I want to go for completely indirect decompression or do I want to see the traversing route on this side and decompress that too? Depending on what you want to do, you can take as much or as little of the joint as you want and you make that process easier by using a reamer rather than using a drill. So if I want to take a lot of this joint off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give myself some downward pressure so that I can angle my instrument more uh, dorsal and inferior. So I can take as much of the superior articulating process and the superior aspect of the pedicle 
as possible. It just makes my frame and bigger. It makes me have to drill less when I go in there with the endoscope. So I'm veering this slightly inferior, or slightly um, deep, or no, it's not dorsal, and slightly inferior. And I'm just going to rotate this thing to go through the bone x-ray. And again, I just want to stop. X-ray. I want to stop at my medial pedicle line here because we're at four or five. <clears throat> X-ray. Because that's a little too far, right? So, um, OK, so can I have the pusher here? All right, so that's a little too far. In real life, I would have you know, taken more x-ray shots, obviously. So, um, so then I rotate this thing out. And this thing is a pusher. It keeps my uh, K-wire and everything uh, where it needs to be. Because I don't want to pull it all out and have to redo this again. OK. Yeah, so can you grab that there? Yeah, thank you so much. OK, perfect. And then we'll push these things down, because sometimes, even with all this, it gets pulled out. All right, um, so can I have the yellow? So then it's different sizes. So the, the green one goes first, and then yellow. So this is a yellow um, just dilator. X-ray, please. OK, so I need to push kind of everything in a little bit and pull this thing out a tiny bit. X-ray? 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 OK, all right, so then I'll push this thing in. X-ray? All right, so really, my yellow is already in there, but I'll still, this is just going to make our job easier in terms of the drilling. So this is the yellow reamer. It's larger, right? So green is smallest, yellow is middle size, and then there's a red that's huge. And this just makes your, you have to drill less. X-ray, please. OK, awesome. So again, I'm veering ventral, or sorry, dorsal and uh, inferior. So I could take as much of the SAP and X-ray. I felt like I sunk in. Yeah, there's really not much here that I'm... Okay, so can you hold on to this, please? Yeah, there's, I think the framing is just humongous. I don't think this person would have needed a tea lift in real life at this level. Okay, so I'm just rotating this thing out. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay, so now I'll get the uh, red dilator. Go ahead and you can put that on, please. Awesome. Okay. Kind of push that in there, and so you just feel how it like just feels like you're going through all these different planes. Okay, AP. Okay, cool. All right, so we're already there. Like I said, I mean, we're really not going to be uh, using this um, these reamers much at all in this patient because it's a humongous foramen. But again, if you wanted to get more of it, then I would just have to really crank on this um, more. Okay, so I'm on bone now, so. X-ray. 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 So as you can see, this is a lot of X-ray, obviously. So there are uh, navigation options. Uh, X-ray. Um, so that kind of minimizes some of the radiation. As you can see, we took a bunch of shots. X-ray. Okay, so that should be good. That's medial pedicle line. So if you can hold on to that, please. All right, so now we enlarge this foramen, probably just a little bit in this patient. But you can imagine if this was a tiny foramen, we just did a humongous foramen of foraminoplasty with all these steps that we did. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, can we? Uh, can you get an AP shot, please? Okay, cool. So our biggest dilator is in the medial pedicle line. I know the thing in front of it, the little thing went deeper, but it's okay. We might have a tiny durotomy, but we'll find out shortly. So now I'm putting in the working channel. So these working channels for the transforaminal scopes are angled. Um, so yeah, so they're angled. So you see there's like, um, they're angled like that so that you can use this as a retractor, right? So you can rotate this and use it as a retractor. Um, so you want to put it here into the foramen. And, you know, because we enlarge this foramen, the risk of damaging the exiting route here is smaller. And we also use, or we use neuromonitoring, too, to make sure that we don't injure the fore root as we're going in. Another thing that theoretically can help is that you want to put the blade on the inferior aspect of the foramen so that you could slide by the L4 root if it's at risk. But in this situation, the L4 root is so far cranial. Um, but obviously, that's something that you always want to check on your pre-op imaging. So I'm putting in the dilator. The, uh, kind of angled upwards because that means the shim is inferior x-ray. And I do that until you go into the foramen x-ray. And then I rotate it so that I could slide into the epidural space x-ray. 
So now I'm kind of pointed down and I'm where I want to be. Okay, so now can we do a lateral, please? So we'll see if we're uh, where we are on the lateral here. But we should be kind of on the ventral epidural space. And the fact that this, the working channel, I moved it down, it should be slid. Yeah, so that looks like it's in a good place there. So slid into the ventral epidural space. So that's a great starting point. So you're on the medial pedicle line on the posterior vertebral body line. And that's how you do a transforaminal discectomy. We're doing a telif here today. Um, but this is how you do a, 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 a what's it called? A, a discectomy. Okay, so now we'll get in. So now that we did all this part with image or radiology, now we're ready to bring in the endoscope. So thank you. And the first thing that you want to see when you're using the endoscope, so I'm going to angle this so I can look for the pedicle. Because once you see the pedicle, the anatomy makes a lot of sense. Um, so the first thing that I want to look for here is our pedicle. Okay, so I think there's some... Yeah, this is going to be like a, like a frat foam party here. We put this in a... It's going to be a lot of water on the ground. It'll be fun. Okay. All right, so this is, uh, we don't have the best visualization, but I think it's good enough. Okay, all right, so uh, may I have the, um, the bipolar, please? So the bipolar is the instrument that I say, like, you use the most in these approaches, honestly, um, because it's angled. So this over here actually is a great view. SAP is superior on my screen, so that's SAP going into the pedicles. This is a beautiful, beautiful uh, picture of the anatomy that we're looking for. Okay, so I'll take the bipolar and kind of scrape some of this soft tissue off. Oh, okay. Okay, and then the pedals here. So in terms of the pedal, there's a yellow pedal and the blue pedal. The, the yellow one is higher energy, so usually you don't want to use that when you're near nerves. Here, obviously, I'm just going to use the yellow one. And even in real life, you can kind of use the yellow one here because you're outside the pedicle, but I would be very cautious and have a low threshold to switching to the blue pedal. Okay, so I'm just taking, scraping the soft tissue off. So this is SAP right here. That's SAP. That's pedicle right here. This is foramen. This is a beautiful, uh, honestly, this has worked out better than I expected. So good stuff. Thank you for your training, Dr. Hofstetter, if you're still on there. Okay. Um, all right, so this is over here. So this is, uh, can you take an AP shot, please? So this over here, this should be right into the canal uh, on the medial aspect of the pedicle. So if you take an AP shot, and this should be literally hugging the inferior pedicle. Okay, perfect. And that's exactly where we thought we would be. Um, so at this point, you make a decision. Do I want to do an indirect decompression or a direct decompression? Just because of time. So I'm just going to go for indirect decompression. So, but if you wanted to go for a direct decompression, what you do is you would just literally drill some of this stuff off, take some of that. I mean, and literally, like that's going to be, after you take that fluffy stuff off, you're going to see the L5 nerve root, but we uh, just need to get done. Okay, so can I have, so now what I'm going to do, so let's say we assume we decompress the nerve root. Now we're going to switch to doing our T-lift. So um, may I have um, the, the, actually the, the, the K-wire, the thick K-wire? Okay, so what we want to do here is get this big K-wire and change our um, working channel from the, camera to the T-lift. So I'm just going to poke through here into the T-lift itself. Okay, let's see. There you go. So that's going into the disc. Uh, can you mallet this, please? So that's the disc right there. Okay. All right, can you get an x-ray, please? Okay, so we're in the disc there. So we're clearly in the disc. So now we're going to take all of this stuff out and switch this with the T-lift cannula. So this is really like doing a percutaneous T-lift with two benefits. First, that you visualize that there's no nerve root in your way. And the second benefit is if you wanted to do a direct decompression, you could. You would just have to drill some of that bone that's medial that I left behind. Okay, so now we switch out. So we have our K-wire in there. And then these are the dilators um, for getting our T-lift. So um, X-ray, please. Okay, so we're there. So now, can you come to a lateral, please? So this, we want to mallet it to be confident that we are within the annulus because you don't want any of your grafts, you don't want any problems to occur from your uh, being ducked to a ventral. 
Okay, so I'm going to mal so X-ray. I'm just going to angle a little bit in fear because I don't want to mess up the end plate. X-ray. Okay, so that's there. So I'm just going to mallet this in. X-ray. Okay, so now we're definitely in there. X-ray. Okay, cool. All right. So now what we could do is we dilate this thing. Sorry, is there a question or something? Okay, no, probably not. Okay. Okay, and the main thing, so now we switch from, so the first cannula is round. Now we go to one that is more square shaped because that's this is going to be what the cage goes through. So you want to make sure that you're not malleting this with the flat part going mediolaterally. You want it to be craniocaudally. Thank you. And now, honestly, we could take this K-wire out um, because we are definitely in there. And then that allows us to be able to mallet this thing a little bit easier. X-ray. So, okay, so this thing actually came out. X-ray. X-ray. Okay, so I think we pulled out where we were. X-ray. Okay, so that's not as good as it was, but X-ray. Let me find that hole again. X-ray. Okay, cool. All right, so now we'll mallet this thing in. Just again, got to make sure that our working channel is... X-ray. X-ray. Okay. X-ray. Okay, so that should be in there. So let's check on the X-ray again, please. Okay, so we're clearly in there. So now can we do a AP, please, just to be more confident that where we need to be? Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Let me hold it with something. Okay. X-ray. Okay, yeah, so we're in the right place there. All right, so can I have the next size up, please? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Oh, so how, how big is the working diameter of that? So this one here is 10 millimeters, uh, but they're working on uh, a 12 millimeter one. So you can put a 12 millimeter width cage. This one here is 10 millimeters. So that's what we could put in uh, for now, at least. X-ray. X-ray. OK, so we should be in there now. X-ray. Can we get a lateral, please? And then they're also working on a shorter one. Actually, I think they have a shorter one. That way you could check your end plate prep with an endoscope. So that's another thing that is an option as well. After you do your discectomy kind of blindly, percutaneously. X-ray. Okay. So now we're clearly in there. X-ray. Okay, so we're clearly in there. So now this is pretty much safe. We can let go of this and take everything out from the middle. And then there's a series of instruments that you could use for a discectomy. So I'm just going to do a, a kind of a crappy discectomy just in the matter of time. But anyway, so you have a drill thing first. Um, so you can go in. Well, Salma, like, it, yeah. this looks fine. for This This space is fairly tall. Yeah. But what if it was half the size? Could you, so that's a, great, that's a great question. So the thing is, is um, if it was collapsed like that, so I, I, I don't know if I talked about this or not. So you, you start out, or at least you potentially start out with by putting in screws first, either K-wire or... Um, headless screws. So you could use the pedicle screws to kind of distract a little bit. But if it's collapsed, uh, you're, you hope that the cannula that you put in, again, you started with a tiny round one, and then you expanded it. You hope that by that and um, di or, um, expanding with the pedicles that you made this a little bit open. Uh, if it's still collapsed or if you still, you know, you're bothered by this, there's a lot of other instruments here that are a lot more gentle than this. But I agree, this is super, super, super aggressive. And I'm not sure if I would use it in real life at all. I think I would just go straight with the other more uh, gentle instruments. X-ray. Okay, so I felt like I gave in there. X-ray. 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 So I think I'm super like directed laterally. Um, so can you do an AP? I think I'm probably already over to the other side. So there are two types of endoscopic T-lifts. There's a transcambin T-lift, which is what we're doing today. And then there's a posterolateral T-lift, which is more like the... Uh, the typical T-lift that we do, 
Um, that one you'd have to make another, you, you go in your pedicle screw incision and that's where you dock your channel. Um, but I feel like if you're going to do that, then might as well just do it microscopic. X-ray? 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 Okay, now come out to a lateral, please, again. Okay, so pretty much, I'm just going to show you a couple of instruments and then we're done, because you know how to put in a T-lift cage, obviously, and I know it's lunchtime now. Okay, so you can keep going, obviously, until you get to the X-ray. And this really just takes a bunch of crap out. Okay, I just poked through, so I'm going to come out. <laughs> okay, all right, so then there's a bunch of instruments. I'm just going to use a couple of them. So um, just to show you, they are, they like curve different ways. So you have, um, yeah, if you can showcase all of those, and I'm just going to use one, and then I think we'll call it a day. So you see this one goes downwards, this one goes upwards. I mean, honestly, I go ahead and... Yeah, perfect. So you see there's like side things, there's a, you know, multiple discectomy instruments that honestly I think are great to have even for a MIS case. Um, but, and all of these fit through the cannula. So you put this in here, you make sure you're past x-ray. You make sure you're past, I think I slipped out a little bit, x-ray. So one of the disadvantages is you're not visually looking at the disc space at all. No, you're not. So the thing is, is but once we have a shorter cannula, once you're done, you could go in with the endoscope and take a look. Okay. You know, so yeah, so you, I agree. Yeah, you're not doing this visually. This is, you're going completely percutaneously. Um, and then you look at it at the end, and you can use a drill to do whatever extra discectomy you need to do. So by the end of the case, you do have a really, really nice discectomy, actually. Um, so I think I slipped out a little bit. I'm just going to kind of go in a little bit. Okay. X-ray? Okay. But like popping the end plate to make sure it, it's clear, it's hard to do with this, right? You, no, absolutely, it's hard now, but you can later on uh, in, the, in the case, once you, I'm, let me use something else actually. Yeah, maybe let me use that one. This one's just a little bit harder to use. Oh, this is an expandable thing. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, but yeah, you look at it at the end and you have, uh, with a wor smaller working channel, obviously not this one. This one won't fit. Uh, the, the endoscope is too short for this cannula. Um, so this one here is a kind of an expanding shaver. So you could just x-ray. X-ray, 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 okay, X-ray, okay, so yeah, so you have all these disc prep stuff, X-ray, all right, so you have all this discectomy stuff, you do your discectomy, and then uh, do you have a cage? So this is what the cage looks like, it's a, no, is this a rise or a uh, sable? Okay, yeah, so this is a rise, this is an eight millimeter, um, but you know, again, with the working channel here, you can put in a 10, and with the new one, you'll be able to put in a 12. So you just put in the cage in there, expand it, um, and then that's how you do a T-lift. Great, uh, great, Osama. You know, a, one other quick question. Everything is within a straight line trajectory, so if you want to clear the disk space more in a straight line, you're going to have to move the, uh, the cannula, you know, around quite a bit. Is that correct? Or Sorry, say that again, Dr. Park? I mean, to do a better discectomy, because everything is in line with the, the cannula, you, you would have to so, change your trajectory of the cannula. So that's a great question. That's unfortunately the part that, that I didn't get to. But if you look at these instruments, they curve so many different areas. So yeah, you might have to go a little bit this way and that way. But really, the instruments are what help you with that. So this thing that I just put in right now is an expanding shaver that you can like just veer slightly medial, slightly lateral. And then all these instruments, they really, they uh, have an articulation that allows you to go either, uh, so see like it goes, this one goes this way, but you have stuff that goes the other way too. So even though your opening is small, you're able to do a pretty good discectomy. And again, at the end you go in and you look with your endoscope and you're able to tell, okay, there's no more cartilaginous end plate that's left behind. And if there is, then you have the, a, a very, like it's a fine drill to drill it off or to pick it off with a, with a pituitary. So, at the end of the day, you do have a good discectomy because you visualize it at the end, and then you put in your BMP, you put in your graft, and then you put in your cage, and then expand it. And then you put in the rods uh, where your pedicle screws are. But that's a great question, but I think with the, that's why this instrumentation for the discectomy is so crucial, because it allows you to really go all the way around. Okay, great, Osama. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to take a short Thank break. You, uh, as uh, Sama uh, will come to do the case presentations, so uh, probably about 10, 15 minute break, please.
Okay, uh, we're back now. So, uh, you know, Osama Kashlan is now going to give us some case presentations on spinal endoscopy. Um, and, uh, well, uh, I think we're ready. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. So, I have uh, three short cases to present. And the reason why I picked three is because those are three situations that I think uh, endoscopy is clearly better than what we're doing now. Um, a lot of things, it's just, it's an option. Um, so I have conflict of interest. I'm teaching faculty for JoyMax. And before I went into the cases, I wanted to talk about the types of spine endoscopy. There's uniportal versus biportal, so one port versus two ports. And there's full endoscopy, which is kind of what we did in the lab, versus endoscopic assisted, which is a tube with a camera uh, and or endoscope in it. And what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, the uniportal full endoscopic approach. So the first question that anybody asks themselves, including me when I first started uh, to learn this is, does this work for me? Is this gonna be something that is helpful to my practice? Um, it has a super steep learning curve. Um, it treats conditions mostly that we already have good solutions for. People have good um, outcomes overall in the long run. Um, and then, you know, does it, is it worth the decrease in productivity that I have initially? Is it worth, um, you know, potentially some outcomes that are not as good as you would do with a more traditional approach. Um, and then how am I gonna sell this to my hospital system? Or is this gonna be worth it for my private practice to buy this? So those are the things that everybody thinks about. But then you balance that out with the potential benefits, especially after kind of going through the, the, or still going through the learning curve, as what are the benefits of this? And there's a couple that I think it's clear cut. So for thoracic disc herniations, uh, this treatment I think is, you can even call it in a way revolutionary. Um, management of patients with very large BMI really helps out with that because what you're doing with the endoscope is you're taking your, your visualization to the level of the lesion. Um, the utilization of transfer MRI is something that we can't do with open or minimally invasive tubular surgery, has less tissue manipulation. Um, and um, the last thing is small incision size because like Dr. Anand says, the incision size is not MIS. MIS is kind of going through the areolar planes uh, and it's an approach to the spine. But the two things that are important is infection risk is almost zero because you have irrigation the entire time. And the irrigation also serves as a permanent retractor over all the dural elements. So it's not just like one retractor in one little area with dura pooching everywhere. It's a, it retracts all of the dura away, which is really awesome and it minimizes the, the risk of durotomies. There are two approaches to the endoscopic spine, interlaminar and transferaminal. Interlaminar is similar to what we do with a tube. Transferaminal is something that is difficult for us to do with a tube um, because you just need a way smaller working channel to fit in the frame and like, like we saw in the lab. Um, so the interlaminar approach can treat these conditions here and I'm not really gonna talk about these uh, much today. Um, the transferaminal is, is what I'm gonna discuss more because I do think that this is a more of a game changer in my opinion. And this is treated, or this is used to treat lumbar and thoracic disc herniations and isolated foraminal stenosis. Uh, we talked about Camden's triangle or Camden's prism. So with all that, I'm gonna go to my first case. So this is a patient that presented, uh, has multiple numerous comorbidities, presented with bilateral lower abdominal and leg paresthesias and problems with walking for a year. He was full strength, but clearly myelopathic on exam. And this is his scan. Showed a central disc herniation at T8, T9. He had a neurologic workup that ruled out any other cause to his symptoms and was actually referred to us by neurology for treatment of the central disc herniation. So how did, can we treat this? So we could treat this with a thoracotomy for a TA9 discectomy, possibly fuse at the same time. You could do a posterior lateral approach to reach around the cord uh, to do a discectomy and possible fusion. But another option that endoscopy adds is doing a transferaminal discectomy. Um, and in terms of, and that's what the route that, that, that we chose to take. So in terms of uh, management, important management thing. So this is mid thoracic spine. So uh, I did get IR marking to make sure that localization was easier in surgery. You position the patient prone in an Allen bow frame and neuromonitoring is used uh, to make sure that we don't have a cord injury uh, due to the cannula being uh, you know, in the canal. So in terms of uh, uh, the approach, it's very similar to what we just did in the lab. It's transferaminal approach. You dock on the SAP with a jam sheety needle. This in the thoracic spine, it's usually about eight millimeters off of the midline. It's right where the rib kind of starts curving forward. And then you march up into the rib and then you go into the costal uh, vertebral uh, area to dock in this area. 
Um, you take that in, and again, the starting point here is the middle of the pedicle uh, on the AP, and again, a perfect AP, and you're in the posterior vertebral body line on the lateral. You put your cannula in there, and this is a starting position, just like we saw in the lab. Um, during the case, we were able to get a really nice discectomy, got all of it out, saw the cord come down, and as you can see, this is a slide that shows how cranial you can go, how caudal you can go, and how across you can go. So we're across midline with this approach. You could do this bilaterally if you need to get something more on the other side. In terms of the post-op scan, it shows the uh, CT. Um, because he was admitted, I usually get CTs and MRIs on everybody for my education. And it shows the bony opening here through the SAP and through part of the facet, obviously, and part of the pedicle, but very, very small opening. And then this is the MRI post-op showing that the disc is completely gone um, with this approach. So this is something that we're able to do through a six millimeter incision in a guy who has multiple comorbidities, saved him from a bigger operation and saved him from potentially needing a fusion. So that's the first uh, case I wanted to present. The second one is the case of, or a situation where you have a recurrent disc. So this is a patient who I took care of yesterday, had a previous open left L45 microdiscectomy and came in with recurrent symptoms and a recurrent disc herniation, exhausted conservative measures and was a candidate for surgery. Um, had a little bit of foot uh, dorsiflexion weakness, but otherwise was intact. Uh, this, is, this is her MRI uh, demonstrating a, a far or lateral recess disc herniation, pretty large, and the CT there showing the previous bony opening. So what are the management options here? You could do a redo open microdiscectomy. You could do a redo tubular uh, microdiscectomy. You could say, you know what, I might need to take more of the facet joint than what is safe, and maybe we should just do a T-lift at the same time. And those are all very, very appropriate options. Or you could do a transforaminal discectomy because it minimizes the chance of you having to go through all the scar tissue because it's a fresh plane anterior to, uh, <clears throat> anterior to the thecal sac. Um, so that's the option that we went with, and this is a disc that got pulled out. This is uh, her. This is actually Dr. Hofstetter's app um, that follows. I know earlier we talked about following patients in terms of the, how many steps they take and how they're doing. So uh, I was able to bring the app back with me to Michigan, and this is what she said uh, this morning. So we'll see how she does until her next reherniation. But for now, she's happy, which is good. Uh, so again, this option was great. When I was in there yesterday, there definitely was so much scar on the dura. Uh, I think it was easier for me to get through it from the front and was able to get a humongous disc fragment out, as you can see here. Um, the last case is a large central disc in a patient uh, with a high BMI. So this is a 16-year-old female that presented with uh, left greater than right leg pain, neurologically intact, but really did everything, including injections and physical therapy. Uh, this is this, late, this is patient's MRI showing a large central disc herniation, and her BMI, I think she was like 50 or 60, something super, super uh, high. Um, so for a patient like this, what could we do? Um, we could do an open microdiscectomy. Maybe we have to go on both sides and take disc out from both sides, because as we, uh, you know, people that have done this before, pediatric disc is not one piece, it's multiple little chunks. So you might not be able to decompress all the way over to the other side. Um, you could do this either open or tubular, but another thing that you could do is a uh, transforaminal discectomy. The transforaminal route allows you to access, if you start lateral enough, to go all the way over to the other side, and that's what we decided to do. So this is an intraoperative picture showing the, how far the bipolar goes, really all the way over to the pedicle on the other side. Um, this patient got admitted because she's a pediatric patient uh, and went home the next day, so we did get an MRI, which was really good for learning, um, and it shows that the disc herniation is a lot smaller. Again, there's still a bulge there, but a lot smaller, and I bet you with time that probably all that post-operative change will make it recede even further, um, and this patient is doing phenomenal, thankfully. Um, and then the last thing is endoscopic T-lift, which uh, you know I put in here because one of the uh, one of the uh, criteria or one of the uh, things that I should that they wanted me to talk about here is endoscopic T-lift, but I'm going to leave that obviously to the uh, master and Dr. Hofstetter later. So those are kind of the procedures that I wanted to talk about. I talked about three cases that I think endoscopy helps uh, a lot with. Um, so obviously, I want to thank thank all the people that have taught me uh, this skill um, all around the world. Um, and in summary, I hope that you got out of this talk that spine endoscopy can be helpful to a spine surgeon. We talked about the two approaches, and we talked about three example cases where I think uh, endoscopy drastically changes uh, the management uh, from what we have uh, available currently. So thank you all so much. Okay, and I think, I don't know what's next. Okay, we're good? 
Oh, can I run? Okay, so it's, still, it's like way too much of, of me. I'm sick of myself now. Yeah, no, thanks, Osama. Those are great cases. And, you know, um, maybe before you go, like, course, I, uh, I guess a couple of questions. You know, the thoracic um, endos endoscopic case was actually a great one. I honestly think that has quite a bit or quite a number of advantages over what I, I would do in an opener procedure. Obviously, I think a lot of, you know, open surgeons would consider fusing it at that point. So that, that, that's a big, big game changer. Um, now, the question I have is like, what if it was heavily calcified? I mean, are you able to address that pretty well with an endoscope? Uh, that, that's a great question. I think if uh, if you're further along in the learning curve, absolutely. I think at this point, I probably would still do open um, and infuse or do a thoracotomy. Um, but I think, you know, in the hands of someone with a lot more experience, absolutely, those calcified discs, because they have an articulating drill that you could use to kind of undercut the, uh, the disc. Um, and then use something just like what we do in open surgery where you can kind of like uh, put it into the working space that you created, but absolutely doable. Yeah, so and you could go on both sides too. So even if you could just get half of it on one side, go on the other side, or if you have two surgeons that know how to do this and do it at the same time. I know in Methodist, they do this too, where they have two surgeons there that know how to do this and they kind of do transferaminal on both sides at the same time. So those are things that you could uh, potentially do in a heavily calcified situation where you can't, you don't feel comfortable reaching all the way over from one side. I suppose that if, if, for whatever reason, you did get a ventral durotomy, um, it really is relatively small dead space. Well, uh, and repair would be fairly challenging. I mean, would you just put fat, fiber and glue, or can that be? Can you actually use fiber and glue with an endoscope, or mm -hmm. what would be the options? Yeah. So in terms of uh, treatment of durotomy, so the nice thing about endoscopy. So I spent uh, six months with with Christoph, and we honestly didn't get a single durotomy. We had one that was like partial thickness. Um, and then I didn't have a durotomy at all until last week. So, um, so the chances of getting a durotomy are low. Obviously, in a calcified disc situation, it's higher than that. But it's very, very easy because the dead space is small. You just put a piece of uh, dural repair or substitute or duragen, um, and then you turn off the water at the end of the case, and you fill that whole track with fiber and glue. Um, and, and it works really, really well. Because again, it's like doing an LP in a way. It's so, such a small incision and it's so far away. There's so much muscle that collapses before that CSF makes it to you. Yeah. You know, I love your talk. You know, Christoph's done an amazing job elegantly sort of showing how it can be done right. And we've heard about it for so long. But my question to you though is like, he's got a lot of experience. You're now the mentee, you're out there, you're in practice. So I'm not sure how many cases you've done. Now, what would you say is like the best case you'd go for? given where you are? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging question to answer. It's a challenging for the reason, like uh, the best case to start out with is a lateral recessed disc, like a soft disc. Uh, but the reason why I say it's challenging is because, uh, you know, if you talk to some people that have a lot of experience, they say you want to start out with transferaminal first. Mm -hmm. uh, but the anatomy of the interlaminar approach is so, so like, um, not we know about that. That's how we do it with a tube and everything like that. So the question is, Definitely the best first case is a lateral recess soft disc. Uh, but the question is whether it's best to start with a transferaminal or interlaminar. The thing about the transferaminal is once you dock your working channel in, it's stuck. Like you can take your hands off. So, you know, you, it's, it takes time to get facile with the endoscope and know how to angle it and stuff. And you have to do that with the interlaminar approach. Um, with the transferaminal, you don't have to, which is nice. And as you, you saw in the lab, like if you do the, the approach right, you literally land right on the disc. Right. So you turn the thing and you're literally right there. So in my experience, I would say transferaminal far, or uh, transferaminal lateral recessed disc is what I would start out with and then uh, go from there. And I'm, uh, now I'm, 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 I think in my 40s right now in terms of cases doing on my own. Uh, but the nice thing, I was very fortunate that, you know, University of Michigan let me uh, go for six months to learn this. So uh, even though I'm 40 cases in on my own, I had a lot of cases with him being there, which I think is a special thing that a, a lot of people wouldn't have the opportunity to do. Great. Well, thanks, Osama. So thank you. I, no, I think we're going to um, progress to the next cadaver demonstration. Okay. Uh, it'll be um, anterior to psoas, uh, a technique.
Okay, um, as Osama is setting up, we're, we're going to actually proceed with uh, Dr. Hofstetter's uh, presentation on endoscopic TLF. And I, I know we saw the cadaver demonstration initially, but uh, uh, Christoph is actually going to give a good broad outline on the rationale and uh, advantages, disadvantages of the endoscopic TLF, which I, I think is really gaining traction. So, you know, it'll be interesting to hear his uh, take on it. Hey everyone, um, you know, it's Christoph Hostetter here. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Christoph. Perfect. Um, it's a little bit early here. I'm calling from Singapore. Uh, we're having a workshop here. Um, and uh, thanks for having me. So I'm sorry that I'm not there uh, in person, but I hope it works out like this. Um, so the talk will be about endoscopic T lift. And I think, uh, you know, having been in the endoscopy for the last 10 years, I think. Uh, the coming years right now are going to make a, uh, a tremendous change. And I, I will explain to you why I think this is happening. Here's my uh, disclosures. Um, there's some relevant uh, teaching for Globus and obviously Troy Max is uh, I'm working with too, but AO Spine and Wolf as well. So all of these endoscopic companies. Um, so here's the definition of an endoscopic TLIF. And I think that's that's really, really one of the take home slides of this whole talk is like, um, you know, obviously we're trying to enter the disc via the Cambins triangle. Uh, but the, 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 the real important part is here that we want to accomplish direct endoscopic visualization of the entry into the Cambins triangle and direct visualization of the completeness of the disc prep. If those two things are not accomplished, then it's, it, we would really have to speak of a percutaneous fusion, and this is what this is not. Um, additionally, this technique allows you for uh, optional direct decompression of the foramen and lateral recess on the ipsilateral side. So this is really, really important because you will see uh, the next coming years, you're going to see a lot of different alterations of this and uh, a technique should really allow for those two moments to, to, to be accomplished. A couple of things here right now is what's the advantage or the disadvantage of endoscopic versus MIST lifts. Um, the endoscopic version is less destabilizing. We take less of the joint. Um, it's If you live in a high BMI area, uh, you will love to do it endoscopically because you only are limited by the length of, of your endoscopic shaft. So it really allows uh, to do these cases in much larger patients. Uh, there's less nerve root retraction. Uh, you can visualize the disc prep and actually see uh, how modest your discectomy, uh, you know, prep is uh, that you were so proud of for many years, including myself. It's very humbling. Um, there's a decreased derotomy rate. Uh, it is feasible to do these sur surgeries with local anesthesia, and there's definitely a faster recovery. Disadvantages, again, as, as Osama mentioned before, there's, there's training. It takes a lot of effort to get there technically, even though... Uh, the endoscopic T lift is technically really one of the easiest full endoscopic procedures um, in terms of handling the endoscope. Um, there's equipment cost, but definitely not more than a microscope. Um, you know, we have to do a foraminotomy, or let's call it a foraminoplasty. Um, and it's difficult right now with severe central canal compression, even though a couple of, like a week ago, I started to do these two endoscopically. Um, and the cages are still smaller, but as I'll show you in a minute, this is really changing rapidly. Um, and the, really the, the big elephant in this room, the segmental lordosis. Uh, <clears throat> indications currently for endoscopic t lifts are unilateral foramen stenosis, is perfect indication that we can open up the unilateral side, ipsilateral to the cage beautifully. Uh, grade one enterolysthesis with bilateral foramen stenosis, spondylolysis, uh, endoscopic contraindications right now. Grade two and grade three enterolysthesis cases are really not, uh, not very feasible for this right now. This is where you can use the power of open uh, distraction, laminar spreaders, uh, screw paste distractors uh, that to really to your advantage. So um, I think this is where we are struggling. And this is where you know, I've, I've not been uh, you know, pushing the, the limits there. <clears throat> Severe central stenosis is, again, uh, I think not in a contraindication anymore of doing this more and more that now you can actually do a PLIF type um, of approach. Uh, not, the, not the topic of this talk, but we're really moving the needle forward there. So this is not a, central, a contraindication anymore. Um, severe deformity, 
I would say is a contraindication. Um, and you know, any any time there's a better other technique, you know, an A lift might be better, an X lift, an O lift. Uh, no, there's so many lifts around, and you can do it as we have heard earlier on today. You can do them in any position of the surgeon and any position of the patient almost now these days. So um, <clears throat> here's a quick uh, overview of an endoscope, uh, four components, optical system, um, illumination, irrigation channel, and a working channel. Now, this is really where, where it becomes interesting. I think the, the, the rise and the advent of these expandable T-lift cages, obviously uh, it reduces the irritation of the exiting nerve root, there's, it allows for in-situ expansion uh, and restoration of fluid doses, and you can backfill with bone graft. Disadvantage price, and again, there's some interesting uh, movement on the market now that people really get the price down, and it's complicated deployment. Um, this is what we have right now on the market, uh, you know, two-dimensionally uh, expandable cages where uh, you know, we have some uh, products from Globus. Um, then we have the Optimus uh, cage that can be used. Uh, the Flarehawk uh, is also three-dimensional. And, and those two technologies on the right side are interesting because they're additive uh, technologies. With other words, you just you put a shell in there and then you add more material. Where on the left side, you see one package delivered and then it expands. So it's a very interesting concept uh, that is actually uh, quite different there. Um, so let's see, uh, let's talk about the Cambus triangle a little bit. So Cambus triangle, a really innovative new approach uh, from uh, Dr. Wang uh, and his group uh, where they defined, finally, uh, you know, like clarified the Cambus triangle. If we read the original paper by Cambus on the triangle, he lists four borders and then calls it the triangle. Um, and uh, Mike Wang was smart enough to figure that out. And so they, they defined it as a, as a prism. Uh, which is brilliant. Uh, so there's the superior nerve root, sorry, um, superior nerve root, um, the superior nerve root that defines the rostral aspect, the inferior is the, uh, the, the vertebral end plate of the caudal index level, medially is the traversing nerve root, and posterior is of this prism is the superior to go process. Um, and the reason this is so important uh, because this, uh, the superior articular process really limits the, uh, the width uh, of this uh, region for entrance. Um, so quickly, uh, the steps, uh, again, we whittle them down to four steps now. We used to have many more like that. But um, again, the most important thing is to plan you know, the trajectory. Um, classically, full endoscopic uh, T-lifts were done at, at 45 degrees. Uh, we have changed it much more and so uh, typically two thirds of the distance, uh, very similar to a T lift. So the, um, it is actually a very, very similar approach trajectory. I like to have the tip of the cage slightly uh, off to the contralateral side of the mid lift on the midline uh, off uh, resting on the epiphyseal plate with the hardest uh, structure of the bone there. Um, docking on the SAP, uh, we published a paper uh, just now two years ago where uh, at our institution, uh, we don't have any more blind targeting of the foramen, so we don't go blindly into the foramen. Rather, we go and dock on the SAP. And, and doing that, we can uh, avoid a lot of uh, postoperative nerve root irritation. And this uh, lends itself uh, really well also for um, uh, getting into the Cambens triangle uh, in a visualized fashion. Foraminoplasty, uh, I never used to like this word, but it does make a lot of sense now that uh, foraminoplasty means that you open up the SAP, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily decompress the exiting nerve root. I know everybody's probably shaking their head right now. It's like, you know, what is the difference? Well, the difference is that in a foraminotomy, you also resect uh, the yellow ligament, scar tissue around the nerve root. You can resect the marginal osteophyte. So a foraminotomy entails, entails much more than a foraminoplasty. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, it took me a while to understand that, but but that's a really important difference. So here we just do a foraminoplasty, and uh, there's th these sequential reamers and other drills that can be used. The nice thing about these reamers is they're just very safe. And why are they so safe? Well, they have a very small overhang uh, of just a little bit less than a millimeter. So even if you're against the nerve root, you're not going to take out that nerve root. Uh, it's just going to irritate it, obviously. So you don't want to do that, but it's 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 typically a very, very benign uh, approach if done, if done well. Um, here's a foraminoplasty, and that can be an, uh, also completed with the drill. You can see there that we can use a high-speed drill once you're in there, and you can complete the foraminoplasty if you, if you didn't complete it with the uh, reamers. Uh, and the last thing is uh, you want to visualize 
uh, the entrance into the Cambrian Triangle. And here's a recent example. There was a thoracic disc that I did, but they're looking into the endoscope, into the Cambrian Triangle, into the foramen. And here you see the spinal cord. Again, it was a thoracic case. And under vision, you're bringing this uh, cham sheeting needle in there. So uh, I can't hit the spinal cord. I can't hit the exiting nerve root because I can see exactly where we're going. So this is a visualization that I would uh, really uh, challenge anybody who does MIS surgery to get that while you enter the Cambrian triangle. So it's, it's uh, as you can see, a very, very good visualization. And it's uh, you can see the exiting nerve root on the right side. Immediately is the spinal cord. Again, there was a thoracic case. I didn't find another video, but it, it, it shows the point. So it's fully visualized. So you're not going to go right into the exiting nerve root, uh, but you visualize everything. So this is why we are surgeons. We see stuff that we do. Um, and then you do the discectomy. There's a lot of tools for that. And I would encourage anybody who's interested in looking at the different uh, companies that have tools for that. Um, here's the end plate preparation that you can see at the end of the case. And you can see that the quality uh, of the end plate preparation is, is quite nice. And you can actually take cartilage off in the end. Uh, you can drill a little bit uh, and, and get a very nice, complete um, you know, exposure of the end plate uh, that again, the first time you do that uh, and you see it, uh, I would also encourage anybody to do it in open case. You can see how much cartilage, even if it feels okay with the rasp, how much there's left. Um, so that's very, very, very humbling step for, for an open search or MI search uh, as we develop. Um, then we place some bone graft, placing the cage. Uh, and so very quickly, uh, uh, summing this up here, I think it might be over time here already, but um, you know, there's not a whole lot of literature on that. And definitely, uh, you know, I want to give kudos to Mike Wang for his uh, serious one-year follow-up, 100 patients, endoscopic t um, Good outcomes. I mean, ODI reduction of 12, um, you know, in this patient cohort, cohort two patients with cage migration, 100% successful arthrodesis on x-rays, however. Um, now, but that is, you know, was always the for me, the big issue is, you know, if you look at this, uh, the pictures, and again, I've seen a lot of patients there during my fellowship, you know, the, the graft is just not allowing currently uh, to add a lot of lotosis. So pre-op in this example is 24 degrees uh, uh, segmental lotosis, post-op is 22 degrees. So we've lost two degrees. Um, and a recent meta-analysis that has looked at uh, of endoscopic T-lifts of a total of 13 cases, 13 studies, uh, seven of those uh, performed in a transforaminal fashion. Um, again, they uh, confirm what uh, Dr. Wang showed in his paper with a 32 uh, mean ODI reduction. So very good. Uh, just to remind you, um, I think 15 of ODI is the MCID for that. So it's it's a very significant reduction. Complication rates in this meta-analysis rates rate from zero to 28, and fusion rates from 38, uh, 30, 78 to 100 percent. Now, importantly, the fusion rates in the cases in the studies that were controlled were very similar between the MIS versus the endoscopic ones. So that was a, a common theme in these seven studies on on T lifts that the fusion rates are very similar to MIS T lifts. So I think there is not going to be a whole lot of issues there. Now, pearls, um, you know. It's, uh, you know, the foraminotomy, the interesting thing is uh, that the foraminotomy can be done by a more lateral incision. And I use this for a lot of uh, younger patients that have very, very large central hernia, uh, central disc protrusions with central stenosis from the ventral aspect. So you can do your incision for the foraminotomy a little bit more lateral. Uh, and then, yeah, as you've seen in the video, you actually enter with the chamfer needle under vision in a more medial trajectory. Typically, use the incision for the um, for the pedicle screws, um, and so it allows you to really get a very very thorough decompression. Um, and again, the bone reamers, uh, I also use them to accentuate the contralateral facet joint, and then and then pack it with bone. Um, and that's something that I used to do with MIS too. Uh, and that's where also navigated drills come in very very handy uh, for the thoracic spine. Um, Again, the foraminotomy by a much more lateral incision, as you've seen, and there you static cages just to be uh, uh, cheaper. Now, last slide here right now is I think what's missing here uh, is the burden of proof. Um, you know, I think we, as a field, we have to show that uh, even with uh, endoscopic surgery, we can restore segmental lordosis. Um, and again, this is a recent case that we did at the University of Washington here, and you can see that we came from 14 degrees of lordosis. Uh, onto 20, uh, 21 degrees. Um, and so I think it's feasible. We have to demonstrate durable clinical outcomes. I think there's some studies on the way and we have uh, started uh, to collect outcomes and uh, you know, uh, Osama is part of this. And so we have, yeah, as a group, um, we're collecting outcomes together. Uh, 
the patients are recording that with a smartphone app uh, that we call Spine Healthy. So there's a whole uh, consortium now of 10 surgeons in the country uh, collecting these outcomes. Um, we have to show that diffusion rates are similar to MI lift, and I think the literature supports that. Um, and we have to, uh, you know, develop solutions for all five as one. So that's also uh, still an area that is difficult to do with the endoscope. Um, and here I would like to thank everyone. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to to uh, answer them if possible. Thank you. Great, great, Christoph. Uh, that was a very uh, extensive and uh, I think comprehensive sort of look at endoscopic T lift. I, you know, um, do you think navigation um, will be a benefit in this procedure at all? I mean, what, what do you think? It, you know, one of the downsides I, I feel with endoscopic surgery in general is is just a lot of fluoroscopy. Yes. Um, no, I think, uh, you know, and again, as you have seen here right now, I mean, I typically use navigation there. and There's very few steps that you can't navigate yet. Um, the issue was typically that uh, with needle-based approaches, uh, the needles were flexible. Uh, now with the trans-SAP approach, uh, you know, we, we use the Chemshi needle, so there's not as much flexibility. Um, so it allows for navigation. Um, I think navigation has had a, a, a little bit of a slow start, uh, but um, you know, looking at literature on what uh, radiation uh, means for the surgeon, uh, surgeons and the staff, uh, what type of health risk this is, um, I think we should all be, all be interested in, in pursuing that. So I use navigation and and really try to mi to, to to minimize it. But you're right. I mean, for the discectomy prep, um, going in and out of the instruments, uh, there's still some flu fluoroscopic control. Um, but some of the companies, if you look around, have very, very uh, uh, good solutions for that. Uh, for example, um, you know, Spinology, they have some very, very nice stops for the instruments so that you don't have to get an, um, an x-ray every time you enter an instrument. So, uh, it, it, you know, we're, we're in infancy of this uh, kind of whole project, but I feel uh, so far I've always been more pessimistic, but I feel that things are really uh, turning around and I think that's going to be terrific for our patients. Great. Great, Christoph. Uh, we're, we were going to do um, a quick lab and then come back to you. Is that uh, okay with you and your schedule? I know you're you're out of the country. No, no worries. I'm perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we're going to move on to a uh, live demonstration of an anterior to solace technique uh, by Osama Keshlan. <laughs> Osama. Yeah, sorry, I'm just getting mic'd up right now. One second. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So, um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. All right. So we're gonna be talking about. Uh, so this is a uh, um, demonstration of a pre psoas approach. Uh, to the lumbar spine. So we kind of open things up because we don't want to take a chance of going into the bell and evacuating this room. So kind of made an opening to, to start the, the dissection. Um, so uh, the most important thing uh, for positioning here, uh, again, if you're doing a trans um, psoas versus a pre psoas, so for a pre psoas, usually the legs are straight. Um, because you want to flatten the psoas as much as possible because since you're going anterior to it. Uh, for a trans psoas approach, you want to kind of um, be more flexed at the hip so that the um, muscle itself is more bulbous and hopefully the nerves are not on as much stretch so that when you're accessing the disc space through the psoas muscle, you're not, you're decreasing your chance of, of nerve injury. Uh, but again, for a, a, a pre psoas approach, leg straight, you put a bump or you, you break the table depending on what your situation is at the hospital. Um, and in terms of uh, where the incision is, so just like for, for endoscopy, it's so important to have a perfect AP, perfect lateral. So looking at the x-rays here, we had as, as best the AP as we could at the L3-4 uh, disc space there. Um, and what you want to do is you want to mark the posterior uh, vertebral uh, body line, and you want to mark the ventral, uh, uh, anterior, the anterior 
uh, vertebral body line. Um, and you want to mark the disk space. In this case, this is going to be a great example of when uh, actually a, a lateral approach is really uh, nice because we're going to hopefully be able to distract that disk space from uh, where it is now, which is a, you know, bone on bone. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, the incision, so we made a humongous incision here, obviously, but in terms of the, um, for a pre SOS approach, the incision, there are different remixes on it, but the, the one that um, I've been taught is, you know, you go three centimeters anterior to the anterior vertebral line, and you make a six centimeter incision there. Um, so that's kind of what I do, but there's many, obviously, uh, you know, things that you could do. If you use navigation, you can really use navigation to guide your approach. Um, and at the University of Michigan, we use navigation. So navigation really helps us with where we're going to approach the disk space. Um, when you make your incision, you uh, take the dissection down to the external uh, fascia, so external uh, abdominal uh, fascia. Uh, you cut through that um, with a knife or with a blade. Uh, you try not to bovi too much because, you know, even though we're taught that the, all the nerves go through the internal layer of musculature, there are obviously there are times that they're poking through into the external layer or deeper into the transverse layer. So it's important to make sure you decrease the, the use of cautery in those areas so you don't injure the, the, the nerve. Um, some people like to really get um, retractors in there and take a look at every level and make sure that they're not going through any nerves. And if you do it that way, you'll see nerves. I mean, it's more typical than not for you to see nerves, and then you just kind of find a different plane to go into. Um, you d dissect through the musculature, uh, and then you go to the internal oblique plane. You make a cut through that fascia, or you poke through it with your Kelly. Uh, you go through the external or the internal muscle. You go through the transversalis fascia. So if you're doing a pre psoas approach, your incision is super ventral, right? I mean, if this was in real life, there, our incision would be pretty ventral here. So you don't want to poke into um, that transversalis fascia straight down, because if you do that, it's such a wispy plane, and it's very, very uh, close to the peritoneum. So you might get intraperitoneal if you go that way. So it's some things that you could do is during positioning, get the patient to be as close to your edge of the table as possible, because you're, most of the time you're going to be standing anterior to the patient um, uh, in a pre psoas approach. So you let the belly kind of dangle off of the table to move the peritoneum out of your way. Um, and when you're poking through that transversalis fascia, you poke um, posteriorly so that you're going kind of down to the quadratus muscle and you're going to the TPs, and then you kind of scrape forward, and that way it decreases the chances of a peritoneal injury. Um, so we kind of cut through, we made a humongous incision here just to, to kind of get us down to, to that plane. Um, so as you can see here, this is probably the peritoneum. Uh, thankfully, we didn't go through it. That's a, a kind of the, the posterior musculature there. So what we could do is we get um, a couple of, we can get a couple of kittners uh, or made-up kittners here and um, use those to kind of pull the peritoneum uh, over anteriorly to show us, you know, our psoas muscle. So we're looking, actually, I'm just going to make this incision bigger now so we could just see better. I'm just, okay, make sure I don't cut the peritoneum. Okay. All right, so hopefully this allows you to see better. I don't know if the camera, okay, good, okay. All right, so again, so I'm retracting here with our kittners and looking for our psoas muscle. Um, let me get this thing to be a little bit more, can you make a, one that's a little bit, fold one up that's more compact, please? Thank you so much. Okay, so as we go in here, we see the psoas muscle right here. So one thing that is really, um, when you're starting to do laterals or you're working with trainees, one thing that we're all so uh, anxious about is like, oh, I don't want to get into the peritoneum. Uh, and that's something actually that Dr. Park taught me when I was a resident uh, at Michigan uh, as a junior faculty. Don't put your retractor so deep, you know, because a lot of times you're scared you're going to go into the peritoneum. And what ends up happening is that you retract the psoas muscle anteriorly. And when you're docking your stuff, if you're going trans, um, uh, trans psoas, you're actually going into the psoas or posterior to it. Um, so you want to really dissect out, you want to hold your retractor just on the peritoneum and leave the psoas muscle behind. So that's actually kind of, this is the psoas muscle here, and I think initially we pulled it back, so you see kind of some nerves there. So I'm going to throw it back, and that's right there is probably, let's see. All right, so that's it there, perfect. Okay, so this is really our plane right here. So this over here, so when you're doing this, um, the ureter should come up, like Dr. Anand was saying, should come up with the peritoneum. And I think this is probably the ureter. I see a wispy thing here. I'm going to hold it up 
Um, I think that's what it is right here. Um, and usually in real life when you see it, there's peristalsis in it. If you touch it, it has some peristalsis, so that's the way that you know that that's the ureter. And again, you can get a ureter injury, uh, unfortunately, more easy than, than you expect. Um, so you move the ureter out of the way, and if you're doing a pre, and that's the uh, genitofemoral nerve there, I think. Uh, no, maybe not. So as you get here anteriorly, so the psoas muscles posterior, this is our disc space there. And I think this is probably our level that we are going for. Um, so, but we could check that out. We could sh make sure that that is the level we want to go to by getting an x-ray. So can you get a, I think this is the disc space right here. It looks like it's, you know, as you know, the disc is going to be a mountain. The vertebral body is going to be the valley. So I see a mountain here. And that's probably the three, four disc space, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yes, please. Can you go towards the feet a little bit? So it looks like it's actually four or five, right? Let's see. Yeah, so we're one level too low. Let's go up two or three, four. And again, we could probably just do four or five if it's difficult for the camera to look up onto L3, four. But I think this is L3, four right here. Let me take a look and see. And again, the valley is the vertebral body. The mountain is the disk space. So can you get an x-ray here, please? Yep, so that's our level there. X-ray? X-ray? OK, so that's it there. So let me just retract this a little bit more. Um, So I'm just going to crush this psoas muscle, but in real life, obviously, we don't do that. OK, so this is the psoas muscles retracted posteriorly. You know, here you could, this is the times that you can see, like Dr. Nan said, you can see the sympathetic chain there. Um, I unfortunately have had to cut it, I think it was once, and thankfully nothing happened. But you want to really try to kind of move it out of the way rather than cut it. Um, so can I have a spinal needle or something to access the disk space if you have some? Thank you so much. Okay, so the, again, many, many different ways to approach a disk space, but kind of where I like to start is at the 25 yard line. Um, X ray, please. That's too low. Let's see, I just can barely see this level. Okay, X ray. Okay, that's it right there. So that's a little posterior. Okay, let's see, maybe I think, okay, maybe I'll get, the, I'll get the blade. I think that's a, the tissues are too stiff. Um, to, that thing wasn't really going in easily. X-ray, please. X-ray. 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 OK, all right. So I think I'm in the disk space there. So I think I accessed it more dorsally than I usually would, but we have a great exposure here. X-ray. Um, so again, you start at the 25-yard line, and the thing about going pre psoas rather than trans psoas, trans psoas, all our instruments are straight up and down the entire time. Um, in pre psoas, like we, we discussed earlier, some of the other speakers, you go in obliquely, and when you're kind of halfway through or based on extra, when you're at the close to the posterior line, you always want to go straight up and down, and that's the reason why it's so important to have a good AP and move the patient to a perfect AP X-ray, not move the X-ray to where the patient is. So it's important to have a perfect uh, AP shot or lateral shot here um, uh, with the patient's position changed accordingly. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so this is we access the space here. So now the thing is, is we want to figure out what our length is going to be. So in terms of our length for this incision, so it's about maybe 120. So maybe 120. So this is the way that we're going to get our retractors in. So again, because we're going pre psoas we have to go in obliquely. Um, and then we straighten out. We don't have to use neuromonitoring because we're not going through the psoas muscle. If you want to be safe, you could definitely just use neuromonitoring anyways. Uh, but again, you're anterior to where all the uh, nerves are, so should be completely safe to do so. Uh, Osama, it's Neil. So you look at that x-ray, right? It looks like you're very posterior in your anatomy. I agree. Anatomy. I agree. Is that deceptive you're seeing? Or... Yeah, I agree. Are, are you behind the psoas? That's what it looks... So I see the psoas muscle here. Actually, it's a very, very so. Uh, it's a very small psoas muscle. Mm. Um, I think it's just from the cadaver. But I, I wish we could see things better in right. here. But yeah, the psoas muscle. So initially, the psoas was dissected anteriorly, but I pushed it back. So mm -hmm. I'm anterior to the psoas. The psoas muscle is very, very atrophic in this is, uh, in this is donor. There, is there any way we could get that Vision camera? Um, I, it was there earlier. Yeah. 
Perfect. But to me, I'd say that's very posterior because the, the danger therein is because you're going oblique, very easy from there to hit the other foramen. The so adducts are way Absolutely. more anterior, so you're going to more room for that. Absolutely. No, I agree 100%. Yeah, I think this is definitely because usually, like, uh, you want to go in more at the like at the 25 yard line than where I am here. So yeah. I, what I would like to see is like X-ray, please. Uh, let me go more anterior X-ray. Yeah, so like there's probably what I will, I will even more, <laughs> even more. You'd Osama, say? watch your hands. Osama, watch your hands. You're radiating your hands there. Be oh, careful. sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Literally in the end. That's where you want to go. You're going oblique, right? I think our incision maybe is just also holding us up. So, um, all right. So, can I have I think the, 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 please? the x ray might not be, there might be a little bit of rotation of the x ray, huh? There definitely you know, is. The, the, the posture yeah. of arterial yeah. body is not, um, yeah. no, it's not a strict line. So, for sure. Yeah. No, it, absolutely. Yeah. So, I think the x ray is not great, but based on the anatomy here, I think I definitely, like Dr. Nan said, I'm more posterior than where we would usually want to go in. Um, I am anterior to the psoas, thankfully, um, but definitely yeah. usually you want to go in at kind of the 25 yard line, and this is definitely more posterior than that. Um, also, I'm uh, a quick question for you, if you can hear me. Uh, when you want to mo mobilize the psoas, so like, for example, for four or five, uh, is there a technique that you use in order to, you know, do you use, uh, you know, blunt dissection? Uh, often the psoas is just attached to the disc spaces, right? And so how do you mobilize it the best? If you have to, you know, for example, in, in this case, obviously you don't have to, but if you would mobilize it, what was your technique to do that? No. I'm so sorry, Christophe. I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear. Oh, if, if someone. I'm sorry. It, it, what is your technique I to mobilize the ventral, the ventral edge of the of the source? I can't hear anything. I think Christophe was asking, how do you mobilize the source? Yeah, so uh, you, the way that you mobilize, so the psoas muscle towards the cranial aspect of it is going to be a, a tendon, so it's going to be harder to mobilize. Um, towards the inferior aspect of it is more muscular, so I usually just use a kittener um, and try to mobilize it posteriorly as much as safely possible, as much as it gives us. If the musculature is not being dissected anymore, and I do have some room anteriorly, like the vessels are further away, then I just change my angle to go in, because like Dr. Anand said earlier, you, I mean, the, the psoas muscle, you could just go underneath it and then, um, and then kind of hold your arm up and go straight down to the ground once you pass the psoas muscle. Um, so I think it just, you know, if the psoas anatomy is not allowing you to retract a poster, this lady here, her psoas, I wish you all could see it. It's like, um, it looks like, yeah, I mean, it's like a little strand here. It's really nothing. So I think that's the reason why I was able to get that posterior um, which is not typical for sure. I, I think Neil pointed out uh, an important factor with uh, all these minimal invasive techniques. Uh, one that you just, you can't just depend on your visualization. Obviously it is a bigger incision, but mm -hmm. fluoroscopy is very important to know where you are um, because you can't see through a disc space and uh, you definitely don't want to come out of control outside in the frame. And uh, I've seen that as an issue too, and it causes a control nerve deficit. Um, can you get, but uh, again, this is not orthogonal either. The posterior vertebral body is displayed. Is and absolutely, I think, the, uh, can you get an x-ray here? Maybe that'll make it better AP or better lateral. Not really, it made it worse. Okay, uh, x-ray please. Yeah, so uh, it's just, uh, as you can see, the posterior vertebral line is kind of too in a row. So I think that's also what's throwing us off. Uh, but, sorry? Uh, no, no, I think it's just the, the, the patient moved, unfortunately. Um, okay, so I'm just going to kind of just use what I have here and then um, we'll just see where we are. So this is our uh, working channel here, our dilating working channel. So can you come out for a second, please? Okay. Sorry. Oh, I think it's okay. I think I'll just, oh, right here, yeah. Okay. Okay, and then I'll put this system in here. And we're just gonna, All right, so if you can attach that there, please. Okay, so we can put the, the dilating working channel down um, and then put in our dilating retractor. And again, here we're anterior to the psoas, um, but by visualization and, um, you know, unfortunately the x-ray is not perfect, but by visualization anterior to the psoas, but more posterior than where all the vasculature is because we don't see it in our path, thankfully. Do you want to lock it here? Oh, yeah, if you could lock it here and then we'll just get it. Can we get a, 
a lateral, please. So the main thing is that here at this point here is you want to make sure that you are parallel the with the disk space uh, because it, um, okay. it allows you to be able to maximize the working channel. So can you get, uh, yeah, after you do that there, I think I've slipped up. So usually you have a K wire in there, um, which would make that a little bit easier. So let me kind of go a little bit more. Uh, X-ray, please. And that's too posterior there. Okay. All right, can, we, uh, can you come lateral, please? Oh, so hit the, okay. Perfect. This might be in our way a little bit, but we'll see. And so again, this is definitely, it looks way posterior than what you would want to do 100%. And we'll, we'll fix that here in a second once we're in there. Okay, so we need to angle up a little bit. Okay. Well, Zama, would you normally have a K wire there? Or because right now I didn't I don't think you have a K wire placed, right? Oh gotcha, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Hofstetter always is looking out for me with the, all the x-rays, so thank you. Okay. Um, x-ray, please. And fortunately the okay, x-ray. Uh, can you get another x-ray, please? Okay. So this here, you clearly see that we're not perfectly... Actually, it looks okay. So yeah, so we have the pedicles there. So you see the spinous process is slightly off the midline. So it tells, again, confirms that we don't have a perfect lateral and perfect AP. So unfortunately, the patient moved a little bit. X-ray? Yeah, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to fix it. So I'm just going to go with what we have here and then see what it looks like when we go in there. So I'm just going to expand this distractor here. Um, can I have the one to pull this... So for um, pre psoas approaches, uh, you know, you want to put the retractor ventral so that you could pull the peritoneum out of your way. Um, so let's see. So this pulls it this way. So you want, is this pulling it back or is it pushing everything forward? Oh, here. Okay. Oh, this right here, maybe. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Because this is towing in a little bit more. Okay, cool. So then at this point here, um, yeah, if you can come out, that'd be great. Okay. All right. So um, I don't know if we can get the video or do you have the Vision thing in here now? Light source. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. So we'll put the light sources in here. Okay. All right. All right. So let me get the kitten in here and then hopefully we can get the camera in here so we could take a look. Okay, so uh, I don't know if the camera, okay, so there, so there you go, so you see here, so this over here is what I thought was the ureter earlier, it might be genofemoral nerve, uh, but it just looks like a mess in here, but this is the disc space here, you see we're anterior, or uh, pre psoas here, uh, and this is our disc space uh, right here, so um, can you, let me get the blade in here, can I have the blade please, is it over there, okay, awesome, thank you so much, mm -hmm. okay. So we're going to make a hole in our disc right here. So can you get an x-ray here, please? OK, so it's a little low. X-ray here, please. OK, so we're in the disc right there. Can you come back to an AP, please? And if you can lower the bed, too, that would be awesome. OK, so now we have the retractor system in there. Theoretically, we're at the 25-yard line. We put in our instrument to make our, begin our discectomy, and then now we just need to uh, go through our serial um, expanders to expand this disc space appropriately. And again, the most important thing, you go in obliquely, and then you go straight up and down um, at the end. So that's super po posterior for sure. Okay, can you come out, please? Let me take a look here a little bit more. Okay, so it's super ventral. So this is, let's look right here. Okay, can you come back in? So we're going to make this look nice. Okay, so it's closer to the 25-yard line. So let's just say, say, I'm going to even try to go a little bit more anterior than that. Can you come back out, please? Okay. All right, can you come back in? And here, because the psoas is so wispy, it's honestly, this is like doing a, a trans psoas in a way. Okay, all right, so after we do our discectomy there, um, okay, so can you come back out, please? So what we do here is uh, I'm just going to do, start doing our discectomy. So can I have um, 
the cob, please. Okay, thank you. Let's see. All right, so I'm trying to get into that space where our discussion was. Okay, so can you do a lateral here, please? She might have trouble because of Oh, yeah, control. yeah, for sure. Let me just, I'll, I'll, yeah, we'll take, I mean, it's oblique now, so I just want to make sure that we're in the disk space and then uh, we'll come out. Okay, come on in, please. Okay, and that might be good there, actually. It might be okay there, hopefully. Oh, no, sorry. Okay. Can you push in a little bit more? You still got some room. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah, not for sure. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Okay, and now you just do the standard discectomy stuff. So you put the cob in there. We're going to tilt it, go straight up and down. Um, with navigation, you know how far to go on the other side. Okay, cool. All right. So now can I have a mallet, please? So when it's going to mallet this in, and then as we're going in, we want to go straight up and down. Um, and can you uh, come back to a lateral, please? Uh, and then now you just use the serial dilators to expand this disk space and then put in the cage. So I'm just going to do a couple of these steps. I'll skip the discectomy just in a matter of time. Um, so again, usually you want to be at the 25 yard line, definitely more anterior than where we are here. The psoas anatomy here allowed me to, to go that posterior. Um, or we macerated through the psoas. I don't know. But it looks like the psoas, it looks like it's intact posterior to us, thankfully. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, so now as we're kind of halfway through, I'm just going to slowly go straight up and down. And usually either the rep or someone in the room tells me that I am for sure up and down. X ray, please. And then you want to go to the other side. And uh, doc, like Dr. Anand said, I honestly didn't know that from earlier today. Don't go too far over to the other side because you can get a ureter injury. X-ray. So that's something that I definitely, one of the many things I learned today. X-ray. Okay. Oh, sorry. X-ray. Okay, so now we're over to the other side. So uh, you can stay where you are there. Okay, so I'm going to take this thing out. I can have the next uh, dilator, please. Like the smallest dilator. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So then we go in here in our opening. And again, we go in obliquely. And again, here, it's, I'm just going to fake go obliquely because I could definitely go straight in from the beginning. So I'm going to go kind of halfway. And then as I'm going in, we're going to be going more anterior. Okay. X-ray, please. Okay. That definitely we're expanding it, which is great. And I go straight up and down at the end. X-ray. Okay. So we're there. And then we have a slap hammer here, I'm sure, that we could use. Uh, or I could just pull it out. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. So we'll get the slap hammer on here. Okay. All right. Can I have the next size up, please? Thank you so much. Okay. And these are lordotic. So always make sure that your cage, the lordosis, is in the correct direction because that is a poor form. Okay. So again, I think I might need a kerosene actually to make the annular opening a little bit bigger to fit this in, please. Thank you so much. Okay. So then you get the kerosene in here, make your annulotomy bigger. Um, you can you know, start doing your discectomy with you know, all the discectomy instruments. And your goal is really just to kind of fit the next big in, the next instrument in by doing these discectomies. Okay. Okay. May I have the Hartman, please? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. So I'm just going to take the stuff that's in my way so that I could get, I'm able to get the next big cage in. So and that's the thing. We want to like be as efficient as possible, obviously. So you don't want to be doing discectomies after every instrument. You want to, at least for me, I feel like my goal is always to see if the next instrument fits in. And if I can just do one like good discectomy at the end after all the instruments are in, that would be great. So again, you go in obliquely. And then as you're going in, you kind of start going straight up and down, and you have people check in to make sure that you're straight up and down. So yeah, so it definitely looks like we're just distracting like crazy in here. I don't know if you're able to see that in there. So yeah, definitely distracting like crazy. So x-ray, please. 
Okay, so we're way past. Yeah, bad. Not, not great. Okay, so that's great. But this is a great fitting cage here. So what size was that? Okay, so I feel like I would stop at an eight in this patient. I mean, it's a lot better than what she had and it's super tight and she's probably older. Um, so I would put in a size eight cage in here. So, um, so yeah, so after you take this out, you just do the discectomy with your bear claws, uh, with whatever rakes, whatever instruments you have. Um, and then uh, after that, then you put in your implant. You could put BMP obviously in here. So BMP and implant. Okay, and then that'll be all. So I think, um, do, should I keep going, Dr. Parker, or should I stop here? Um, no, I, I think, um, actually, do you have an implant? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, let's put it in there. But, Neil, what do, you, what do you think of the anatomy? We've got a great picture here. I mean, um, the, the psoas, it looks a little bit atretic. This is actually 2-3, so maybe not surprising, right? So a little bit higher. Uh, I, I must say I'm worried. i got to be there. I have a feeling you're actually behind the psoas. Don't ask me why. And that's sort of the remnant of the back of the psoas. I think the front is still in front, or it's, or it's got macerated. We usually you see the disc very clearly as a white surface. I'm not seeing that, but I don't know. I mean, it may be different. It's hard for me to say well, that. We didn't see the beginning of it, but it, you, you really think he's posterior to the psoas? Well, it's here? very easy to go behind the psoas. It happens very yeah. common. Like, can I wait even more? Th that's true. I, I think that's You're another very one easy. Issue. You go straight behind, you start pulling the psoas towards you. It's the biggest that's mistake right. almost everyone makes. No, they start off till you get a feel for it. Yeah, and there's a psoas very, at least whatever, if this is the whole psoas or only part of it, but definitely very easy to go behind it. Very easy to pull it forward. Yeah. Is there anything in the front? And this is, so maybe there's more, I, I don't see any more muscle in the front, honestly, so I think we are behind yeah, it. That's the only like, reason I always, to, for me, there are two very important anatomical landmarks I always look at. One is the ALL. You. I'm always passing a number four pen field in front of the ALL to make sure I'm actually seeing the ALL. Gotcha. And two is, I tell you, there's a big tendon, many psoas yeah, are not tendon, two psoas, minor yeah. tendon. So those, and those it's are, a very good landmark. Those are tendons, basically. I don't think these are nerves. That I could be tendon, it. yeah, but it's a very thick tendon. Honestly, it's a very big tendon. Uh, and, and you won't miss it. It's actually like a thick tendon, and it's always the anterior bore. It's a very good landmark that you're anterior. It's a psoas minor. <laughs> I don't see it here. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that, that definitely it looks weird, but definitely here it feels like we're ventral to the vertebral body here. Um, let's see, is this psoas? No, it doesn't look like any more psoas back here. So, yeah, so I think I don't know what uh, you know, psoas morphology, the, the yeah. more laterals I do, I, I think it's true. It, it's okay. very um, yeah, variable. I, just gave I mean, some patients sure. are very atretic, <laughs> and you get up to upper lumbar spine, you don't see much of any psoas muscle. And this yeah, is two, three, you barely see anything. Yeah, three, four, this so is dark. two, three. By the way, oh, I, okay, maybe yeah. that's why. Yeah, okay, so I think this is Q3 on your floral. I, I know we start, uh, started with 3 4, but uh, on your floral picks, it looks like it's 2 3. Yeah, no, you're right. It definitely looks like we transitioned so there you go. That could <laughs> at be some it. point. Yeah, well, that could be it. There you go. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so yeah, so thank you so much. I mean, you all have uh, definitely a lot more experience than me, so I appreciate all your. Uh, do they have any water. angled um, inserters? Uh, I, I know this is a, a newer system, so th these are in line, which is fine for. You know, anterior psoas or oblique uh, approaches, you just, you know, change the uh, uh, trajectory of your inserter. But uh, if they have angled inserters, that would be nice to see if they have it. So, so, Dr. Park, so the answer is yes. You can actually, this inserter is angled, and you can even do it here. So, see how it's angling? Oh, okay. So, it's yeah, adjustable. So it's angled inserter, yeah. So that how would... rigid that is. Sometimes you're really pounding. I mean, if we could take the. Yeah, so. I, I, I have to point, I don't like those angle inserters. I've seen a lot of problems. The problem is, if you have a straight one, you know you're being orthogonal by looking at the handle. When you have an angled one, it's very hard to know where the hell that angle's going. And especially the deep patient, right? I've seen, seen some pretty bad problems with that. But it gets hard. How much do you go? What angle are you at? Unless you keep looking at it in that view. But straight is easier to, to control, I think. I don't know. I mean, I see uh, companies come out with it and it always worries me. Well, so, I, I, oh, yeah. well, I'm going to quote your own words back to you. It's part of the technique, especially, if you, especially if you do like a high crest at four or five, and there is no way to bring that vertical angulation of an instrument, even if you're oblique. That's where angled instrument comes into play. But that, and then I agree, you have to be careful. Usually, I check with a lateral x ray, making sure that posterior board or whatever instrument I'm introducing is not in the canal. And then once right. you're through and through, and then you, you, you're good in terms of AP space. Kind the of crest stuff. should not be an issue if you plant it on the MRI. If it has not bifurcated, the crest is never an issue. 
I promise you, keep looking at every MRI from now on. If the aorta is not bifurcated, the crest is never an issue. It's embryologically, that's how it's developed. But if it's already bifurcated, that's when you may have a problem. It started to bifurcate, the aorta is bifurcated, IVC is not. You may have an issue there. But still, you'll be able to clear it if you go anterior enough. You've never had a problem with the crest. The only time you'll have a problem is if it's already bifurcated. That is basically behaving like a 5-1. And that's very tricky, even though it's a four five. It's just a basically segmental issue. Yeah, I I think I, I've used both. Um, mostly um, one that's adjustable like this one, and um, sometimes I, it was too anterior because you know I I would always try to adjust. You know I, I I agree with you. I like using a straight one for the most part, but sometimes I feel like I can't adjust it enough for for one reason or not. Make an incision a little bit too anterior, just for whatever That's reason. That's why I like seeing that ALL. That ALL is critical for me. I won't even start my annual lottery till I see the ALL. So I know exactly where I am. I'm not relying on X-ray. And you rely on anatomy and just go behind that ALL. It's a beautiful spot to start. That's a good uh, tip, I think, a nuance that maybe I haven't appreciated as much. Um, so, uh, well, thanks, Osama. No, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the tips. So, yeah, so just uh, I'll take this implant oh, out. Good job. Good job. <laughs> All right. Awesome. I think we'll progress to our uh, next presentation by Dr. Hofstetter. He's going to be talking about enhanced diagnostics uh, for MIS. That was great watching you, Osama. Thanks for sharing this with us. Uh, it's always cool to see. Uh, um, thank you. Um, here we go. Let me share my screen here and make it large. One second. Is everybody seeing my screen right now? Can you guys see my screen? Not Can yet. everybody see my screen? Perfect. Sorry, this is just obviously the obligatory beginning of any Zoom talk. Can you see my screen? Uh, interestingly, my disclosures have not changed. Uh, it's disappointing. Um, here are the objectives here for this talk. Um, so uh, I just want to quickly uh, talk about the different MI uh, sequences uh, for common areas uh, that we can approach with MIS surgery. Um, I want to have you understand the utilities of spec CT um, and also quickly touch upon uh, ways we're using intraoperative ultrasound for, for minimizing our surgeries. So uh, again, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, I think everybody's familiar with this. It's just a, a standard picture and definition. Um, and uh, one thing that is really has been a uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting for me the last couple of years is that uh, I think imaging of the neural axis uh, is lagging behind uh, the precision that we're bringing to the table now with, with uh, full endoscopic spine surgery. Um, and this is in, in particular true in certain areas such as the cervical foramina, uh, for example. And so here's a, a retrospective study and they, they did a nice, uh, 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 you know, grading, uh, um, they developed a, uh, sorry, a grading scheme for cervical foramal stenosis. Um, and uh, the more foramal decompression surgeries you do uh, in different ways, and I'll get to that in a, in a moment, uh, the more important this is to sort of be able to assess that. I think everybody uh, in their practice, we see patients that have multiple nerve roots uh, compressed. With chronic cervical uh, radiculopathy, uh, the diagnostic in terms of clinics is very difficult. Um, and so it's really helpful to have very precise imaging. And so uh, there's a, uh, up to three grades. Uh, and what you're looking at is the nerve root itself um, and the fat. Again, uh, around the nerve root, and these are oblique images. And so I would encourage anybody who has a patient with cervical radiculopathy to request these uh, sagittal oblique images. Um, and uh, as they really reveal not only the presence of stenosis, but they also can tell you what the nature of the stenosis is. Um, as in some patients, we have you know more ventral pathology, where you know ventral approach is more more beneficial, or a posterior approach. And, and it's not uncommon to also see little synovial cysts in there. Um, so uh, I think that's a really uh, nice imaging modality for this. Um, and not only is it uh, nice to see, but it's also there's another study by Dr. Park, uh, another Dr. Park, um, you know, where they looked at 26 patients uh, and showed that uh, oblique uh, and axial images were similar to diagnose foramal stenosis, but the intra-observer agreement was significantly higher with oblique views. Uh, and here's an example of a C6, C7 foramal stenosis, and it's just very obvious um, to, uh, to detect that. So it, I think this is a very, very helpful technique. Why is it helpful? Well, you know, for cervical foramal stenosis, we have uh, different options. 
and uh, starting with the, with the least invasive, that's a posterior endoscopic cervical foraminotomy. And so that's a, um, a very a great procedure for unilateral grade one to two foraminal stenosis for, and for foraminal cysts, um, synovial cysts, again, which are not uncommon if you look for them. Um, this gastroplasty is obviously for unilateral or bilateral. Uh, I use them for higher grade foraminal stenosis. For grade three foraminal stenosis, where you have uh, encroaching of uh, the pedicles, uh, the cervical foraminotomy gets to its limits. Um, and also, if you have a central ventral a cervical spinal stenosis uh, that needs to be addressed, and cervical disc gastroplasty is, is a fantastic option. Uh, or if there is a grade three for animal stenosis, ventral central ventral central stenosis with instability, then as an ACDF, and then with multiforaminal and multi-segmental stenosis and instability, then a posterior uh, segmented instrumentation uh, comes into play. But uh, th this is very helpful to uh, to sort of choose what type of procedure uh, you can you can do for these uh, patients. Um, let's switch course a little bit. Let's go to the lumbar spine. Uh, in the lumbar spine, one of the most frequently overlooked uh, areas is uh, lumbar lateral recess stenosis. Uh, here's a, a Rauschnick slide here. Um, and what you can see there is, sorry, let's go back here. Can you guys still hear me or not? Because I've, my... So here's a Rauschnick slide. Um, Great question. Uh, my my earphones kind of gave out. Can you guys still hear me, or is it uh, or not? Can somebody confirm? Can you guys hear me or not? Okay, it says uh, that I'm still okay there on my side. So please let me know if you don't hear me. Um, hear so here's well. a lateral recess in the lumbar spine, and the lateral recess in the lumbar spine is, is uh, comprised and confined. Uh, here's a, a slide. So here's dorsal, here's ventral. Um, dorsal, it's, it's comprised, is confined by the yellow ligament uh, uh, covering the facet joints, and ventral is the annulus. And what we can find in there is uh, typically the traversing nerve root. Um, and this is what it looks like on axial images. Um, and I would encourage everybody to really look for the traversing nerve root, in particular at L3, 4, 4, 5, uh, very, the lateral recess stenosis is very, very common. Uh, try to find the uh, traversing nerve root as outlined here in red, um, and then try to find the uh, tangential sort of like confinement of that space, uh, both dorsally and ventrally. Um, and we just uh, looked at this in a paper, very few patients, because we wanted to very specifically look at the very certain patient population of, of patients that had uh, unilateral um, lateral recess stenosis and not contralateral uh, recess stenosis that was symptomatic. Um, and so we performed a medial facetectomy outlined here. So resection of the inferarticular process, in fact, uh, resection of the superarticular process outlined in blue. Here's the pedicle. Um, and we got a nice uh, rostrocaudal extent and decompression in these patients. Uh, and what we found in, these, in this patient cohort is that patients uh, on the symptomatic side, the angle uh, was around 20 degrees. And the asymptomatic side, it was 35 degrees, which makes a lot of sense. So once the, the angle gets very acute, the nerve root cannot slide in and out the lateral recess when we move. And so measuring that angle helps with the decision-making. And when is the decision-making needs to be done is, for example, if a 4 or 5 lateral recess stenosis in the setting also of moderate L5 as one for animal stenosis, really nobody can tell you if the L5 nerve root is compromised in the lateral recess or an L5 as one for Raymon. So having those measurements can help you guide and get into the right direction. Now, lateral recess stenosis also presents a little bit uh, different clinically. It's typically more an acute pain typically relieved with, uh, you know, leaning forward while foraminal, uh, you know, stenosis and foraminal pain is typically more what we understand on the, on the mechanical back pain and mechanical leg pain. And so then the lateral recess height is measured right at the medial aspect of the traversing nerve root. So measuring that angle and measuring the height of the lateral recess, uh, I find that very helpful uh, when I have to determine if uh, radiculopathy comes from the lateral recess versus the foramen. Uh, and then again, this small series, uh, 10 patients, roughly 60 years old, um, we had uh, eight out of 10 patients had an MCID if we uh, followed uh, you know, these guidelines and if we decompressed them in an interlaminar fashion. Now, the nice thing is now that um, 
the lateral recess can also be decompressed via transforaminal route. And that's something that we are studying right now in our research group. Um, and we'll soon hopefully have some results on that. Uh, so concluding here right now, a lot of recesses here quickly uh, before we go to the next point is the interlaminar technique provides uh, really nice here outline in red, in red, nice roster caudal decompression and the transforaminal technique I, I used in particular when patients had previous posterior surgery uh, from traditional surgery. And the nice thing also transforaminally can also go central uh, and there's quite a lot of uh, athletes have been able to treat that and, and young patients heal their disc quite nicely. So, uh, and again, one thing that is also very helpful is diagnostic blocks, which we perform often to kind of really narrow down where the pain comes from. Um, quick, a couple of words about um, uh, spec CT, um, which is also helpful in working up uh, these patients, uh, either pre-op or post-op, uh, if there's persistent pain. Uh, so it's the technetium-99 uh, scan biphosphonate uh, bones scintigraphy. And what it does, it detects alteration in, in bone metabolism. Uh, the nice thing is it's not as prone to uh, artifacts uh, because it's a, a nucleotide uh, a scan. And uh, in particular, useful uh, in patients after fusion surgery and with persistent pain. And so here are a couple of examples from a, a recent paper on this topic. Uh, so it helps you with uh, detecting screw loosening. So you can see this here. Um, and the CT scan and on the on this, on this spec, uh, it also is helpful to detect uh, subtle or not so subtle pseudoarthrosis. So you can see that here at L5 is one. So for these two, uh, again, screw loosening, you typically see pretty well on the CT scan is here. So probably not necessary, but often these subtle, um, uh, you know, pseudoarthrosis, in particular after multi-level MRI steel lifts or, or other fusion surgeries, we only the the anterior column was fused and you have ever so slightly posterior uh, motion in the joints and uh, a non-union, this can be very, very helpful. Um, another thing is uh, nice, as we've heard earlier about SI joint fusions, uh, it really lights up at S, uh, SI joint disease. Uh, and here's one of my patients um, that had a large uh, lateral osteophyte that, that was lighting up the bone span, uh, spack and then we just did a standalone. Um, extreme lateral interbody fusion as here with the, at the lateral plate. Um, and so that's an application. So last point here that I wanna make uh, quickly, um, wanted to uh, also present our work on ultrasound imaging. Um, well, you might say that it's uh, not such a, uh, you know, this is not a directly minimal invasive application here right now, but in, in a way it is because um, uh, it allows us to tailor tailor uh, the decompression surgeries in our acute trauma as a spinal, as a, in our acute spinal cord injury patients to the to the decompression that the patient needs. And I want to convince you quickly here that this is really has changed our practice uh, entirely at at at, at, um, at Harborview. So, 65 year old female, she presented to the ear after a, a low velocity motorcycle accident. As you can see, she had a previous history uh, of an ACDF. Um, you can see the plate here, and there was a large osteophyte that was not addressed by the ACDF. Um, and so she comes in now um, to a hospital, uh, Asia A, um, and um, so let me go back here quickly. Um, and uh, with a uh, sensory level at, um, I think it was uh, C4, and uh, you can see the MRI. And um, Again, so what do you do with this patient? Um, in terms of diagnosis, uh, only a, a quarter of these patients improve, and so impossible to know what the outcome of this patient is going to be. And so what we have uh, been doing more and more is uh, these ultrasound uh, technique where you use a contrast agent. The contrast agents are small micro bubbles that have a core made of heavy gas and a, sh a shell that is um, you know, com comprised of lipids or polymers. And what it does is the ultrasound uh, shoots in a signal and um, it's, uh, it, the, it gets the bubbles into a, a vibration or resonance. Uh, so very much like a music instrument or a bridge that starts swimming. And then um, the signal that you get back is so strong that you can actually track individual bubbles. Um, and very quickly here right now, this is just from our lab studies, is that if you use this type of um, uh, you know, um, imaging in our laboratory at the University of Washington, uh, and we do this in, in rodents, um, that have experimental spinal cord injury, 
uh, then we can predict uh, very well what the functional outcome is. And again, in rats, we use a, a scaling score of the highly locomotive function as a BBB score. And you can see the perfusion deficit here on, 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 uh, on sagittal images gets larger uh, the more severe the injury gets. And you can see that uh, measuring the perfusion deficit helps us to predict where these uh, animals end up. So that gets us back to this patient. Um, and uh, the explanation why this is really uh, helps us to, to do these cases in a more minimally invasive fashion. So here's the uh, ultrasound. You can see the sagittal image of the spinal cord. Here's this big ossified. You might remember that from before. Now that the bubbles are coming in and you see a, a perfusion deficits here uh, that sort of remains non-perfused. Um, and uh, looking at the data right now, actually this patient uh, would have had some recovery ahead. Um, however, you know, because it's still a research project, so the patient had some recovery of a hand, two out of five, uh, a little bit of a hand in six and pro proximal low extremities. Uh, but given the, the, the slow recovery, both the patient and the family decided uh, that incomplete neurological recovery is unacceptable um, and care was withdrawn. And I think uh, where we use this technology now is not only to um, prognosticate this, but also to help us to optimize our decompression. So what we, what we do now with spinal cord injury patients, we do a laminectomy in a, in a more minimally invasive fashion, still you know, using traditional technique, but then tailor the decompression to exactly where you have to be. And so we add more decompression as needed. Um, and so that helps us to minimize uh, uh, you know, the, the amount of bone work that is needed for that, even though it's still traditional technique, obviously. Um, and here we can see in our patient cohort that uh, this biomarker in patients uh, seems to predict quite nicely if a patient still has improvement uh, or no improvement. So it uh, seems to be very, very helpful in acute phase to tell us if these patients recover or not. Um, to conclude here, uh, MI, uh, as we showed in different examples, especially in cervical foramal stenosis, um, and lateral recess stenosis is very helpful um, to define if an area is, uh, is you know, is stenotic enough that it warrants a decompression. Spec imaging uh, allows to detect areas of increased metabolism uh, and helpful to make decisions on post-operative or de novo patients. Uh, and intraoperative ultrasounds uh, provides the information of, of spare tissue following traumatic spinal cord injury and also uh, information of whether a decompression is complete or incomplete. Um, and so I want to thank everyone for, for listening and if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you, Christoph. That was a great talk. Uh, any questions? Okay. Um, so I had a question, uh, Christoph. So for the spec CT, there are a lot of people that um, don't agree that it's helpful. What has your experience been in terms of false positives and false negatives. And another question is, you know, you discussed the, this ultrasound technology, which, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, seeing where it goes. And you talked about how it's guided you in terms of bony decompression. Has it helped you with figuring out whether a duraplasty is a good thing to do in some patients versus not? Because I know that's one thing in spinal cord injury that, that people are, you know, potentially excited about. Yep. Hey, thank you so much, Rosama, for the question. Um, and uh, so regarding the bone spec, I think it's really, um, you know, again, it has a very um, high sensitivity, but a very low specificity. specificity. With other words, you know, there's a lot of things that light up. Um, I think it's really helpful if, you know, again, in cases, typically after fusion surgeries, in these cases where you have, for example, that the dorsal column didn't fuse and the screw is just ever so slightly loose and there's just a minimal movement. And this minimal movement really drives our patients bonkers. And so I think that's really helpful uh, to find that. Um, but again, an adjacent level, I mean, there's so many other areas that can light up. So it's, it's really helpful. I think you have to have a strong suspicion on MI or CT scan and then specifically address that issue. Um, I think then it's useful. Um, regarding your second question, uh, regarding the ultrasound is, you know, one really interesting thing, and probably not entirely the topic of, 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 of this, uh, you know, meeting here right now, but, um, you know, in my laboratory, uh, which, you know, deals with spinal cord injury, um, you know, the whole world relies on these rodent, um, you know, spinal cord injury models. And what we have found the last couple of years more and more is, you know, that the, um, the, the subarachnoid area and space is very different um, between rodents and humans, but also 
in the human spinal cord in different areas. So with other words, you know, the ratio between spinal cord and subarachnoid space is much smaller in the cervical spine versus the thoracic spine. So in the cervical spine, it is, we do see sometimes that the um, spinal cord expands enough to touch the dura, um, albeit it's not as frequent as, as we initially thought. Um, and so that is, is an interesting topic that we are, we're trying to figure out as we speak right now. And so the question is like, in order to decrease the transmural pressure for the vascular vascularity in the spinal cord, um, you know, as you know, Brian Kwan is trying to do some lumbar drainage to decrease the uh, CSF pressure. And I think, Osama, you've done some cases like that too. I think you remember that you told me, um, versus opening the dura. And, and probably opening the dura does something very similar is, is that you have, a, um, you know, a duraplasty where the pulsations of the CSF and the pressure of the CSF is altered uh, enough that it might make a difference. But I think that's exactly where we are right now is I think we have to un start understanding how, you know, the... The, the pressure gradients behave in humans because I think there is um, there is something to be gained there in 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 rodents uh, with doing an appropriate decompression we're talking about twenty to thirty percent of of, of uh, neuroprotection um, and that's huge uh, if if you see that a patient actually with ten percent spared spinal cord tissue can have pretty much a normal uh, functional exam so uh, the reason I put it in there is because uh, you know I think having that imaging in the OR allows you to minimize, you know, what you do in the OR and then really have a targeted approach towards bony decompression uh, or additional maneuvers that you want to do. So I think uh, intraoperative ultrasound is, is, is really an amazing technology that, that, that neurosurgery should embrace uh, because um, its uh, utility is mainly limited by uh, calculation power. And as we all know, I mean, calculation power uh, doubles every couple of years. So, um, I think there's a lot of good technology to come there. Oh, thanks, Christoph. Um, so I think we have uh, no more questions here. So thank you so much. Have a safe trip uh, back. Sorry that you're not here with us. Um, I'm so bummed because I'm not in Seattle and I'm not there. But anyhow, uh, if, yeah. if I'll make need anything. Um, next time, next time. Uh, but I think <laughs> uh, next we have a robotic SI joint uh, demonstration uh, by Dr. Park. Um, so I think when, when, whenever we could switch to that, that would be great. Okay. Hello. You guys hear me? Uh, yes, we hear you well. Yep. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm going to demonstrate uh, a robotic-assisted MI, uh, MIS sacral leg joint fusion. Now, I, I don't know how many of you guys believe in SI joint fusions or not, or whether SI dysfunction is a real entity. I, I do. I, I do think there's a certain proportion of patients who have back pain from SI joint dysfunction, and I do think a fusion can be helpful. Now, the hardest part is picking the right patient, just, just like everything we do. So patient selection is crucial. But in the right patient, I, I think it could be a benefit. And if you're going to do an SI joint fusion, utilizing a robot is the best application. You know, we, we've talked about robotics, the value, um, what, you know, what the future of robotics is. But I can tell you that the current generation of robots and SI joint fusion is like a perfect combination. You know, I'll demonstrate it. I don't have to wear lead. It, it's a very quick operation. In fact, the hardest part is planning, particularly if you, you don't understand anatomy very well, which I find it challenging. The three-dimensional anatomy of the pelvis is, uh, is, is somewhat confusing. And I, I've been um, uh, you know, treating it, operating on it for, for a number of years, and it still uh, takes me a little while to think through the process. So um, I'm gonna demonstrate uh, an SI joint fusion planning on the robotic system. And then, I'm sorry. Um, Abe. Uh, Abe. Abe, I'm, I apologize, Abe. No, okay. um, Abe is gonna demonstrate doing the fusion. You can see, that it is a very straightforward operation. Once we plan it, it'll be a 10 minute operation, skin to skin. And again, I'm gonna highlight the fact that the robot is your best tool in doing that. So here's a typical planning station screen we have after registering the pre-op CT. And so this is what you see on a planning station. So we have a synthetic lateral view and then our trajectory views here. So we're just gonna drag a screw, uh, the first sacroiliac joint screw here. Oh, no. So 
so this was already planned and you just drag the screw to where you want it and this has been already dragged can i get rid of this so i could redrag it Uh, whatever. So I, I'm going to just, as you can see, we're just going to, uh, I dragged it too far, huh? Okay. As you can see, you just can drag it to where you want it to. And the planning is where I find it can be a little bit of a challenge here. So this is our first. Paul, Paul would you mind uh, letting us know what you're what you're looking for and what your strategy is to place uh, for for planning? That'd be great as you as you go right now. What are you looking for? Uh, I'm sorry, Christoph, I, I missed that. Uh, so he was. Oh, asking, would you mind? Go go through how you what you're doing right now. So he's like, what's your thought process? Why are you going between the two? So he's he's asking about that. I see. So so the first screw uh, for people who don't do SI joint fusions, typically we try to place three screws. And the classic teaching utilizing fluoroscopy is you want to plan the screws in such a way it doesn't enter the pelvis because the uh, L5 nerve root is resting right on the SI joint uh, as it exits the foramen. So one of the risks with an SI joint fusion is if you're too ventral, you could actually injure the L5 nerve root. And I have actually seen um, uh, a patient who had a foot drop after an SI joint fusion that went wrong because the screw was placed too ventral. So one of the key tenets, if you're doing a fluoroscopic based SI fusion and you're looking at this lateral view, is you want the screw placed uh, uh, or trajectory into the probably a lower uh, S1 vertebral body. And you do not want a ventral. And that in, uh, entails a lot of fluoroscopy in terms of position a patient just correctly, then using K wires uh, to plan the screw uh, trajectory in your incisions. It's just, uh, 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 quite an amount uh, of fluoroscopy, which you can avoid utilizing this robotic system. And so my first screw plan, as you can see, is uh, has a trajectory toward the SI joint. I don't know if you can see this cortical line, but that, that represents sort of the SI joint um, or, or uh, uh, a line that represents the ventral pelvis, and you, you do not want to be above that. And so you can see this initial screw plan here, and because we have the benefit of a three-dimensional view, I, I've placed it here on the upper sacrum. You can see here's the ileum, sacroiliac joint, and, and then the sacrum, but this is the upper sacrum. This is upside down, actually, if you want to call it. So right here. See that? It's a 12 millimeter diameter screw. So that, that is a reasonable uh, positioning for this screw. And you can see that this, the implant we're going to use has a hollow center, and I'm lining up this hollow center where the bone graft will uh, be placed so it crosses SI joint here. Okay, so that's the first screw. Now, once you've placed your first screw, it's very easy to place your second screw. Now, again, I, I'm just going to drag the screw. I'm going to turn it around. So there's different ways of planning this. I'm going to move the screw in the position here. And you could, this is, the screw is way too long, so I'm going to shorten it to 45. And here. Just for spacing purposes, now I could see both screws here. There's a first screw. Here's a second screw. So, Dr. Park, for that second screw, do you get that close to the foramen, or do you uh, like? Is that? What do you mean by close to the? Oh, like, because it's it's uh, like, would you put a forty, or would you do a forty-five uh, well, in real life? You know, you, you know, if you trust navigation, you know, we don't. Uh, this uh, this ends right next to the foramen. Doesn't violate it. Now, if if you're paranoid about it, you could use a forty. That, that's the value of planning, right? So. We could try to bury this head, but you know this has a cap on it, this particular screw, so you're not going to be able to drive it farther than this. Uh, I don't know if this projects well, but this bottom portion of the prong. So I think 45 is actually better because we're not going to be able to drive it that deep, and that makes it safe. And we're spanning the SI joint. Now, 
the nice thing about three-dimensional planning is you can see the SI joints diastased here. And you know, when you're using fluoroscopic-based uh, uh, guidance, you can not actually see the spacing on the SI joint. So sometimes, you know, if you get a post-procedure post CT, the screw crosses the SI joint where it's, there's a wide gap. And I think the likelihood of fusion is probably lower there. So, you know, by virtue of having 3D uh, planning capability, I could actually position this somewhere else. I'm not going to because I, if I want to put a third screw, it'll crowd it. But if I want to do, I, I could move this down to here where it's crossing SI joint where it's much smaller. But instead of doing that, I'm just going to put this screw here and then just plant a third screw. So here's a third screw. I'm going to just put it here. This won't let me turn. I'm going to, now this one I'm going to make much shorter. I'm just going to put it here. And you can see I'm crossing SI joint with the graph window exactly where I want to be. And I'm, I'm looking at all the dimensions here. Now, it, here on this synthetic lateral, it looks like I'm too ventral. But 3D guidance suggests I'm not. But I could, I could raise it up and change the trajectory a little. This is the, the value of having um, the capability of planning in three dimensions here. And then this follows a screw from the beginning as it crosses the SA joint to the tip. And it looks like I'm in good position here in the sacrum. And I could do that with every screw. Now, I'm just seeing if this lines up OK here. And I want to see all three screws now in position. Hey, um, Reed, which is the to see all three uh, screws in position? I forget which one that is. Actually, can you get rid uh, OK. It's fine. So I'm going to look at this. So they're, as you can see, they're not all parallel. And that's because I, I planned them individually. But if I wanted to line them up, I, I could. So if I go to the first plan, I could shift the position so it lined up closer to my other screws. See, so now they look like they're in parallel. And I could go to my third plan for the same thing. Dr. Park, while you're showing us this, what are your thoughts about pre-op CT versus intra-op CT for SI joint fusion? And what do you use? Oh, I use intra-op because we have uh, capability. We have an O-arm, so it's just easier. But as you can see, I plan all, th all three screws here. And th this is actually the longest part of the operation. And I'm just trying to make them parallel. I don't have to make it parallel. But I just, I just want to show that you can make all the trajectories parallel like you typically see in a fluoroscopic um, sort of place uh, SI fusion, but we're we're we don't have we're not bounded by that because we have th three dimensional imaging and planning capability. So you can actually plan the screws to cross SI joint right where it's close, you know, right right where there's not a big gap. And I think the fusion rate will be higher there. So that's a potential value add of user, utilizing a robotic planning system. But now that we've planned the three screws, it's very straightforward now. So this is the first screw plan. I'm going to go to the navigate screen and. Uh, Where's the pedal? So I'm going to push on this pedal here, and it's going to go to the first position. I don't know if, can they see that? Is there a camera on this side? Uh, they don't have a camera on this side, right? They can't see it. So uh, I'm just going to the first position. We're going to just mark the skin here. I'm just going to score it. So on the skin, it went to the first position. Now I'm going to go to the third position here. This is very straightforward. And we're just going to connect the dots here. I just saw it. So where is it? Do you have a marking pen, Reed, or a little bit easier? So I'm just going to mark the incision just by going on a screw plan. So this is going to move to the first screw plan. We don't have a, 
no marker. Okay. It just does not appear so. Not a big deal. I'm just, I'm just going to score it. And we'll go to the, the third plan. That'll demark our boundaries on our. Oh, I think you're in the way of the camera, oh, actually. So I went to the first screw plan. Now I'm going to the third screw plan. That'll mark the boundaries of our skin incision, which will be about an inch, inch and a half, typically. And then we could just time how quickly this is going to go. It's going to go very rapidly. So, all right. So I, those are our two points. Remove this out of the way. And you basically just have to make an incision here. Abe, just make an incision between those two points. You can just go all the way through. If you... So once you make an incision, we're just going to dissect through the uh, subcutaneous fat there oh, here they just grab that so I, I typically just use a bovi and you know there you're not going to really get to the muscles where you can see it but i just kind of use a bovi and get through the fat because there's like a scarpa type layer here that can resist screw placement then once you have that we'll just go to the first screw plan and go ahead and step on the pedal there Abe. and this is going to be as simple as a two-step process now we're going to drill and then place the screw Yep, it's gonna go through the skin a little. Yep. All right. Okay. It's it's not quite green yet, so keep keep, keep your going. So I'm not gonna even be involved here. Okay. So two step process. I'm gonna hold some pressure. He's not this patient's not on a, a Jackson frame, so it just needs a little counter pressure here. But he's gonna draw a track now based on his first screw plan. I don't know if you can see the screen very well. So. Here, you gotta see it. Okay, just drill it. So he's drilling through the first screw track. Now there's a rigid guide. Yep. Yeah, it's, it, you gotta push hard. Good. Okay. Now push hard through the SI joint. There's cortical bone there. Good, okay, good. I bring it out. Now I'll take the screw. This is how simple it is to do an SI fusion. So literally, it'll be a minute of screw. So this screw, um, show, show the implant. Actually, as you can see, there is, um, oh, this isn't the exact screw. So this, you see, has a hollow um, window for fusion. That's what we were planning uh, for this across SI joint. Okay. Now you can put the screw in. Uh, Dutch Park, what do you fill that with usually? What, what did you say? Uh, what do you fill the screw with usually? Uh, allograft. Bone's hard. Yeah. You, you know, this is 12 millimeter, right? That's why. You know, I, we use, I, you, do you have a 10 at all? You, you could take it out. We use a bigger screw here than, can you reverse it? Yeah, trying to. We ended up using a bigger diameter screw than the drill. Might have to just use a driver. You take it off. Just take it off here. We can just take, put a T handle on and okay. screw it. Yeah, so uh, I don't know why, but we use a 12. You is have there a T a handle? T? So we ended up using a 12 millimeter screw rather than a 10. So it's much bigger than the actual um, drill track. That's why we're having trouble. Because uh, crossing the SA joint, there's a lot of cortical bone there. So we should have just used a 10 millimeter. Oh. Oh, well. It came off the screw. It's still in there, though. It's still in there. I'm going to go to the next, we, next one down, I guess. Yeah, we'll go to the next one down. So, so uh, unfortunately, the bone's too hard for us. To, we didn't, the track's not big enough. But let's, we'll move to the next one. But you can see how simple this is. I draw the track there. We'll, we'll be successful with this one. <laughs> it's just that we use the too too big a diameter screw. It's a problem. Uh, can you put it on high speed? It's on the low torque. Yeah. Go. All right. Push it a little harder to get through. Okay. 
Good. Great, that's good. Pull it out. Okay, now we'll take the regular 10 millimeter rather than the... <laughs> so I personally have never used a 12 millimeter diameter. I'm, I'm not sure why we loaded it because if you look at the drill that we use, it's much smaller than even 10 millimeters. Okay, so this is a 10 millimeter diameter SI joint screw and you, you'll see, go ahead. Work, see how nicely it works? Great. Okay, we're in good position. This one? Mm -hmm. That's how the first one should have gone. Really easy two step process there. And then we'll go to the third plan now. So you can see how quick this is. See, no fluoroscopy, just, yeah. uh, just drilling a track, followed by a screw. Yep, that's perfect. It's hard cortical bone here. Very hard bone. Yeah. Uncommon for a cadaver. Yeah, if we were using a jam sheet in a care wire, this would be a real painful operation too, which is what you t traditionally do with fluoroscopy. Good. Take that other screw. Good. So that, that, that uh, as you can see, we dropped the last two screws in the, several minutes here. It does not take very long. Okay, um, I don't know. Let's just take a fluoroscopy, fluoroscopic view. I mean, what, what it's gonna show is like our first screw is a little, it's gonna be proud because it's just too hard to turn. Yeah. The bone's too hard and the screw track is, wasn't drilled to the right diameter, but I, the other screw should be okay. So the, my, my typical practice, I use a robot. So I don't take the first fluoroscopic view we take. If everything looks, again, you, you always want to make sure it was got it seems like it's working correctly. But if, if everything looks pretty uh, straightforward, then this will be your first view after all three screws are in. So there's no real reason to wear lead and we're not exposing ourselves to radiation. Gonna take a quick. Oh, yeah, towards the head a little bit, maybe. It's whited out, so. It's a reef. Can you change the, the, what's it on right now, ortho or? Looks like it looks like it's on spine. Okay. Maybe get a lateral. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't see anything. Hey, Paul. Yes? It's Neil. Now, I, I, honestly, I think this robot's been amazing for SI fixation. It's really changed the workflow and the paradigm. Now, I've used it a lot and totally switched to the robot. What's even more amazing, and I don't know if you've done this, we've done many sacral fractures now. H fractures and U fractures, fix the fracture with the robot. It's amazing, you can put a screw right through it. The robot right. makes it much easier and you don't need any of this flow anymore. Yeah, it, so it's, it's actually, the robot's been very useful there. Yeah, it's the best application for the, the sacral. Yeah, 
I've run quite we run about four sacral fractures now. I mean something that I just you know just take more x-rays otherwise. I don't know why we can't get a actually a fluoroscopic image or fluoroscope is kind of on a fritz. So those are virtual screws, remember? There's nothing there. Okay. You can see all the screws are just like what we planned. Cool. It's just, uh, unfortunately, the first screw is, uh, again, we you chose a diameter that's probably too big for the screw track and the bone's too hard. So uh, if you can get an AP, that somehow that'd be great. So Paul, you know, this, let me ask you another question. What do you think of the other trajectory that goes from the PSIS down? Well, I've seen I, that, it, I think it's called. Uh, I'm sorry, well, I, this is the trajectory for fixing the SI joint. You go from posterior, from the PSIS, you go down to the joint. <clears throat> from the PSIS region. I think, um, I think Medtronic's markets, I don't want to give a company name. It's called Rialto or something. And you pass the screw from the back to the front, rather than going lateral right. and through the gluteal muscle. Right, oh, right. Go, like Rialto? Yeah, Rialto, exactly. Yeah, I, I've done Rialto a couple of right. times. Yeah, I, I think in some ways it's it's probably a better way of getting Me too, I've started liking it, that's why I asked. Because I've had a few at gluteal hematomas, through that muscle, uh, yeah, I had one definitely had bruising there in the muscle. Yeah, no, I, not, it's not just the muscle. I, I think like when you think about it, we're, we're, we're traversing the SI joint and the diameter of the screws are only 10 millimeters. Right. I don't think there's that much, the fusion potential is not great. Mm -hmm. Whereas Rialto actually spans, uh, you know, if you get it just in line with the SI joint, um, it's an like, interference fit. It crosses more of the SI joint. So I think fusion, in some ways more likely I think so I also think is along the line of weight bearing it, it kind of along the axis it makes a lot of sense yeah I in trajectory yeah I, I think there's pros and cons obviously if mm -hmm. with either technique I mean this gives a better um, uh, compression is yeah. that a really loosened table maybe that's why it must be I don't know we can't seem to get an AP no I believe well. you it's okay <laughs> okay but uh I, you know I, I guess we're stuck with the lateral but as you can see, it's a very straightforward uh, procedure with the robot. That looks good. Okay. Any other no. questions? No, we're good, man. Hey, uh, Paul, one quick question, um, and yeah. you might not hear me very well, but you know, in addition to the clinical workup of these patients, do you off, do you typically do a, a diagnostic block for them before you offer them a fusion surgery, or what is your what is your workup before you go ahead and really fuse a, a patient to the SI joint fusion? Yeah, so um, that's a good question about the workup. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I you know the typical workup is they have to have the uh, three of five physical, you know, findings for SI joint dysfunction, the typical history, sort of not, not midline back pain, but lower sort of upper buttock, you know, focal back pain, and it has to lateralize. They can have a component of leg pain. And uh, again, there's physical uh, exam findings that we do look for. And if they have three of five, then they get referred for a diagnostic injection. If they respond to diagnostic injection, I, I would say 50% pain relief or more. Uh, but insurance companies nowadays are asking for 75%, even up to 90%, depending on the insurance company. Then, you know, they get diagnosed, they will have the diagnosis of SI joint dysfunction. Then it, for me, it's conservative management. And that's physical therapy, um, more injection therapy, radio frequency ablation. They have to fail all that, and they have to be reasonable patients. And I work with a pain physician who uh, is really interested in SI joint uh, pain. So he'll, he'll put each patient through all these conservative measures, and if he deems you know, uh, the patient an appropriate candidate, then he'll refer that patient to me for fusion. And I'll talk to him, I, I won't guarantee success with it. You know, if you look at the literature, and again, a lot of it's sponsored uh, uh, literature, the success rate is about 80%, so it's still not 100%. Um, so I, I'm very clear cut with them that they may or may not respond to it. And um, so that amounts to me doing, and I look at our data, I do about five to 10 a year. Actually, I don't even think I hit 10, maybe eight. So I, I don't yeah. think you can follow me of it. But for the patients and, and, I have, I think some have been successful for sure. 
And do you ever see loosening of the screws? I mean, I know that the new technologies have these bone windows and stuff, but but have you seen patients that are doing okay until the screws loosen and then they just, uh, you know, become symptomatic again? And what is your strategy for one that happens? I mean, what's your what's your backup strategy? Yes, uh, the answer is yes. I, I've seen uh, patients have recurrent pain with loosening that's apparent on CT. And again, that goes to what Neil suggested. That, you know, sometimes these screws, as they cross that side joint, the, the amount of fusion that you uh, obtain is just where the screw is. And uh, sometimes it's not robust. And so the screws will develop some lucency and, and patients can have pain. And what I've done is a, more of a Rialto technique. In, in fact, um, is do more of an open operation. And I'll do a, a, a screw fixation uh, followed by more, uh, you know, I've actually implanted Rialto um, just in line, and that's where navigation is very helpful because you, you are, you're going to have screws uh, from your prior operation. Um, you can take them out. I mean, utilizing navigation, you could actually take out the screws um, and then try to redo the fusion. But that gets more involved, I, actually, because I, I don't want to keep putting screws laterally. I mean, your, your uh, um, uh, remaining bone is just not robust enough. So um, like uh, utilizing a, a different approach, uh, whether it's Rialto, which is uh, more of an inside outside inside outside technique uh, or um, placing a screw like your typical s2 alr seems more reasonable okay but i i think um there's no more questions we'll conclude this demonstration thank you oh, thank you Thank you, Dr. Hofstetter, for joining us uh, in the wee hours. <laughs> no worries at all. Appreciate it. I've taken care of credit for all the faculty, FYI, so you don't need to follow the slide. Perfect. Thank you so much. As always, beautifully organized. Uh, congratulations to the whole team. I mean, uh, you guys are just amazing. Thank you. Appreciate it.